Chapter 13 of Dracula by Bram Stoker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Corinne LePage. Chapter 13. Dr. Seward's Diary Continued. The funeral was arranged for the next succeeding day, so that Lucy and her mother might be buried together. I attended to all the ghastly formalities, and the urbane undertaker proved that his staff were afflicted, or blessed, with something of his own obsequious suavity. Even the woman who performed the last offices for the dead remarked to me, in a confidential brother professional way, when she had come out from the death chamber. She makes a very beautiful corpse, sir. It is quite a privilege to attend on her. It's not too much to say that she will do credit to our establishment. I noticed that Van Helsing never kept far away. This was possible from the disordered state of things in the household. There were no relatives at hand, and as Arthur had to be back the next day to attend at his father's funeral, we were unable to notify anyone who should have been bidden. Under the circumstances, Van Helsing and I took it upon ourselves to examine papers, etc. He insisted on looking over Lucy's papers himself. I asked him why, for I feared that he, being a foreigner, might not be quite aware of English legal requirements, and so might in ignorance take some unnecessary trouble. He answered me, I know, I know, you forget that I am a lawyer as well as a doctor, but this is not altogether for the law. You knew that when you avoided the coroner. I have more than him to avoid. There might be papers more, such as this. As he spoke, he took from his pocket book the memorandum which had been in Lucy's breast, which she had torn in his sleep. When you find anything of the solicitor who is for the late Mrs. Westenra, seal all her papers and write him tonight. For me, I watch here in the room and in Miss Lucy's old room all night, and I myself search for what may be. It is not well that her very thoughts go into the hands of strangers. I went on with my part of the work, and in another half hour had found the name and address of Mrs. Westenra's solicitor, and had written to him. All the poor lady's papers were in order, explicit directions regarding the place of burial were given. I had hardly sealed the letter when, to my surprise, Van Helsing walked into the room, saying, Can I help you, friend John? I am free, and if I may, my service is to you. Have you got what you looked for? I asked, to which he replied, I did not look for any specific thing. I only hoped to find, and find I have, all that there was, only some letters and a few memoranda, and a diary new begun. But I have them here, and we shall for the present say nothing of them. I shall see that poor lad tomorrow evening, and, with his sanction, I shall use some. When we had finished the work in hand, he said to me, And now, friend John, I think we may to bed. We want sleep, both you and I and rest to recuperate. Tomorrow we shall have much to do, but for the tonight there is no need of us, alas. Before turning in, we went to look at poor Lucy. The undertaker had suddenly done his work well, for the room was turned into a small chapelle adant. There was a wilderness of beautiful white flowers, and death was made as little repulsive as might be. The end of the winding sheet was laid over the face. When the professor bent over and turned it gently back, we both started at the beauty before us, the tall wax candles showing a sufficient light to note it well. All Lucy's loveliness had come back to her in death, and the hours that had passed, instead of leaving traces of decay's effacing fingers, had but restored the beauty of life, till positively I could not believe my eyes that I was looking at a corpse. The professor looked sternly grave. He had not loved her as I had, and there was no need for tears in his eyes. He said to me, Remain till I return, and left the room. He came back with a handful of wild garlic from the box waiting in the hall, but which had not been opened, and placed the flowers amongst the others on and around the bed. Then he took from his neck inside his collar a little gold crucifix, and placed it over the mouth. He restored the sheet to its place, and we came away. I was undressing in my own room, when, with a premonitory tap at the door, he entered and at once began to speak. Tomorrow I want you to bring me, before night, a set of post-mortem knives. "'Must we make an autopsy?' I asked. "'Yes and no. I want to operate, but not as you think. Let me tell you now, but not a word another. I want to cut off her head and take out her heart. Ah, you a surgeon and so shocked. You whom I have seen with no tremble of hand or heart do operations of life and death that make the rest shudder. Oh, but I must not forget, my dear friend John, that she loved her, and I have not forgotten it, for it is that I shall operate and... You must only help. I would like to do it tonight, but for Arthur I must not. He will be free after his father's funeral tomorrow, and he will want to see her, to see it. 
Then, when she is coffined ready for the next day, you and I shall come when all asleep. We shall unscrew the coffin lid and do our operation, and then replace all so that none know save we alone. But why do it at all? The girl is dead. Why mutilate her poor body without need? And if there is no necessity for a post-mortem, and nothing to gain by it, no good to her, to us, to science, to human knowledge, why do it? Without such it is monstrous. For answer, he put his hand on my shoulder and said with infinite tenderness, Friend John, I pity your poor bleeding heart, and I love you the more because it does so bleed. If I could, I would take on myself the burden that you do bear. But there are things that you know not, but that you shall know and bless me for knowing, though they are not pleasant things. John, my child, you have been my friend now many years, and yet did you ever know me to do any without good cause? I may err, I am but man, but I believe in all I do. Was it not for these causes that you sent for me when the great trouble came? Yes. Were you not amazed, nay, horrified, when I would not let Arthur kiss his love, though she was dying, and snatched him away by all my strength? Yes. And yet you saw how she thanked me, with her so beautiful dying eyes, her voice too, so weak, and she kissed my rough old hand and bless me. Yes. And did you not hear me swear promise to her, that so she closed her eyes grateful? Yes. Well, I have good reason now for all I want to do. You have for many years trust me. You have believed me weeks past, when there be things so strange that you might have well doubt. Believe me yet a little, friend John. If you trust me not, then I must tell what I think, and that is not perhaps well. And if I work, as work I shall, no matter trust or no trust, without my friend trust in me, I work with heavy heart and feel... Oh, so lonely when I want all help and courage that may be. He paused a moment and went on solemnly. Friend John, there are strange and terrible days before us. Let us not be two, but one, that so we work to a good end. Will you not have faith in me? I took his hand and promised him. I held my door open as he went away and watched him go into his room and close the door. As I stood without moving... I saw one of the maids pass silently along the passage. She had a back towards me, so did not see me, and go into the room where Lucy lay. The sight touched me. Devotion is so rare, and we are so grateful to those who show it unasked to those we love. Here was a poor girl putting aside the tears which she naturally had of death, to go watch alone by the bier of the mistress whom she loved, so that the poor clay may not be lonely till laid to eternal rest. I must have slept long and soundly, for it was broad daylight when Van Helsing waked me by coming into my room. He came over to my bedside and said, You need not trouble about the knives. We shall not do it. Why not? I asked, for his solemnity of the night before had greatly impressed me. Because, he said sternly, it is too late, or too early. See, here he held up the little golden crucifix. This was stolen in the night. How stolen? I asked in wonder, since you have it now. Because I get it back from the worthless wretch who stole it, from the woman who robbed the dead and the living. Her punishment will surely come, but not through me. She knew not altogether what she did, and thus unknowing she only stole. Now we must wait. He went away on the word, leaving me with a new mystery to think of, a new puzzle to grapple with. The forenoon was a dreary time, but at noon the solicitor came, Mr. Markind of Holman, Sons, Markind, and Lidderdale. He was very genial and very appreciative of what we had done, and took off our hands all cares as to details. During lunch, he told us that Mrs. Westenra had for some time expected sudden death from her heart, and had put her affairs in absolute order. He informed us that, with the exception of a certain entailed property of Lucy's father's, which now, in default of direct issue, went back to a distant branch of the family, the whole estate, real and personal, was left absolutely to Arthur Holmwood. When he had told us so much, he went on. Frankly, we did our best to prevent such a testamentary disposition, and pointed out certain contingencies that might leave her daughter either penniless or not so free as she should be to act regarding a matrimonial alliance. Indeed, we pressed the matter so far that we almost came into collision, for she asked us if we were or were not prepared to carry out her wishes. Of course, we had then no alternative but to accept, 
We were right in principle, and ninety-nine times out of a hundred we should have proved by the logic of events the accuracy of our judgment. Frankly, however, I must admit that in this case any other form of disposition would have rendered impossible the carrying out of her wishes. For by her predeceasing her daughter, the latter would have come into possession of the property, and even had she only survived her mother by five minutes, her property would, in case there were no will, and a will was a practical impossibility in such a case, have been treated at her decease as under intestacy, in which case Lord Godalming, though so dear a friend, would have had no claim in the world, and the inheritors, being remote, would not be likely to abandon their just rights for sentimental reasons regarding an entire stranger. I assure you, my dear sirs, I am rejoiced at the result, perfectly rejoiced. He was a good fellow, but in his rejoicing at the one little part, in which he was officially interested, a so great a tragedy was an object lesson in the limitations of sympathetic understanding. He did not remain long, but said he would look in later in the day and see Lord Godalming. His coming, however, had been a certain comfort to us, since it assured us that we should not have to dread hostile criticism as to any of our acts. Arthur was expected at five o'clock, so a little before that time we visited the death chamber. It was so in very truth, for now both mother and daughter lay in it. The undertaker, true to his craft, had made the best display he could of his goods, and there was a mortuary air about the place that lowered our spirits at once. Van Helsing ordered the former arrangement to be adhered to, explaining that, as Lord Godalming was coming very soon, it would be less harrowing to his feelings to see all that was left of his fiancée quite alone. The undertaker seemed shocked at his own stupidity and exerted himself to restore things to the condition which we left them the night before, so that when Arthur came such shocks to his feelings as we could avoid were saved. Poor fellow! He looked desperately sad and broken. Even his stalwart manhood seemed to have shrunk somewhat under the strain of his much-tried emotions. He had, I knew, been very genuinely and devotedly attached to his father, and to lose him, and at such a time, was a bitter blow to him. With me he was as warm as ever, and to Van Helsing he was sweetly courteous, but I could not help seeing that there was some constraint with him. The professor noticed it too, and motioned me to bring him upstairs. I did so, and left him at the door of the room, as I felt he would like to be quite alone with her, but he took my arm and led me in, saying huskily, You loved her too, old fellow. She told me all about it, and there was no friend had a closer place in her heart than you. I don't know how to thank you for all you have done for her. I can't think yet. Here he suddenly broke down and threw his arms round my shoulders and laid his head on my breast, crying, Oh, Jack, Jack, what shall I do? The whole of life seems gone from me all at once, and there is nothing in the wide world for me to live for. I comfort him as well as I could. In such cases men do not need much expression. A grip of the hand, the tightening of an arm over the shoulder, a sob in unison, are expressions of sympathy dear to a man's heart. I stood still and silent till his sobs died away, and then I said softly to him, Come and look at her. Together we moved over to the bed, and I lifted the lawn from her face. God, how beautiful she was! Every hour seemed to be enhancing her loveliness. It frightened and amazed me somewhat. And as for Arthur, he fell a-trembling, and finally was shaken with doubt as with an ague. At last, after a long pause, he said to me in a faint whisper, Jar, is she really dead? I assured him sadly that it was so, and went on to suggest, for I felt that such a horrible doubt should not have life for a moment longer than I could help, that it often happened that after death faces became softened and even resolved into their youthful beauty, that this was especially so when death had been preceded by an acute or prolonged suffering. It seemed to quite do away with any doubt, and, after kneeling beside the couch for a while and looking at her lovingly and long, he turned aside. I told him that must be goodbye and as the coffin had to be prepared. So he went back and took her dead hand in his, and kissed it, and bent over and kissed her forehead. He came away, fondly looking back over his shoulder at her as he came. I left him in the drawing room, and told Van Helsing that he had said goodbye. So the latter went to the kitchen to tell the undertaker's men to proceed with the preparations and to screw up the coffin. When he came out of the room again, I told him of Arthur's question, and he replied, I am not surprised. Just now I doubted for a moment myself. We all dined together, and I could see that poor Art was trying to make the best of things. Van Helsing had been silent all dinner time, 
but when we had lit our cigars, he said, Lord, but Arthur interrupted him. No, no, not that, for God's sake. Not yet, at any rate. Forgive me, sir, I did not mean to speak offensively. It is only because my loss is so recent. The professor answered very sweetly. I only used that name because I was in doubt. I must not call you Mr., and I have grown to love you, yes, my dear boy, to love you as Arthur. Arthur held out his hand and took the old man's warmly. Call me where she will, he said. I hope I may always have the title of a friend, and let me say that I am at a loss for words to thank you for your goodness to my poor dear. He paused for a moment and went on. I know that she understood your goodness even better than I do, and if I was rude or in any way wanting at the time you acted so, you remember. The professor nodded. You must forgive me. He answered with a grave kindness. I know it was hard for you to quite trust me then, for to trust such violence needs to understand, and I take it that you do not, that you cannot trust me now, for you do not yet understand, and there may be more times when I shall want you to trust when you cannot, and may not, and must not yet understand. But the time will come when your trust will be whole and complete in me, and when you shall understand as though the sunlight himself shone through. Then you shall bless me from first to last for your own sake, and for the sake of others for her dear sake, to whom I swore to protect. And indeed, indeed, sir, said Arthur warmly, I shall in all ways trust you. I know and believe you have a very noble heart, and you are Jack's friend, and you are hers. You shall do what you like. The professor cleared his throat a couple of times, as though about to speak, and finally said, May I ask you something now? Certainly. You know that Mrs. Westenrell left you all her property? No. Oh dear, I never thought of it. As it is all yours, you have a right to deal with it as you will. I want you to give me permission to read all Miss Lucy's papers and letters. Believe me, it is no idle curiosity. I have a motive of which, be sure, she would have approved. I have them all here. I took them before we knew that all was yours, so that no strange hand might touch them, no strange eye look through words into her soul. I shall keep them if I may. Even you may not see them yet, but I shall keep them safe. No word shall be lost, and in good time I shall give them back to you. It's a hard thing, I ask but you will do it, will you not, for Lucy's sake? Arthur spoke out heartily like his old self. Dr. Van Helsing, you may do what you will. I feel that in saying this I am doing what my dear one would have approved. I shall not trouble you with questions till the time comes. The old professor stood up as he said solemnly, And you are right. There will be pain for us all. But it will not be all pain. Nor will this pain be the last. We and you too, you most of all, my dear boy, will have to pass through the bitter water before we reach the sweet. But we must be brave of heart and unselfish and do our duty, and all will be well. I slept on a sofa in Arthur's room last night. Van Helsing did not go to bed at all. He went to and fro as if patrolling the house and was never out of sight of the room where Lucy lay in her coffin, strewn with the wild garlic flowers which sent through the odour of lily and rose a heavy, overpowering smell into the night. Mina Harker's Journal 22 September In the train to Exeter, Jonathan sleeping. It seems only yesterday that the last entry was made, and yet how much between then, in Whitby, and all the world before me, Jonathan away and no news of him and now, married to Jonathan, Jonathan's solicitor, a partner, rich master of his business, Mr. Hawkins dead and buried, and Jonathan with another attack that may harm him. Some day he may ask me about it. Down it all goes. I'm rusty in my short end. See what unexpected prosperity does for us, so it may be as well to freshen it up again with an exercise anyhow. The service was very simple and very solemn. There were only ourselves and the servants there, one or two old friends of his from Exeter, his London agent, and a gentleman representing Sir John Paxton, the president of the Incorporated Law Society, Jonathan and I stood hand in hand, and we felt that our best and dearest friend was gone from us. We came back to town quietly, 
taking a bus to Hyde Park Corner. Jonathan thought it would interest me to go into the row for a while, so we sat down, but there were very few people there, and it was sad-looking and desolate to see so many empty chairs. It made us think of the empty chair at home, so we got up and walked down Piccadilly. Jonathan was holding me by the arm, the way he used to in the old days before I went to school. I felt it very improper, for you can't go on for some years teaching etiquette and decorum to other girls without the pedantry of it biting into yourself a bit. But it was Jonathan, and he was my husband, and we didn't know anybody who saw us, and we didn't care if they did. So on we walked. I was looking at a very beautiful girl in a big cartwheel hat, sitting in a Victoria, outside Guilonu's, when I felt Jonathan clutch my arm so tight that he hurt me, and that he said under his breath, My God! I am always so anxious about Jonathan, for I fear that some nervous fit may upset him again, and I turned to him quickly and asked him what it was that disturbed him. He was very pale, and his eyes seemed bulging out as, half in terror and half in amazement, he gazed at a tall, thin man with a beaky nose and a black moustache and a pointed beard, who was also observing the pretty girl. He was looking at her so hard that he did not see either of us, and so I had a good view of him. His face was not a good face. It was hard and cruel and sensual, and his big white teeth that looked all the whiter because his lips were so red were pointed like an animal's. Jonathan kept staring at him till I was afraid he would notice. I feared that he might take it ill. He looked so fierce and nasty. I asked Jonathan why he was disturbed, and he answered evidently thinking I knew as much about it as he did. Do you not see who it is? No, dear, I said. I don't know him. Who is it? His answer seemed to shock and thrill me, for it was said as if he did not know that it was to me, Mina, to whom he was speaking. It is the man himself. The poor dear was evidently terrified at something, very greatly terrified. I do believe that if he had not had me to lean on and to support him, he would have sunk down. He kept staring. A man came out of the shop with a small parcel and gave it to the lady, who then drove off. The dark man kept his eyes fixed on her, and when the carriage moved up Piccadilly, he followed in the same direction and hailed a hansom. Jonathan kept looking after him and said, as if to himself, I believe it is the Count. He has grown young. My God, if this be so. Oh, my God. My God. If I only knew. If I only knew. He was distressing himself so much that I feared to keep his mind on the subject by asking him any questions, so I remained silent. I drew him away quietly, and he holding my arm, came easily. We walked a little further and then went in and sat for a while in the green park. It was a hot day for autumn, and there was a comfortable seat in a shady place. After a few minutes staring at nothing, Jonathan's eyes closed and he went quietly into a sleep with his head on my shoulder. I thought it was the best thing for him, so did not disturb him. In about twenty minutes he woke up and said to me quite cheerfully, "'Why, Mina, I have been asleep.' Oh, do forgive me for being so rude. Come, and we'll have a cup of tea somewhere. He had evidently forgotten all about the dark stranger. As in his illness, he had forgotten all that this episode had reminded him of. I don't like this lapsing into forgetfulness. It may make or continue some injury to the brain. I must not ask him for fear I shall do more harm than good. But I must somehow learn the facts of his journey abroad. The time has come, I fear, when I must open that parcel and know what is written. Oh, Jonathan, you will, I know, forgive me if I do wrong, but it is for your own dear sake. Later. A sad homecoming in every way. The house empty of the dear soul who was so good to us. Jonathan still pale and dizzy under a slight relapse of his malady. And now, a telegram from Van Helsing, whoever he may be. You will be grieved to hear that Mrs. Weston had died five days ago, and that Lucy died the day before yesterday. They were both buried today. Oh, what a wealth of sorrow in a few words. Poor Mrs. Westenra. Poor Lucy. Gone. Gone never to return to us. And poor, poor Arthur to have lost such sweetness out of his life. God help us all to bear our troubles. Dr. Seward's Diary 22 September It is all over. Arthur has gone back to Ring and has taken Quincy Morris with him. What a fine fellow is Quincy. I believe in my heart of hearts that he suffered as much about Lucy's death as any of us. But he bore himself through it like a moral viking. If America can go on breeding men like that, 
She'll be a power in the world indeed. Van Helsing is lying down, having a rest preparatory to his journey. He goes over to Amsterdam tonight, but says he returns tomorrow night, that he only wants to make some arrangements which can only be made personally. He is to stop with me then if he can. He says he has work to do in London, which may take him some time. Poor old fellow. I fear that the strain in the past week has broken down even his iron strength. All the time of the burial, he was, I could see, putting some terrible restraint on himself. When it was all over, we were standing beside Arthur, who, poor fellow, was speaking of his part in the operation where his blood had been transfused to his Lucy's veins. I could see Van Helsing's face grow white and purple by turns. Arthur was saying that he felt since then as if the two had been really married and that she was his wife in the sight of God. None of us had said a word of the other operations, and none of us ever shall. Arthur and Quincy went away together to the station, and Van Helsing and I came on here. The moment we were alone in the carriage, he gave way to a regular fit of hysterics. He has denied to me since that it was hysterics, and insisted that it was only his sense of humour asserting itself under very terrible conditions. He laughed till he cried, and had to draw down the blinds lest anyone should see us and misjudge. And then he cried till he laughed again, and laughed and cried together, just as a woman does. I tried to be stern with him, as one is to a woman under the circumstances, but it had no effect. Men and women are so different in manifestations of nervous strength or weakness. Then, when his face grew grave and stern again, I asked him why his math, and why at such a time. His reply was in a way characteristic of him, for it was logical and forceful and mysterious. He said, Ah, you don't comprehend, friend John. Do not think that I am not sad, though I laugh. See, I have cried even when the laugh did choke me, but no more think that I am all sorry when I cry, for the laugh he come just the same. Keep it always with you, that laughter who knock at your door and say, May I come in, is not the true laughter. No, he is a king, and he come when and how he like. He ask no person, he choose no time of suitability, he say, I am here. Behold, in example, I grieve my heart out for that so sweet young girl, I give my blood for her, though I am old and worn, I give my time, my skill, my sleep. I let my other sufferers want, so that she may have all, and yet I can laugh at her very grave, laugh when the clay from the spade of the sexton drop on her coffin and say thud, thud to my heart, till it send back the blood from my cheek. My heart bleed for that poor boy, that dear boy, so of the age of mine own boy had I been so blessed that he live, and with his hair and eyes the same. There you know why I love him so. And yet, when he say things that touch my husband heart to the quick, and make my father heart yearn to him as no other man, not even you, friend John, for we are more level in experiences than father and son, yet even at such moment King laugh, he come to me, and shout and bellow in my ear, Here I am, here I am, to the blood come, dance back and bring some of the sunshine that we carry with him to my cheek. O oh, friend John, it is a strange world, a sad world, a world full of miseries and woes and troubles, and yet, when King Laugh come, he make them all dance to the tune he play. Bleeding hearts and dry bones of the churchyard and tears that burn as they fall, all dance together to the music that he make with that smileless mouth of him. And believe me, friend John, that he is good to come and kind. Ah, we men and women are like ropes drawn tight with strain that pull us different ways. Then tears come, and like the rain on the ropes, they brace us up, until perhaps the strain become too great, and we break. But King Laugh, he come like the sunshine, and he ease off the strain again, and we bear to go on with our labour, what it may be. I did not like to wound him by pretending not to see his idea, but, as I did not yet understand the cause of his laughter, I asked him. As he answered me, his face grew stern, and he said in quite a different tone, Oh, it was the grim irony of it all, this so lovely lady garlanded with flowers, that looked so fair as life, till one by one we wondered if she were truly dead. She laid in that so fine marble house, in that lonely churchyard, where rest so many of her kin, laid there with the mother who loved her and whom she loved, and that sacred bell going, toll, 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 so sad and slow, and those holy men 
with the white garments of the angel, pretending to read books, and yet all the time their eyes never on the page, and all of us with the bowed head, and all for what? She is dead. So, is it not? Well, for the life of me, Professor, I said, I can't see anything to laugh in all that. Why, your explanation makes it a harder puzzle than before. But even if the burial service was comic, what about poor Art and his trouble? Why, his heart was simply breaking. Just so. Said he not that the transfusion of his blood to her veins had made her truly his bride? Yes, and it was a sweet and comforting idea for him. Quite so. But there was a difficulty, friend John. If so that, then what about the others? Oh, then this so sweet bride is a polyandrist, and me, with my poor wife dead to me, but alive by church's law, though no wits all gone, even I, who am faithful husband to his now no wife, am bigamist. I don't see where the joke comes in there either, I said, and I did not feel particularly pleased with him for saying such things. He laid his hand on my arm and said, Friend John, forgive me if I pain. I showed not my feeling to others when it would wound, but only to you, my old friend, whom I can trust. If you could have looked into my very heart, then when I want to laugh, if you could have done so when the laugh arrived, if you could do so now when King Laugh have pack up his crown, and all that is to him, for you go far, far away from me, and for a long, long time, maybe you would perhaps pity me the most of all. I was touched by the tenderness of his tone, and asked why. Because I know. And now we are all scattered, and for many a long day, loneliness will sit over our roofs with brooding wings. Lucy lies in the tomb of her kin, a lordly death house in a lonely churchyard, away from teeming London, where the air is fresh and the sun rises over Hampstead Hill, and where the wildflowers grow of their own accord. So I can finish this diary, and God only knows if I shall ever begin another. If I do, or even if I open this again, it will be to deal with different people and different themes. For here, at the end, where the romance of my life is told, ere I go back to take up the thread of my life work, I say sadly and without hope. Finney. The Westminster Gazette, 25 September. A Hampstead Mystery. The neighbourhood of Hampstead is just at present exercised with a series of events which seem to run on lines parallel to those of what was known to the writers of headlines as the Kensington Horror, or the Stabbing Woman, or the Woman in Black. During the past two or three days, several cases have occurred of young children straying from home or neglecting to return from their playing on the heath. In all these cases, the children were too young to give any properly intelligible account of themselves, but the consensus of their excuses is that they had been with a blue fur lady. It has always been late in the evening when they have been missed, and on two occasions the children have not been found until early in the following morning. It is generally supposed in the neighbourhood that, as the first child missed gave as his reason for being away, that a blue for lady had asked him to come for a walk. The others had picked up the phrase and used it as occasion served. This is the more natural, as the favourite game of the little ones at present is luring each other away by wiles. A correspondent writes us that to see some of the tiny tots pretending to be the blue for lady is supremely funny. Some of our caricaturists might, he says, take a lesson in the irony of grotesque by comparing the reality and the picture. It is only by accordance with general principles of human nature that the blue for lady should be the popular role at these alfresco performances. Our correspondent naively says that even Ellen Terry would not be so winningly attractive as some of these grubby-faced little children pretend and even imagine themselves to be. There is, however, possibly a serious side to the question, for some of the children, indeed all who have been missed at night, have been slightly torn or wounded in the throat. The wounds seem such as might be made by a rat or a small dog, and although of not much importance individually, would tend to show that whatever animal inflicts them has a system or method of its own. The police of the division have been instructed to keep a sharp lookout for straying children, especially when very young, in and around Hampstead Heath, and for any stray dog which may be about. The Westminster Gazette, 25 September. Extra Special. The Hampstead Horror. Another Child Injured. The Bluefer Lady. We have just received intelligence that another child, missed last night, was only discovered late in the morning under a furze bush at the Shooter's Hill side of the Hampstead Heath, which is, perhaps, 
less frequented than other parts. It has the same tiny wound in the throat as has been noticed in other cases. It was terribly weak. It looked quite emaciated. It, too, when partially restored, had the common story to tell of being lured away by the Bluefer Lady. End of chapter 13 Recording by Corinne LePage Chapter 14 of Dracula by Bram Stoker This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Corinne LePage Chapter 14 Mina Harker's Journal 23 September Jonathan is better after bad night. I am so glad that he has plenty of work to do, for that keeps his mind off the terrible things. And oh, I am rejoiced that he is not now weighed down with the responsibility of his new position. I knew he would be true to himself, and now how proud I am to see my Jonathan rising to the height of his advancement, and keeping pace in all ways with the duties that come upon him. He will be away all day till late, for he said he could not lunch at home. My household work is done, so I shall take his foreign journal and lock myself up in my room and read it. 24 September I hadn't the heart to write last night. That terrible record of Jonathan's upset me so. Poor dear, how he must have suffered, whether it be true or only imagination. I wonder if there is any truth in it at all. Did he get his brain fever and then write all those terrible things, or had he some cause for it all? I suppose I shall never know if I dare not open the subject to him. And yet that man we saw yesterday. He seemed quite certain of him. Poor fellow. I suppose it was the funeral upset him and sent his mind back on some train of thought. He believes it all himself. I remember how on our wedding day he said, Unless some solemn duty come upon me to go back to the bitter hours, asleep or awake, mad or sane, there seems to be through it all some thread of continuity. That fearful count was coming to London. If it should be, and he came to London with his teeming millions, there may be a solemn duty, and if it come, we must not shrink from it. I shall be prepared. I shall get my typewriter this very hour and begin transcribing. Then we shall be ready for other eyes if required, and if it be wanted, then, perhaps, if I am ready, poor Jonathan may not be upset, for I can speak for him, and never let him be troubled or worried with it at all. If ever Jonathan quite gets over the nervousness, he may want to tell me of it all, and I can ask him questions and find out things, and see how I may comfort him. Letter. Van Helsing to Mrs. Harker. 24 September. Confidence. Dear Madame, I pray you to pardon my writing, in that I am so far friend as that I sent to you sad news of Miss Lucy Westenra's death. By the kindness of Lord Godalming, I am empowered to read her letters and papers, for I am deeply concerned about certain matters vitally important. In them, I find some letters from you which show how great friends you were and how you love her. Oh, Madame Mina, by that love I implore you, help me. It is for others good that I ask to redress great wrong and to lift much and terrible troubles that may be more great than you know. May it be that I see you. You can trust me. I am friend of Dr. John Seward and of Lord Godalming, that was our sir of Miss Lucy. I must keep it private for the present from all. I should come to Exeter to see you at once if you tell me I am privileged to come, and where and then. I implore your pardon, madame. I have read your letters to poor Lucy and know how good you are and how your husband suffer. So I pray you, if it may be, enlighten him not, lest it may harm. Again, your pardon and forgive me. Van Helsing Telegram Mrs. Harker to Van Helsing 25 September Come today by quarter past ten train if you can catch it. Can see you any time you call. Wilhelmina Harker Mina Harker's Journal 25 September I cannot help feeling terribly excited as the time draws near for the visit of Dr. Van Helsing, for somehow I expect that it will throw some light upon Jonathan's sad experience. And as he attended poor dear Lucy in her last illness, he can tell me about her. 
That is the reason of his coming. It is concerning Lucy and her sleepwalking, and not about Jonathan. Then I shall never know the real reason now. How silly I am. That awful journal gets hold of my imagination and tinges everything with something of its own colour. Of course it is about Lucy. That habit came back to the poor dear, and that awful night on the cliff must have made her ill. I had almost forgotten in my own affairs how ill she was afterwards. She must have told him of her sleepwalking adventure on the cliff, and that I knew all about it, and now he wants me to tell him what she knows, so that he may understand. I hope I did right in not saying anything of it to Mrs. Westenra. I should never forgive myself if any act of mine, were it even a negative one, brought harm on poor dear Lucy. I hope, too, Dr. Van Helsing will not blame me. I have had so much trouble and anxiety of late that I feel I cannot bear more just at present. I suppose a cry does us all good at times, clears the air as other rain does. Perhaps it was reading the journal yesterday that upset me, and then Jonathan went away this morning to stay away from me a whole day and night, the first time we had been parted since our marriage. I do hope the dear fellow will take care of himself, and that nothing will occur to upset him. It is two o'clock and the doctor will be here soon now. I shall think nothing of Jonathan's journal unless he asks me. I am so glad I have typewritten out my own journal so that, in case he asks about Lucy, I can hand it to him. It will save much questioning. Later. He has come and gone. Oh, what a strange meeting and how it all makes my head whirl round. I feel like one in a dream. Can it be all possible? Or even a part of it? If I had not read Jonathan's journal first, I should never have accepted even a possibility. Poor, poor dear Jonathan. How he must have suffered. Please, the good God, all this may not upset him again. I shall try to save him from it, but it may be even a consolation and a help to him, terrible though it be and awful in its consequences, to know for certain that his eyes and ears and brain did not deceive him, and that it is all true. It may be that it is the doubt which haunts him, that when the doubt is removed, no matter which, waking or dreaming, may prove the truth. He will be more satisfied and better able to bear the shock. Dr. Van Helsing must be a good man as well as a clever one if he is Arthur's friend and Dr. Seward's, and if they brought him all the way from Holland to look after Lucy. I feel from having seen him that he is good and kind and of a noble nature. When he comes tomorrow, I shall ask him about Jonathan, and then, please God, all this sorrow and anxiety may lead to a good end. I used to think that I would like to practice interviewing. Jonathan's friend on the Exeter News told him that memory was everything in such work that you must be able to put down exactly almost every word spoken, even if you had to refine some of it afterwards. Here was a rare interview. I shall try to record it verbatim. It was half-past two o'clock when the knock came. I took my courage at Dumais and waited. In a few minutes, Mary opened the door and announced Dr. Van Helsing. I rose and bowed, and he came towards me. A man of medium weight, strongly built, with his shoulders set back over a broad, deep chest and a neck well balanced on the trunk as the head is on the neck. The poise of the head strikes one at once as indicative of thought and power. The head is noble, well-sized, broad, and large behind the ears. The face, clean-shaven, shows a hard, square chin, a large, resolute, mobile mouth, a good-sized nose, rather straight, but with quick, sensitive nostrils that seem to broaden as the big, bushy brows come down and the mouth tightens. The forehead is broad and fine, raising at first almost straight, and then sloping back above two bumps or ridges wide apart. Such a forehead that the reddish hair cannot possibly tumble over it, but falls naturally back and to the sides. Big, dark blue eyes are set widely apart, and are quick and tender or stern with the man's moods. He said to me, Mrs. Hawker, is it not? I bowed assent. That was Miss Mina Mary. Again I assented. It is Mina Mary that I came to see that was friend of that poor dear child, Lucy Westenra. Madam Mina, it is on account of the dead I come. Sir, I said, you could have no better claim on me than you are a friend and helper of Lucy Westenra. And I held out my hand. He took it and said tenderly, Oh, Madam Mina, I knew that the friend of that poor lily girl must be good, but I had yet to learn. He finished his speech with a courtly bow. I asked him what it was that he wanted to see me about, so he at once began. I have read your letters to Miss Lucy. Forgive me, but I had to begin to inquire somewhere, and there was none to ask. I know that you were with her at Whitby. She sometimes kept a diary. 
You need not look surprised, Madame Mina, it was begun after you had left, and was in imitation of you, and in the diary she traces by inference certain things to sleepwalking in which she puts down that you saved her. In great perplexity, then, I come to you, and ask you out of your so much kindness to tell me all of it that you can remember. I can tell you I think Dr. Van Helsing all about it. Ah, then you have good memory for facts, for details. It is not always so with young ladies. No, doctor, but I wrote it down at the time. I can show it to you if you like. Oh, Madame Mina, I will be grateful. You will do me much favour. I could not resist the temptation of mystifying him a bit. I suppose it is some of the taste of the original apple that remains still in our mouths, so I handed him the short-end diary. He took it with a grateful bow and said, May I read it? If you wish, I answered as demurely as I could. He opened it, and for an instant his face fell. Then he stood up and bowed. Oh, you so clever woman, he said. I knew long that Mr. Jonathan was a man of much thankfulness, but see his wife have all the good things. And will you not so much honour me and so help me as to read it for me? Alas, I know not the shorthand. By this time my little joke was over, and I was almost ashamed, so I took the typewritten copy from my work basket and handed it to him. Forgive me, I said, I could not help it, but I had been thinking that it was of dear Lucy that you wished to ask, and so that you might not have time to wait, not on my account, but because I know your time must be precious, I have written it out on the typewriter for you. He took it and his eyes glistened. You are so good, he said. And may I read it now? I may want to ask you some things when I have read. By all means, I said. Read it over whilst I order lunch, and then you can ask me questions whilst we eat. He bowed and settled himself in a chair with his back to the light, and became absorbed in the papers, whilst I went to see after lunch chiefly in order that he might not be disturbed. When I came back, I found him walking hurriedly up and down the room, his face all ablaze with excitement. He rushed up to me and took me by both hands. Oh, Madame Mina! he said. How can I say what I owe to you? This paper is as sunshine. It opens the gate to me. I am dazed. I am dazzled. With so much light, and yet clouds roll in behind the light every time. But that you do not, cannot comprehend. Oh, but I am grateful to you, you so clever woman. Madame, he said this very solemnly, if ever Abraham Van Helsing can do anything for you or yours, I trust you will let me know. It will be pleasure and delight if I may serve you as a friend, as a friend, but all I have ever learned, all I can ever do, shall be for you and those you love. There are darkness and life, and there are lights. You are one of the lights. You will have happy life and good life, and your husband will be blessed in you. But, Doctor, you praise me too much, and and you do not know me. Not know you? I, who am old, who have studied all my life men and women, I, who have made my specialty the brain and all that belongs to him and all that follow from him, and I have read your diary that you have so goodly written for me, and which breathes out truth in every line. I, who have read your so sweet letter to poor Lucy of your marriage and your trust, not know you? Oh, Madame Mina, good women tell all their lives, and by day and by hour and by minute, such things that angels can read, and we men who wish to know have in us something of angels' eyes. Your husband is noble nature, and you are noble too, for you trust and trust cannot be where there is mean nature. And your husband, tell me of him, is he quite well? Is all that fever gone, and is he strong and hearty? I saw here an opening to ask him about Jonathan, so I said, He was almost recovered, but he has been greatly upset by Mr. Hawkins' death. He interrupted, Oh, yes, I know, I know. I have read your last two letters. I went on, I suppose this upset him, for when we were in town on Thursday last, he had a sort of shock. A shock, and after brain fever so soon, that was not good. Which kind of shock was it? He thought he saw someone who recalled something terrible, something which led to his brain fever. And here the whole thing seemed to overwhelm me in a rush, the pity for Jonathan, the horror which he had experienced, the whole fearful mystery of his diary, and the fear that has been brooding over me ever since, all came in a tumult. I suppose I was hysterical, for I threw myself on my knees and held up my hands to him, and implored him to make my husband well again. He took my hands and raised me up, and made me sit on the sofa, and sat by me. He held my hand in his, and said to me with oh such infinite sweetness, My life is a barren and lonely one, and so full of work that I have not had much time for friendships. But since I have been summoned to here by my friend John Seward, 
I have known so many good people and seen such nobility that I feel more than ever, and it has grown with my advancing years, the loneliness of my life. Believe me, then, that I come here full of respect for you, and you have given me hope, hope not in what I am seeking of, but that there are good women still left to make life happy, good women, whose lives and whose truths may make good lesson for the children that are to be. I am glad, glad that I may be here to be of some use to you, for if your husband suffer, he suffer within the range of my study and experience. I promise you that I will gladly do all for him that I can, as to make his life strong and manly, and your life a happy one. Now you must eat, you are overwrought and perhaps over-anxious. Husband Jonathan would not like to see you so pale, and what he like not where he love is not to his good. Therefore, for his sake, you must eat and smile. You have told me all about Lucy, and, and so now we shall not speak of it, lest it distress. I shall stay in Exeter tonight, for I want to think much over what you have told me, and when I have thought I will ask you questions, if I may. And then, too, you will tell me of husband Jonathan's trouble so far as you can, but not yet. You must eat now. Afterwards, you shall tell me all. After lunch, when we came back to the drawing-room, he said to me, and now tell me all about him. When it came to speaking to this great learned man, I began to fear that he would think me a weak fool, and Jonathan a madman. The journal is all so strange, and I hesitated to go on. But he was so sweet and kind, and he had promised to help, and I trusted him, so I said, Dr. Van Helsing, what I have to tell you is so queer, that you must not laugh at me or my husband. I have been since yesterday in a sort of fever of doubt. You must be kind to me, and not think me foolish that I have even half believed some very strange things. He reassured me by his manner as well as his words when he said, Oh, my dear, if you only knew how strange is the matter regarding which I am here, it is you who would laugh. I have learned not to think little of any one's belief, no matter how strange it be. I have tried to keep an open mind, and it is not the ordinary things of life that could close it, but the strange things, the extraordinary things, the things that make one doubt if they be mad or sane. Thank you, thank you a thousand times, you have taken a weight off my mind. If you will let me, I shall give you a paper to read. It is long, but I have typewritten it out. It will tell you my trouble in Jonathan's. It is the copy of his journal when abroad, and all that happened. I dare not say anything of it. You will read it for yourself and judge, and then when I see you, perhaps you will be very kind and tell me what you think. I promise, he said, as I gave him the papers. I shall in the morning, as soon as I can, come and see you and your husband, if I may. Jonathan will be here half past eleven, and you must come to lunch with us and see him then. You could catch the quick 334 train, which will leave you at Paddington before eight. He was surprised at my knowledge of the trains offhand, but he does not know that I have made up all the trains to and from an Exeter, so that I may help Jonathan in case he is in a hurry. So he took the papers with him and went away, and I sit here thinking, thinking I don't know what. Letter, by hand, Van Helsing to Mrs. Harker. 25 September, 6 o'clock. Dear Madame Mina, I have read your husband's wonderful diary. You may sleep without a doubt, strange and terrible as it is. It is true. I will pledge my life on it. It may be worse for others, but for him and you there is no dread. He is a noble fellow. And let me tell you from experience of men that one who would do as he did in going down that wall into that room, I, and going a second time, is not one to be injured in permanence by a shock. His brain and his heart are all right. This I swear. Before I have even seen him, so be at rest. I shall have much to ask him of other things. I am blessed that today I come to see you, for I have learned all at once, so much that again I am dazzled, dazzled more than ever, and I must think. Yours and most faithful, Abraham Van Helsing. Letter. Mrs. Harker to Van Helsing. 25 September, 6.30 p.m. My dear Dr. Van Helsing, A thousand thanks for your kind letter, which has taken a great weight off my mind. And yet, if it be true, what terrible things there are in the world, and what an awful thing if that man, that monster, be really in London? I fear to think. I have this moment, whilst writing, had a wire from Jonathan saying he leaves by the 6.25 tonight from Launceston, and will be here at 10.18, so that I shall have no fear tonight. Will you, therefore, instead of lunching with us, 
please come to breakfast at eight o'clock, if this be not too early for you. You can get away if you are in a hurry by the 10.30 train, which will bring you to Paddington by 2.35. Do not answer this, as I shall take it that if I do not hear, you will come to breakfast. Believe me, your faithful and grateful friend, Mina Harker. Jonathan Harker's Journal 26 September I thought never to write in this diary again, but the time has come. When I got home last night, Mina had supper ready, and when we had supped, she told me of Van Helsing's visit, and of her having given him the two diaries copied out, and of how anxious she has been about me. She showed me in the doctor's letter that all I wrote down was true. It seems to have made a new man of me. It was the doubt as to the reality of the whole thing that knocked me over. I felt impotent and in the dark and distrustful, but now that I know, I am not afraid even of the Count. He has succeeded after all, then, in his design in getting to London, and it was he I saw. He has gotten younger, and how? Van Helsing is the man to unmask him and hunt him out, if he is anything like what Mina says. We sat late and talked it all over. Mina is dressing, and I shall call at the hotel in a few minutes and bring him over. He was, I think, surprised to see me. When I came into the room where he was and introduced myself, he took me by the shoulder and turned my face round to the light and said after a sharp scrutiny, But Madame Mina told me you were ill, that you had had a shock. It was so funny to hear my wife called Madame Mina by this kindly strong-faced old man. I smiled and said, I was ill, I have had a shock, but you have cured me already. And how? By your letter to Mina last night, I was in doubt, and then everything took a hue of unreality and... I did not know what to trust, even the evidence of my own senses. Not knowing what to trust, I did not know what to do, and so had only to keep on working what had hitherto been the groove of my life. The groove ceased to avail me, and I mistrusted myself. Doctor, you don't know what it is to doubt everything, even yourself. No, you don't. You couldn't with eyebrows like yours. He seemed pleased and laughed as he said, So, you are physiognomist. I learn more here with each hour. I am with so much pleasure coming to you to breakfast, and oh, sir, you will pardon praise from an old man, but you are blessed in your wife. I would listen to him go on praising Mina for a day, so I simply nodded and stood silent. She is one of God's women, fashioned by his own hand, to show us men and other women that there is a heaven where we can enter, and that its light can be here on earth. So true, so sweet, so noble, so little an egoist, and that, let me tell you, is much in this age so sceptical and selfish. And you, sir, I have read all the letters to poor Miss Lucy, and some of them speak of you. So I know you since some days from the knowing of others, but I have seen your true self since last night. You will give me your hand, will you not? And let us be friends for all our lives. We shook hands, and he was so earnest and so kind that it made me quite choky. And now, he said, may I ask you for some more help? I have a great task to do, and at the beginning it is to know. You can help me here. Can you tell me what went before your going to Transylvania? Later on I may ask more help, and of a different kind, but at first this will do. Look here, sir, I said. Does what you have to do concern the Count? It does, he said sullenly. Then I am with you heart and soul. As you go by the 10.30 train, you will not have time to read them, but I shall get the bundle of papers. You can take them with you and read them on the train. After breakfast, I saw him to the station, when we were parting, he said, Perhaps you will come to town if I send you, and take Madame Mina too. We shall both come when you will, I said. I had got him the morning papers and the London papers of the previous night, and while we were talking at the carriage window, waiting for the train to start, he was turning them over. His eyes suddenly seemed to catch something in one of them. The Westminster Gazette. I knew it by the colour, and he grew quite white. He read something intently, groaning to himself. Mein Gott, mein Gott, so soon, so soon. I do not think he remembered me at the moment. Just then the whistle blew and the train moved off. This recalled him to himself and he leaned out the window and waved his hand, calling out, Love to Madame Nina. I shall write so soon as ever I can. Dr. Seward's Diary 26 September Truly there is no such thing as finality. Not a week since I said fini, and yet here I am, starting fresh again, or rather, going on with the same record. Until this afternoon I had no cause to think of what is done. Renfield had become to all intents as sane as he ever was. He was already well ahead with his fly business, and he had just started in the spider line also. 
so he had not been of any trouble to me. I had a letter from Arthur written on Sunday, and from it I gather that he is bearing up wonderfully well. Quincy Morris is with him, and that is much of a help, for he himself is a bubbling well of good spirits. Quincy wrote me a line too, and from him I hear that Arthur is beginning to recover something of his old buoyancy, so as to them all my mind is at rest. As for myself, I was settling down to my work with the enthusiasm which I used to have for it, so that I might fairly have said that the wound which poor Lucy left on me was becoming cicatrized. Everything is, however, now reopened, and what is to be the end God only knows. I have an idea that Van Helsing thinks he knows too, but he will only let out enough at a time to whet curiosity. He went to Exeter yesterday and stayed there all night. Today he came back and almost bounded into the room at about half-past five o'clock and thrust last night's Westminster Gazette into my hand. What do you think of that? he asked as he stood back and folded his arms. I looked over the paper for I really did not know what he meant, but he took it from me and pointed out a paragraph about children being decoyed away at Hampstead. It did not convey much to me until I reached a passage where it described small punctured wounds and their throats. An idea struck me, and I looked up. Well, he said, it is like poor Lucy's. And what do you make of it? Simply that there is some cause in common. Whatever it was that injured her has injured them. I did not quite understand his answer. That is true indirectly, but not directly. How do you mean, Professor? I asked. I was a little inclined to take his seriousness lightly, for, after all, four days of rest and freedom from burning, harrowing anxiety does help to restore one's spirits. But when I saw his face, it sobered me. Never, even in the midst of our despair about poor Lucy, had he looked more stern. Tell me, I said, I can hazard no opinion. I do not know what to think, and I have no data on which to found a conjecture. Do you mean to tell me, friend John, that you have no suspicion as to what poor Lucy died of, not after all the hints given, not only by events, but by me, of nervous prostration following on great loss or waste of blood, and how the blood lost or waste? I shook my head. He stepped over and sat down beside me and went on. You are a clever man, friend John. You reason well, and your wit is bold, but you are too prejudiced. You do not let your eyes see, nor your ears hear. And that which is outside your daily life is not of account to you. Do you not think that there are things which you cannot understand, and yet which are, that some people see things that others cannot? But there are things, old and new, which must not be contemplated by men's eyes, because they know, or think they know, some things which other men have told them. Ah, it is the fault of our science that wants to explain all, and if it explain not, then it says there is nothing to explain. But yet, we see around us every day the growth of new beliefs, which think themselves new and which are yet but the old, which pretend to be young, like the fine ladies at the opera. I suppose now you do not believe in corporeal transference, no? Nor in materialization, no? Nor in astral bodies, no? Nor in the reading of thought, no? Nor in hypnotism. Yes, I said, chocolate has proved that very well. He smiled as he went on. Then you are satisfied as to it, yes? And of course, when you understand how to act, and can follow the mind of the great Charcot. Yes, I said, Charcot has proved that pretty well. He smiled as he went on. Then you are satisfied as to it, yes? And of course, then you understand how it act, and can follow the mind of the great Charcot. Alas, that he is no more, into the very soul of the patient that he influence, no? Then, friend John, am I to take it that you simply accept fact, and are satisfied to let from premise to conclusion be a blank? No? Then tell me, for I am student of the brain, how you accept the hypnotism and reject the thought of reading. Let me tell you, my friend, that there are things done day to day in electrical science which would have been deemed unholy by the very men who discovered electricity, who would themselves not so long before have been burned as wizards. There are always mysteries in life. Why is it that Methuselah lived nine hundred years and old Pa one hundred and sixty-nine, and yet that poor Lucy, with four men's blood in her poor veins, could not live even one day? For had she lived one more day, we could have saved her. Do you know all the mystery of life and death? Do you know the altogether of comparative anatomy, and can say, wherefore, the qualities of brutes are in some men, and not in others? Can you tell me why, when other spiders die small and soon, that one great spider lived for centuries in the tower of the old Spanish church, and grew and grew, till on descending 
he could drink the oil of all the church lamps. Can you tell me why, in the pampas, I and elsewhere, there are bats that come at night and open the veins of cattle and horses and suck dry their veins? How in some islands of the western seas there are bats which hang on the trees all day, and those who have seen describe as like giant nuts or pods, and that when sailors sleep on the deck, because that it is hot, flit down on them, and then in the morning are found dead men, white as even Miss Lucy was. Good God, Professor, I said, starting up. Do you mean to tell me that Lucy was bitten by such a bat, and that such a thing is here in London in the nineteenth century? He waved his hand for silence and went on. Can you tell me why the tortoise lives more long than generations of men? Why the elephant goes on and on till he have seen dynasties? And why the parrot never die only of bite, of cat or dog, or other complaint? Can you tell me why men believe in all ages and places that there are some few who live on always if they be permit? that there are men and women who cannot die. We all know, because science has vouched for the fact, that there have been toads shut up in rocks for thousands of years, shut in one so small hole that only holds him since the use of the world. Can you tell me how the Indian fakir can make himself to die and have been buried and his grave sealed and corn sowed on it, that the corn reaped and be cut and sown and reaped again, and then men come and take away the unbroken seal? and that there lie the Indian, Fakir, not dead, but that rise up and walk amongst them as before. Here I interrupted him. I was getting bewildered. He so crowded on my mind his list of nature's eccentricities and possible impossibilities that my imagination was getting fired. I had a dim idea that he was teaching me some lesson, as long ago he used to do in his study at Amsterdam. But he used to then tell me the thing, so that I could have the object of thought in my mind all the time, but now I was without this help. Yet I wanted to follow him, so I said, Professor, let me be your student again. Tell me the thesis, so that I may apply your knowledge as you go on. At present, I am going in my mind from point to point as a madman, and not a sane one follows an idea. I feel like a novice lumbering through a bog in a mist, jumping from one tussock to another, in the mere blind effort to move on without knowing where I am going. That is good image, he said. Well, I shall tell you. My thesis is this. I want you to believe. To believe what? To believe in things that you cannot. Let me illustrate. I heard once of an American who so defined faith, that faculty which enables us to believe things which we know to be untrue. For one, I follow that man. He meant that we shall have an open mind and not let a little bit of truth check the rush of a big truth, like a small rock does a railway truck. We get the small truth first, good, we keep him, and we value him, but all the same we must not let him think himself all the truth in the universe. Then you want me not to let some previous conviction injure the receptivity of my mind with regard to some strange matter. Do I read your lesson aright? Ah, you are my favourite pupil still. It is worth to teach you, now that you are willing to understand. You have taken the first step to understand. You think then that those so small holes in the children's throats were made by the same that made the hole in Miss Lucy. I suppose so. He stood up and said solemnly, Then you are wrong. Oh, would it were so. But alas, no, it is worse. Far, far worse. In God's name, Professor Van Helsing, what do you mean? I cried. He threw himself with a despairing gesture into a chair and placed his elbows on the table, covering his face with his hands as he spoke. They were made by Miss Lucy. End of chapter 14. Recording by Corinne LePage. Chapter 15 of Dracula by Bram Stoker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Corinne LePage. Chapter 15. Dr. Seward's Diary Continued. For a while, sheer anger mastered me. It was as if he had, during her life, struck Lucy in the face. I smote the table hard and rose up as I said to him, Dr. Van Helsing, are you mad? He raised his head and looked at me, and somehow the tenderness of his face calmed me at once. Would I were, he said, madness were easy to bear compared with truth like this. Oh, my friend, why, think you, did I go so far round? Why take so long to tell you so simple a thing? 
Was it because I hate you and have hated you all my life? Was it because I wished to give you pain? Was it that I wanted, now so late, revenge for that time when you saved my life and from a fearful death? Ah, no. Forgive me, said I. He went on. My friend, it was because I wished to be gentle in the breaking to you, for I know that you have loved that so sweet lady. But even yet I do not expect you to believe. It is so hard to accept at once any abstract truth, that we may doubt such to be possible when we have always believed the no of it. It is more hard still to accept so sad a concrete truth, and of such a one as Miss Lucy. Tonight I go to prove it. Dare you come with me? This staggered me. A man does not like to prove such a truth. Byron accepted from the category jealousy. And prove the very truth he most abhorred. He saw my hesitation and spoke. The logic is simple. No madman's logic this time, jumping from tussock to tussock in a misty bog. If it be not true, then proof will be relief. At worst, it will not harm. If it be true, ah, there is the dread. Yet very dread should help my cause, for in it is some need of belief. Some I tell you. Come, I tell you what I propose. First, that we go off now and see that child in the hospital. Dr. Vincent of the North Hospital, where the papers say the child is, is friend of mine, and I think of yours since you were in class at Amsterdam. He will let two scientists see his case, if he will not let two friends. We shall tell him nothing, but only that we wish to learn. And then he took a key from his pocket and held it up. And then we spent the night, you and I, in the churchyard where Lucy lies. This is the key that locked the tomb. I had it from the coffin man to give to Arthur. My heart sank within me, for I felt that there was some fearful ordeal before us. I could do nothing, however, so I plucked up what heart I could and said that we had better hasten, as the afternoon was passing. We found the child awake. It had had a sleep and taken some food, and altogether was going on well. Dr. Vincent took the bandage from its throat and showed us the punctures. There was no mistaking of the similarity to those which had been on Lucy's throat. They were smaller, and the edges looked fresher, that was all. We asked Vincent to what he attributed them, and he replied that it must have been a bite of some animal, perhaps a rat, but, for his own part, he was inclined to think that it was one of the bats which are so numerous on the northern heights of London. Out of so many harmless ones, he said, there may be some wild specimen from the south of a more malignant species. Some sailor may have brought one home and it managed to escape, or, even from the zoological gardens, a young one may have got loose. Or one be bred there from a vampire. These things do occur, you know. Only ten days ago a wolf got out and was, I believe, traced up in this direction. For a week after, the children were playing nothing but Red Riding Hood on the heath and in every alley in the place until this blue for Lady Scar came along. Since when, it had been quite a gala time for them. Even this poor little mite, when he woke up today, asked the nurse if he might go away. When she asked him why he wanted to go, he said he wanted to play with the blue for Lady. I hope, said Van Helsing, that when you are sending the child home, you will caution its parents to keep strict watch over it. These fancies to stray are most dangerous, and if the child were to remain out another night, it would probably be fatal. But in any case, I suppose you will not let it away for some days. Certainly not. Not for a week, at least. Longer if the wound is not healed. Our visit to the hospital took more time than we had reckoned on, and the sun had dipped before we came out. When Van Helsing saw how dark it was, he said, There is no hurry. It is more late than I thought. Come, let us seek somewhere that we may eat, and then we shall go on our way. We dined at Jack Straw's castle, along with a little crowd of bicyclists, and others who were genially noisy. About ten o'clock we started from the inn. It was then very dark, and the scattered lamps made the darkness greater when we were once outside their individual radius. The professor had evidently noted the road we were to go, for we went on unhesitatingly, but, as for me, I was in quite a mix-up as to locality. As we went further we met fewer and fewer people, till at last we were somewhat surprised when we met even the patrol of horse police going their usual suburban round. At last we reached the wall of the churchyard, which we climbed over. With some little difficulty, for it was very dark, and the whole place seemed so strange to us, we found the western tomb. The professor took the key, opened the creaky door, and standing back politely, but quite unconsciously, mentioned to me to precede him. There was a delicious irony in the offer, in the courtliness of giving preference on such a ghastly occasion. My companion followed me quickly and cautiously drew the door too, after carefully ascertaining that the lock was a falling and not a spring one. In the latter case, we should have been in a bad plight. Then he fumbled in his bag, and taking out a matchbox and a piece of candle, proceeded to make a light. 
The tomb in the daytime, and when wreathed with fresh flowers, had looked grim and gruesome enough. But now, some days afterwards, when the flowers hung lank and dead, their whites turning to rust and their greens to browns, when the spider and the beetle had resumed their accustomed dominance, when time discoloured stone and dust encrusted mortar and rusty dank iron and tarnished brass and clouded silver plating gave back the feeble glimmer of a candle, the effect was more miserable and sordid than could have been imagined. It conveyed irresistibly the idea that life, animal life, was not the only thing that could pass away. Van Helsing went about his work systematically, holding his candle so that he could read the coffin plates and so holding it that the sperm dropped off in white patches which congealed as they touched the metal. He made assurance of Lucy's coffin, another search in his bag, and he took out a turn screw. "'What are you going to do?' I asked. "'To open the coffin. You shall yet be convinced.' Straight away he began taking out the screws and finally lifted off the lid, showing the casing of lead beneath. The sight was almost too much for me. It seemed to be as much an affront to the dead as it would have been to have stripped off her clothing in her sleep whilst living. I actually took hold of his hand to stop him. He only said, "'You shall see.' and again, fumbling in his bag, took out a tiny fret saw. Striking the turnscrew through the lead with a swift downward stab, which made me wince, he made a small hole which was, however, big enough to admit the point of the saw. I had expected a rush of gas from the weak old corpse. We doctors who have had to study our dangers have to become accustomed to such things, and I drew back towards the door. But the professor never stopped for a moment. He sawed down a couple of feet along one side of the lead coffin, and then across and down the other side. Taking the edge of the loose flange, he bent it back towards the front of the coffin, and holding up the candle to the aperture, motioned to me to look. I drew near and looked. The coffin was empty. It was certainly a surprise to me, and gave me a considerable shock, but Van Helsing was unmoved. He was now more sure than ever of his ground, and so emboldened to proceed in his task. Are you satisfied now, friend John? he asked. I felt all the dogged argumentativeness of my nature awake within me as I answered him. I am satisfied that Lucy's body is not in that coffin, but that only proves one thing. And what is that, friend John? That it is not there. That is good logic, he said, as far as it goes. But how do you, how can you, account for it not being there? Perhaps a body snatcher, I suggested. Some of the undertaker's people may have stolen it. I felt that I was speaking fully and yet it was the only real cause which I could suggest. The professor sighed. Ah, well, he said, we must have more proof. Come with me. He put on the coffin lid again, gathered up all his things, and placed them in the bag, blew out the light, and placed the candle also in the bag. We opened the door and went out. Behind us, he closed the door and locked it. He handed me the key, saying, Will you keep it? You had better be assured. I laughed. It was not a very cheerful laugh, I am bound to say, as I motioned him to keep it. A key is nothing, I said. There may be duplicates, and anyhow it is not difficult to pick a lock of that kind. He said nothing, but put the key in his pocket. Then he told me to watch at one side of the churchyard whilst he would watch at the other. I took up my place behind a yew tree, and I saw his dark figure move until the entries hid it from my sight. It was a lonely vigil. Just after I had taken my place I heard a distant clock strike twelve, and in time came one and two. I was chilled and unnerved and angry with the professor for taking me on such an errand and with myself for coming. I was too cold and too sleepy to be keenly observant and not sleepy enough to betray my trust so altogether I had a dreary, miserable time. Suddenly as I turned around I thought I saw something like a white streak moving between two dark yew trees at the side of the churchyard farthest from the tomb. At the same time a dark mass moved from the professor's side of the ground and hurriedly went towards it. Then I too moved, but I had to go round headstones and railed off tombs, and I stumbled over graves. The sky was overcast, and somewhere far off an early cock crew. A little way off, beyond a line of scattered juniper trees which marked the pathway to the church, a white, dim figure flitted in the direction of the tomb. The tomb itself was hidden by trees, and I could not see where the figure disappeared. I heard the rustle of actual movement where I had first seen the white figure, and coming over, found the professor holding in his arms a tiny child. When he saw me, he held it out to me and said, Are you satisfied now? No, I said, in a way that I felt was aggressive. Do you not see the child? Yes, it is a child, but who brought it here? And is it wounded? I asked. We shall see, said the professor, and with one impulse we took our way out of the churchyard, he carrying the sleeping child. 
When we had got some little distance away, we went into a clump of trees and struck a match and looked at the child's throat. It was without a scratch or scar of any kind. Was I right? I asked triumphantly. We were just in time, said the professor thankfully. We had now to decide what we were to do with the child and so consulted about it. If we were to take it to a police station, we should have to give some account of our movements during the night. At least we should have had to make some statement as to how we had come to find the child. So finally we decided that we would take it to the heath, and when we heard a policeman coming, would leave it where he could not fail to find it. We would then seek our way home as quickly as we could. All fell out well. At the edge of Hampstead Heath we heard a policeman's heavy tramp, and laying the child on the pathway, we waited and watched until he saw it as he flashed his lantern to and fro. We heard his exclamation of astonishment, and then we went away silently. By good chance we got a cab near the Spaniards, and drove to town. I cannot sleep, so I make this entry. But I must try to get a few hours sleep, as Van Helsing is to call for me at noon. He insists that I shall go with him on another expedition. 27 September It was two o'clock before we found a suitable opportunity for our attempt. The funeral held at noon was all completed, and the last strugglers of the mourners had taken themselves lazily away, when, looking carefully from behind a clump of altar trees, we saw the sexton lock the gate after him. We knew then that we were safe till morning did we desire it, but the professor told me that we should not want more than an hour at most. Again I felt that horrid sense of the reality of things in which any effort of imagination seemed out of place, and I realized distinctly the perils of the law which we were incurring in our own unhallowed work. Besides, I felt it was all so useless. Outrageous as it was to open a laden coffin, to see if a woman dead nearly a week were really dead, it now seemed the height of folly to open the tomb again, when we knew, from the evidence of our own eyesight, that the coffin was empty. I shrugged my shoulders, however, and rested silent, for Van Helsing had a way of going on his own road, no matter who remonstrated. He took the key, opened the vault, and again courteously motioned me to proceed. The place was not so gruesome as last night, but, oh, how unutterably mean-looking when the sunshine streamed in. Van Helsing walked over to Lucy's coffin, and I followed. He bent over and again forced back the leaden flange, and then a shock of surprise and dismay shot through me. There lay Lucy, seemingly just as we had seen her the night before her funeral. She was, if possible, more radiantly beautiful than ever, and I could not believe that she was dead. The lips were red, nay, redder than before, and on the cheeks was a delicate bloom. "'Is this a juggle?' I said to him. "'Are you convinced now?' said the professor in response, and as he spoke he put over his hand, and in a way that made me shudder, pulled back the dead lips, and showed the white teeth. "'See,' he went on, "'see they are even sharper than before, with this and this,' and he touched one of the canine teeth and that below it. "'The little children can be bitten. "'Are you of belief now, friend John?' Once more, argumentative hostility woke within me. I could not accept such an overwhelming idea as he suggested. So, with an attempt to argue of which I was even at the moment ashamed, I said, She may have been placed here since last night. Indeed. That is so, and by whom? I do not know someone has done it. And yet she has been dead one week. Most peoples in that time would not look so. I had no answer for this, so was silent. Van Helsing did not seem to notice my silence. At any rate, he showed neither chagrin nor triumph. He was looking intently at the face of the dead woman, raising the eyelids and looking at the eyes, and once more opening the lips and examining the teeth. Then he turned to me and said, Here, there is one thing which is different from all recorded. Here is some dual life that is not as the common. She was bitten by the vampire when she was in a trance, sleepwalking. Oh, you start. You do not know that, friend John but you shall know it all later. And in a trance, could he best come to take more blood? In trance, she died, and in trance, she is undead too. So it is that she differ from all other, usually when the undead sleep at home. As he spoke, he made a comprehensive sweep of his arm to designate what to a vampire was home. Their face show what they are, but this so sweet, that was when she was not undead, she go back to the nothings of the common dead. There is no malign here, see. And so it make hard that I must kill her in her sleep. This turned my blood cold, and it began to dawn upon me that I was accepting Van Helsing's theories. But if she were really dead, what was there of terror in the idea of killing her? He looked up at me, and evidently saw the change in my face, for he said almost joyously, Ah, 
you believe now? I answered, do not press me too hard all at once. I am willing to accept. How will you do this bloody work? I shall cut off her head and fill her mouth with garlic, and I shall drive a stake through her body. It made me shudder to think of so mutilating the body of a woman whom I had loved. And yet, the feeling was not so strong as I had expected. I was, in fact, beginning to shudder at the presence of this being, this undead, as Van Helsing called it, and to loathe it. Is it possible that love is all subjective or all objective? I waited a considerable time for Van Helsing to begin, but he stood as if wrapped in thought. Presently, he closed the hatch of his bag with a snap and said, I have been thinking, and have made up my mind as to what is best. If I did simply follow my inclining, I would do now, at this moment, what is to be done. But there are other things to follow, and things that are a thousand times more difficult in that them we do not know. This is simple. She have yet no life taken, though that is of time, and to act now would be to take danger from her for ever. But then we may have to want Arthur, and how shall we tell him of this? If you, who saw the wounds on Lucy's throat and saw the wounds so similar on the child's at the hospital, if you, who saw the coffin empty last night and full today with a woman who have not changed only to be more rose and more beautiful in a whole week after she die, if you know of this and know of the white figure last night that brought the child to the churchyard, and yet of your own senses you did not believe, how then can I expect Arthur, who know none of these things, to believe. He doubted me when I took him from her kiss when she was dying. I know he has forgiven me because in some mistaken idea I have done things that prevent him say goodbye as he ought, and he may think that in some more mistaken idea this woman was buried alive, and that in most mistake of all we have killed her. He will then argue back that it is we, mistaken ones, who have killed her by our ideas, and so he will be much unhappy always. Yet he never can be sure and that is the worst of all, and he will sometimes think that she he loved was buried alive, and that will paint his dreams with horrors of what she must have suffered, and again he will think that we may be right, and that his so beloved was after all undead. No, I told him once, and since then I learn much. Now, since I know it is all true, a hundred thousand times more do I know that he must pass through the bitter waters to reach the sweet. He, poor fellow, must have one hour that will make the very face of heaven grow black to him, that we can act for good all round and send him peace. My mind is made up. Let us go. You return home for tonight to your asylum and see that all be well. As for me, I shall spend the night here in this churchyard in my own way. Tomorrow night you will come to me to the Berkeley Hotel at ten of the clock. I shall send for Arthur to come too, and also that so fine young man of America that gave his blood. Later we shall have work to do. I come with you so far as Piccadilly and dare dine, for I must be back here before the sunset. So we locked the tomb and came away, and got over the wall of the churchyard, which was not much of a task, and drove back to Piccadilly. Note left by Van Helsing in his portmanteau, Berkeley Hotel, directed to John Seward, M.D. Not delivered. 27 September. Friend John, I write this in case anything should happen. I go alone to watch in that churchyard. It pleases me that the undead, Miss Lucy, shall not leave tonight, that so on the morrow night she may be more eager. Therefore I shall fix some things that she like not, garlic and a crucifix, and so seal up the door of the tomb. She is young as undead and will heat. Moreover, these are only to prevent her coming out. They may not prevail on her wanting to get in, for then the undead is desperate and must find the line of least resistance, whatsoever it may be. I shall be at hand all the night from sunset till after the sunrise, and if there be aught that may be learned, I shall learn from it. For Miss Lucy or from her I have no fear, but that other to whom is there, that she is undead. He hath now the power to seek her tomb and find shelter. He is cunning, as I know from Mr. Jonathan, and from the way that all along he hath fooled us, when he played with us for Miss Lucy's life and we lost, and in many ways the undead are strong. He have always the strength in his hand of twenty men. Even only four who gave our strength to Miss Lucy, it also is all to him. Besides, he can summon his wolf, and I know not what. Sir, if it be that he come hither on this night, he shall find me, 
but none other shall, until it be too late. But it may be that he will not attempt the place. There is no reason why he should. His hunting ground is more full of game than the churchyard where the undead women sleep, and the one old man's watch. Therefore I write in this case, take the papers that are with this, the diaries of Harker and the rest, and read them, and then find this great undead and cut off his head and burn his heart or drive a stake through it, so that the world may rest from him. If it be, sir, farewell. Van Helsing. Dr. Seward's Diary. 28th September. It is wonderful what a good night's sleep would do for one. Yesterday I was almost willing to accept Van Helsing's monstrous ideas, but now they seem to start out lurid, performing as outrages on common sense. I have no doubt that he believes it all. I wonder if his mind can have become in any way unhinged. Surely there must be some rational explanation of all these mysterious things. Is it possible that the professor can have done it himself? He is so abnormally clever that if he went off his head he would carry out his intent with regard to some fixed idea in a wonderful way. I am loath to think it, and indeed it would be almost as great a marvel as the other to find that Van Helsing was mad. But anyhow, I shall watch him carefully. I may get some light on the mystery. 29 September morning Last night, a little before ten o'clock, Arthur and Quincy came into Van Helsing's room. He told us all he wanted us to do, but especially addressing himself to Arthur, as if all our wheels were centred in his. He began by saying that he hoped we would all come with him too, for, he said, there is a grave duty to be done there. You were doubtless surprised at my letter. His query was directly addressed to Lord Godalming. I was. It rather upset me for a bit. There has been so much trouble around my house of late that I could do without any more. I have been curious, too, as to what you mean. Quincy and I talked it over, but the more we talked, the more puzzled we got. Till now, I can say for myself that I am about up a tree as to any meaning about anything. Me too, said Quincy Morris laconically. Oh, said the professor, then you are near the beginning, both of you, than friend John here, who has to go a long way back before he can even get so far as to begin. It was evident that he recognised my return to my old doubting frame of mind without my saying a word. Then, turning to the other two, he said with intense gravity, I want your permission to do what I think good this night. It is, I know, much to ask, and when you know what it is I propose to do, you will know, and only then, how much. Therefore, may I ask that you promise me in the dark, so that afterwards, though you may be angry with me for a time, I must not disguise from myself the possibility that such may be. You shall not blame yourselves for anything. That's frank anyhow, broke in Quincy. I'll answer for the professor. I don't quite see his drift, but I swear he's honest and that's good enough for me. I thank you, sir, said Van Helsing proudly. I have done myself the honour of counting you one trusting friend, and such endorsement is dear to me. He held out a hand which Quincy took. Then Arthur spoke out. Dr. Van Helsing, I don't quite like to buy a pig in a poke, as they say in Scotland, and if it be anything in which my honour as a gentleman or my faith as a Christian is concerned, I cannot make such a promise. If you can assure me that what you intend does not violate either of these two, then I give my consent at once, though for the life of me I cannot understand what you are driving at. I accept your limitation, said Van Helsing, and all I ask of you is that if you feel it necessary to condemn any act of mine, you will first consider it well, and be satisfied that it does not violate your reservations. Agreed, said Arthur, that is only fair. And now that the poor parlays are over, may I ask what it is we are to do? I want you to come with me, and to come, in secret, to the churchyard at Kingstead. Arthur's face fell, as he said, in an amazed sort of way, where poor Lucy is buried. The professor bowed. Arthur went on. And one there? To enter the tomb. Arthur stood up. Professor, are you in earnest, or is it some monstrous joke? Pardon me, I see that you are in earnest. He sat down again, but I could see that he sat firmly and proudly, as one who was on his dignity. There was silence until he asked again. And when in the tomb? To open the coffin. This is too much, he said, angrily rising again. I am willing to be patient in all things that are reasonable, but in this, this desecration of the grave of one who... He fairly choked with indignation. The professor looked pityingly at him. If I could spare you one pang, my poor friend, he said, God knows I would. 
but this night our feet must tread on thorny paths, or later, and forever, the feet you love must walk in paths of flame. Arthur looked up with set white face and said, Take care, sir, take care. Would it not be well to hear what I have to say, said Van Helsing, and then you will at least know the limit of my purpose. Shall I go on? That's fair enough, broke in Morris. After a pause, Van Helsing went on, evidently with an effort. Miss Lucy is dead. Is it not so? Yes, then there can be no wrong in her. But if she be not dead... Arthur jumped to his feet. Good God, he cried. What do you mean? Has there been any mistake? Has she been buried alive? He groaned in anguish that not even hope could soften. I did not say she was alive, my child. I did not think it. I go no further than to say that she might be undead. Undead? Not alive? What do you mean? Is this all a nightmare, or what is it? There are mysteries which men can only guess at, which, age by age, they may solve only in part. Believe me, we are now on the verge of one, but I have not done. May I cut off the head of dead Miss Lucy? Heavens and earth, no! cried Arthur in a storm of passion. Not for the wide world will I consent to any mutilation of a dead body. Dr. Van Helsing, you try me too far. What have I done to you that you should torture me so? What did that poor, sweet girl do that you should want to cast such dishonour on her grave? Are you mad that speak of such things, or am I mad to listen to them? Don't dare to think more of such a desecration. I shall not give my consent to anything you do, and I have a duty to do in protecting her grave from outrage, and by God I shall do it. Van Helsing rose up from where he had all the time been seated, and said gravely and sternly, My lord of Godalming, I too have a duty to do. A duty to others, a duty to you, a duty to the dead, and by God I shall do it. All I ask you now is that you come with me, that you look and listen, and if when later I make the same request you do not be more eager for its fulfilment even than I am, then, then I shall do my duty, whatever it may seem to me, and then to follow of your lordship's wishes I shall hold myself at your disposal to render an account to you when and where you will. His voice broke a little, and he went on with a voice full of pity. But I beseech you, do not go forth in anger with me. In a long life of acts which were often not pleasant to do, and which sometimes did wring my heart, I have never had so heavy a task as now. Believe me that if the time comes for you to change your mind towards me, one look from you will wipe away all this so sad hour, for I would do what a man can to save you from sorrow. Just think, for why should I give myself so much labour and so much of sorrow? I have come here from my own land to do what I can of good, at the first to please my friend John, and then to help a sweet young lady whom, too, I came to love. For her, I am ashamed to say so much, but I say it in kindness. I gave what you gave, the blood of my veins, I gave it. I, who was not like you, her lover, but only her physician and her friend. I gave to her my nights and days, before death, after death, and if my death can do her good even now, when she is the dead undead, she shall have it freely. He said this with a very grave, sweet pride, and Arthur was much affected by it. He took the old man's hand and said in a broken voice, Oh, it is hard to think of it, and I cannot understand. But at least I shall go with you and wait. End of chapter 15. Recording by Corinne LePage. Chapter 16 of Dracula by Bram Stoker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Corinne LePage. Chapter 16. Dr. Seward's Diary. Continued. It was just a quarter before twelve o'clock when we got into the churchyard over the low wall. The night was dark with occasional gleams of moonlight between the rents of heavy clouds that scudded across the sky. We all kept somehow close together, with Van Helsing slightly in front as he led the way. 
When we had come close to the tomb, I looked well at Arthur, for I feared that the proximity to a place laden with so sorrowful a memory would upset him, but he bore himself well. I took it that the very mystery of the proceeding was in some way a counteractant to his grief. The professor unlocked the door, and seeing a natural hesitation amongst us for various reasons, solved the difficulty by entering first himself. The rest of us followed, and he closed the door. He then lit a dark lantern and pointed to the coffin. Arthur stepped forward hesitatingly. Van Helsing said to me, "'You are here yesterday. Was the body of Miss Lucy in the coffin?' "'It was.' The professor turned to the rest, saying, "'You hear, and yet there is no one who does not believe with me.' He took his screwdriver and again took off the lid of the coffin. Arthur looked on very pale but silent. When the lid was removed, he stepped forward. He evidently did not know that there was a leaden coffin, or at any rate, had not thought of it. When he saw the rent in the lead, the blood rushed to his face for an instant, but as quickly fell away again, so that he remained of a ghastly whiteness. He was still silent. Van Helsing forced back the leaden flange, and we all looked in and recoiled. The coffin was empty. For several minutes no one spoke a word. The silence was broken by Quincy Morris. Professor, I answered for you. Your word is all I want. I wouldn't ask such a thing ordinarily. I wouldn't so dishonour you as to imply a doubt. But this is a mystery that goes beyond any honour or dishonour. Is this your doing? I swear to you by all that I hold sacred that I have not removed nor touched her. What happened was this. Two nights ago, my friend Seward and I came here with good purpose, believe me. I opened that coffin, which was then sealed up, and we found it, as now, empty. We then waited and saw something white come through the trees. The next day we came here in daytime, and she lay there. Did she not, friend John? Yes. That night we were just in time. One more so small child was missing, and we find it, thank God, unharmed amongst the graves. Yesterday I came here before sundown, for at sundown the undead can move. I waited here all night till the sun rose, but I saw nothing. It was most probable that it was because I had laid over the clumps of those doors garlic, which the undead cannot bear, and other things which they shun. Last night there was no exodus, so tonight, before the sundown, I took away my garlic and other things, and so it is we find this coffin empty. But bear with me. So far there is much that is strange. Wait ye with me outside, unseen and unheard, and things much stranger are yet to be. So, here he shut the dark slide of his lantern, now to the outside. He opened the door and we filed out, he coming last and locking the door behind him. Oh, but it seemed fresh and pure in the night air after the tower of the vault. How sweet it was to see the clouds race by, and the passing gleams of the moonlight between the scudding clouds crossing and passing, like the gladness and sorrow of a man's life. How sweet it was to breathe the fresh air that had no taint of death and decay. How humanizing to see the red lighting of the sky beyond the hill and to hear far away the muffled roar that marks the life of a great city. Each in his own way was solemn and overcome. Arthur was silent and was, I could see, striving to grasp the purpose and the inner meaning of the mystery. I was myself tolerably patient and half inclined again to throw aside doubt and to accept Van Helsing's conclusions. Quincy Morris was phlegmatic in the way of a man who accepts all things and accepts them in the spirit of cool bravery with hazard of all he has to stake. Not being able to smoke, he cut himself a good-sized plug of tobacco and began to chew. As to Van Helsing, he was employed in a definite way. First he took from his bag a mass of what looked like thin wafer-like biscuit, which was carefully rolled up in a white napkin. Next he took out a double handful of some whitish stuff like dough or putty. He crumbled the wafer up fine and worked it into the mass between his hands. This he then took, and rolling into thin strips began to lay them into crevices between the door and its setting in the tomb. I was somewhat puzzled in this, and being close asked him what it was that he was doing. Arthur and Quincy drew near also, as they too were curious. He answered, I am closing the tomb so that the undead may not enter. And is that stuff you have put there going to do it? asked Quincy. Great Scott, is this a game? It is. What is that which you are using? This time, the question was by Arthur. Van Helsing reverently lifted his hat as he answered. The host. I brought it from Amsterdam. I have an indulgence. It was an answer that appalled the most sceptical of us, and we felt individually that the presence of such earnest purpose as the professor's 
a purpose which could thus use to him most sacred of things was impossible to distrust. In respectful silence, we took the places assigned to us close round the tomb, but, hidden from the sight of any one approaching, I pitied the others, especially Arthur. I had myself been apprenticed by my former visits to this watching horror, and yet I, who had up to an hour ago repudiated the proofs, felt my heart sink within me. Never did tombs look so ghastly white, never did cypress or you or juniper so seem the embodiment of funereal gloom. Never did tree or grass wave or rustle so ominously, never did bow or creak so mysteriously, and never did the faraway howling of dogs send such a woeful presage through the night. There was a long spell of silence, a big, aching void, and then from the professor, a keen He pointed, and far down the avenue of yews, we saw a white figure advance, a dim, white figure which held something dark at its breast. The figure stopped, and at the moment a ray of moonlight fell upon the masses of driving clouds and showed in startling prominence a dark-haired woman, dressed in the cerements of the grave. We could not see the face, for it was bent down over what we saw to be a fair-haired child. There was a pause and a sharp little cry, such as a child gives in sleep, or a dog as it lies before the fire and dreams. We were starting forward, but the professor's warning hand, seen by us as he stood behind a yew tree, kept us back. And then as we looked, the white figure moved forwards again. It was now near enough for us to see clearly, and the moonlight still held. My own heart grew cold as ice, and I could hear the gasp of Arthur as we recognised the features of Lucy Westenra. Lucy Westenra, but yet, how changed! The sweetness was turned to adamantine, heartless cruelty, and the purity to voluptuous wantonness. Then Helsing stepped out, and obedient to his gesture, we all advanced too. The four of us ranged in a line before the door of the tomb. Van Helsing raised his lantern and drew the slide. By the concentrated light that fell on Lucy's face, we could see that the lips were crimson with fresh blood, and that the stream had trickled over her chin and stained the purity of her long death robe. We shuddered with horror. I could see by the tremulous light that even Van Helsing's iron nerve had failed. Arthur was next to me, and if I had not seized his arm and held him up, he would have fallen. When Lucy, I call the thing that was before us Lucy because it bore her shape, saw us, she drew back with an angry snarl such as a cat gives when taken unawares. Then her eyes ranged over us, Lucy's eyes in form and colour, but Lucy's eyes unclean and full of hell fire instead of the pure, gentle orbs we knew. At that moment the remnant of my love passed into hate and loathing. Had she then to be killed, I could have done it with savage delight. As she looked, her eyes blazed with unholy light, and the face became wreathed with a voluptuous smile. Oh God, how it made me shudder to see it! With a careless motion, she flung to the ground, callous as a devil, the child that up to now she had clutched strenuously to her breast, growling over it as a dog growls over a bone. The child gave a sharp cry and lay there moaning. There was a cold-bloodedness in the act which wrung a groan from Arthur, when she advanced to him with outstretched arms and a wanton smile, he fell back and hid his face in his hands. She still advanced, however, and with a languorous, voluptuous grace said, Come to me, Arthur. Leave these others and come to me. My arms are hungry for you. Come and we can rest together. Come, my husband, come. There was something diabolically sweet in her tones, something of the tingling of glass when struck, which rang through the brains even of us who heard the words addressed to another. As for Arthur, he seemed under a spell. Moving his hands from his face, he opened wide his arms. She was leaping for them when Van Helsing sprang forward and held between them his little golden crucifix. She recoiled from it and, with a sudden distorted face full of rage, dashed past him as if to enter the tomb. When within foot or two of the door, however, she stopped, as if arrested by some irresistible force. Then she turned, and her face was shown in the clear burst of moonlight and by the lamp, which had now no quiver from Van Helsing's iron nerves. Never did I see such baffled malice on a face, and never, I trust, shall ever be seen again by mortal eyes. The beautiful colour became livid. The eyes seemed to throw out sparks of hellfire. The brows were wrinkled as though the folds of the flesh were the coils of Medusa's snakes and the lovely blood-stained mouth grew to an open square 
as in passion masks of the Greeks and Japanese. If ever a face meant death, if looks could kill, we saw it at that moment. And so, for full half a minute which seemed an eternity, she remained between the lifted crucifix and the sacred closing of her means of entry. Van Helsing broke the silence by asking Arthur, Answer me, O oh my friend, am I to proceed in my work? Arthur threw himself on his knees and hid his face in his hands as he answered, Do as you will, friend, do as you will. There can be no horror like this ever any more. And he groaned in spirit. Quincy and I simultaneously moved towards him and took his arms. We could hear the click of the closing lantern as Van Helsing held it down. Coming close to the tomb, he began to remove from the chinks some of the sacred emblem which he had placed there. We all looked on in horrified amazement as we saw, when he stood back, the woman with a corporeal body as real as that moment as our own, pass in through the interstice where scarce a knife blade could have gone. We all felt a glad sense of relief when we saw the professor calmly restoring the strings of putty to the edges of the door. When this was done, he lifted the child and said, Come now, my friends, we can do no more till tomorrow. There is a funeral at noon, so here we shall all come before long after that. The friends of the dead will all be gone by two, and when the sexton lock the gate we shall remain. Then there is more to do, but not like this of tonight. As for this little one, he is not much harm, and by tomorrow night he shall be well. We shall leave him where the police will find him, as on the other night, and then to home. Coming close to Arthur, he said, My friend Arthur, you have had a sore trial, but after, when you look back, you will see how it was necessary. You are now in the bitter waters, my child. By this time tomorrow you will, please God, have passed them and have drunk of the sweet waters. So do not mourn over much. Till then, I shall not ask you to forgive me. Arthur and Quincy came home with me, and we tried to cheer each other on the way. We had left the child in safety, and we were tired, so we all slept with more or less reality of sleep. 29 September. Night. A little before twelve o'clock, we three, Arthur Quincy Morris and myself, called for the professor. It was odd to notice that by common consent we had all put on black clothes. Of course Arthur wore black, for he was in deep mourning, but the rest of us wore it by instinct. We got to the churchyard by half-past one, and strolled about keeping out of official observation, so that when the gravediggers had completed the task and the sexton, under the belief that everyone had gone, had locked the gate, we had the place all to ourselves. Van Helsing, instead of his little black bag, had with him a long leather one, something like a cricketing bag. It was manifestly of fair weight. When we were alone, and had heard the last of the footsteps die out up the road, we silently, as if by ordered intention, followed the professor to the tomb. He unlocked the door, and we entered, closing it behind us. Then he took from his bag the lantern which he lit, and also two wax candles which, when lighted, he stuck by melting their own ends on other coffins, so that they might give light sufficient to work by. When he again lifted the lid off Lucy's coffin, we all looked, Arthur trembling like an aspen, and saw that the body lay there in all its death beauty. But there was no love in my own heart, nothing but a loathing for the foul thing which had taken Lucy's shape without her soul. I could see even Arthur's face grow hard as he looked. Presently he said to Van Helsing, Is this really Lucy's body, or only a demon in her shape? It is her body, and yet not it. But wait a while, and you will see her as she was, and is. She seemed like a nightmare of Lucy as she lay there, the pointed teeth, the blood-stained voluptuous mouth, which made one shudder to see, the whole carnal and unspiritual appearance seeming like a devilish mockery of Lucy's sweet purity. Van Helsing, with his usual methodicalness, began taking the various contents from his bag and placing them ready for use. First he took out a soldering iron and some plumbing solder, and then a small oil lamp which gave out, when lit in a corner of the tomb, gas which burned at a fierce heat with a blue flame, then his operating knives, which he placed to hand, and last, a round wooden stake, some two and a half or three inches thick and about three feet long. One end of it was hardened by charring in the fire and was sharpened to a fine point. With this stake came a heavy hammer, such as in households is used in the coal cellar for breaking the lumps. To me, a doctor's preparations for work of any kind are stimulating and bracing, but the effect of these things on both Arthur and Quincy was to cause them a sort of consternation. They both, however, kept their courage and remained silent and quiet. When all was ready, Van Helsing said, 
before we do anything, let me tell you this. It is out of the law and experience of the ancients and all those who have studied the powers of the undead. When they become such, there comes with the change the curse of immortality. They cannot die, but must go on age after age, adding new victims and multiplying the evils of the world. For all that die from the preying of the undead becomes themselves undead and prey on their kind. And so the circle goes on ever widening, like as the ripples from a stone thrown in the water. Friend Arthur, if you had met that kiss which you know of before poor Lucy die, or again last night when you open your arms to her, you would in time, when you had died, have become Nosferatu, as they call it in Eastern Europe, and would all the time make more of those undeads that so have filled us with horror. The career of this so unhappy dear lady is but just begun. Those children whose blood she suck are not as yet so much the worse, but if she live on, undead, more and more they lose their blood, and by her power over them, they come to her, and so she draw their blood with that so wicked mouth. But if she die in truth, then all cease. The tiny wounds of the throats disappear, and they go back to their plays, unknowing ever of what has been. But if the most blessed of all, when this now undead be made to rest as true dead, then the soul of the poor lady whom we love shall again be free, instead of working wickedness by night and growing more debased in the assimilating of it by day. She shall take her place with the other angels. So that, my friend, it will be a blessed hand for her that shall strike down the blow that sets her free. To this I am willing, but is there none amongst us who has a better right? Will it be no joy to think of hereafter in the silence of the night, when sleep is not? It was my hand that sent her to the stars. It was the hand of him that loved her best, the hand that of all she would herself have chosen. Had it been to her to choose, tell me if there be such a one amongst us. We all looked at Arthur, he saw, too, what we all did, the infinite kindness which suggested that his should be the hand which would restore Lucy to us as a holy and not an unholy memory. He stepped forward and said bravely, though his hand trembled and his face was as pale as snow. My true friend, from the bottom of my broken heart, thank you. Tell me what I am to do, and I shall not falter. Then Helsing laid a hand on his shoulder and said, Brave lad, a moment's courage and it is done. This stake must be driven through her. It will be a fearful ordeal, be not deceived in that. But it will be only a short time, and you will then rejoice more than your pain was great. From this grim tomb you will emerge as though you tread on air. But you must not falter when once you have begun. Only think that we, your true friends, are round you, and that we pray for you all the time. Go on, said Arthur hoarsely. Tell me what I am to do. Take this stick in your left hand, ready to place the point over the heart, and the hammer in your right. Then, when we begin our prayer for the dead, I shall read him. I have here in the book, and the others shall follow. Strike in God's name, that so all may be well with the dead that we love, and that the undead pass away. Arthur took the stick and the hammer, and when once his mind was set on action, his hands never trembled nor even quivered. Van Helsing opened his missal and began to read, and Quincy and I followed as well as we could. Arthur placed the point over the heart, and as I looked, I could see its dint in the white flesh. Then he struck with all his might. The thing in the coffin writhed, and a hideous blood-curdling screech came from the opened red lips. The body shook and quivered and twisted in wild contortions. The sharp white teeth chumped together till the lip were cut, and the mouth was smeared with crimson foam. But Arthur never faltered. He looked like a figure of Thor as his untrembling arm rose and fell, driving deeper and deeper the mercy-bearing stake, whilst the blood from the pierced heart welled and spurted up all around it. His face was set, and high duty seemed to shine through it. The sight of it gave us courage so that our voices seemed to ring through the little vault. And then the writhing and quivering of the body became less, and the teeth seemed to chomp and the face to quiver. Finally it lay still. The terrible task was over. The hammer fell from Arthur's hand. He reeled and would have fallen had we not caught him. The great drops of sweat sprang from his forehead, and his breath came in broken gasps. It had indeed been an awful strain on him, and had he not been forced to his task by more than human considerations, he could never have gone through with it. 
For a few minutes we were so taken up with him that we did not look towards the coffin. When we did, however, a murmur of startled surprise ran from one to the other of us. We gazed so eagerly that Arthur rose, for he had been seated on the ground, and came and looked too. And then a glad, strange light broke over his face and dispelled altogether the gloom of horror that lay upon it. There, in the coffin, lay no longer the foul thing that we had so dreaded and grown to hate, that the work of her destruction was yielded as a privilege to the one best entitled to it. But Lucy, as we had seen her in her life, with a face unequalled sweetness and purity, true that there were there, as we had seen them in life, the traces of care and pain and waste. But these were all dear to us, they marked her truth to what we knew. One and all we felt that the holy calm that lay like sunshine over the wasted face and form was only an earthly token and a symbol of the calm that was to reign for ever. Van Helsing came and laid his hand on Arthur's shoulder and said to him, And now, Arthur, my friend, dear lad, am I not forgiven? The reaction of the terrible strain came as he took the old man's hand and his and raising it to his lips pressed it and said, Forgiven! God bless you that you have given my dear one her soul again and me peace. He put his hands on the professor's shoulder and laying his head on his breast, cried for a while silently whilst we stood unmoving. When he raised his head, Van Helsing said to him, And now, my child, you may kiss her. Kiss her dead lips if you will, as she would have you to, if for her to choose. For it is not a grinning devil now, not any more a foul thing for all eternity. No longer is she the devil's undead. She is God's true dead, whose soul is with him. Arthur bent and kissed her, and then we sent him and Quincy out of the tomb, and the professor and I sawed off the top of the stick, leaving the point of it in the body. Then we cut off the head and filled the mouth with garlic. We soldered up the lid and coffin, screwed on the coffin lid, and gathering up our belongings, came away. When the professor locked the door, he gave the key to Arthur. Outside, the air was sweet, the sun shone and the birds sang, and it seemed as if all nature were tuned to a different pitch. There was a gladness and mirth and peace everywhere, for we were at rest ourselves on one account, and we were glad, though it was with a tempered joy. Before we moved away, Van Helsing said, Now, my friends, one step of our work is done, one the most harrowing to ourselves, but there remains a greater task. To find out the author of all this our sorrow, and to stamp him out. I have clues which we can follow, but it is a long task and a difficult, and there is danger in it, and pain. Shall you not all help me? We have learned to believe, all of us, is it not so? And since so, do we not see our duty? Yes, and do we not promise to go on to the bitter end? Each in turn we took his hand, and the promise was made. Then said the professor as we moved off, Two nights hence you shall meet with me and dine together at seven of the clock with friend John. I shall entreat two others, two that you know not as yet, and I shall be ready to all our work show and our plans unfold. Friend John, you come with me home, for I have much to consult about, and you can help me. Tonight I leave for Amsterdam, but shall return tomorrow night, and then begins our great quest. But first I shall have much to say, so that you may know what is to do and to dread. Then our promise shall be made to each other anew, for there is a terrible task before us, and once our feet are on the ploughshare, we must not draw back. End of chapter 16 Recording by Corinne LePage Chapter 17 of Dracula by Bram Stoker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Corinne LePage. Chapter 17 Dr. Seward's Diary Continued. When we arrived at the Berkeley Hotel, Van Helsing found a telegram waiting for him. I'm coming up by train, Jonathan at Whitby. Important news, Mina Harker. The professor was delighted. Ah, oh, that wonderful Madame Mina! he said, pearl among women. She arrive, but I cannot stay. She must go to your house, friend John. You must meet her at the station. Telegraph her en route so that she may be prepared. When the wire was dispatched, he had a cup of tea, 
Over it, he told me of a diary kept by Jonathan Harker when abroad, and gave me a typewritten copy of it. As also Mrs. Harker's diary at Whitby. Take these, he said, and study them well. When I have returned, you will be master of all the facts, and we can then better enter our inquisition. Keep them safe, for there is in them much of treasure. You will need all your faith, even you who have had such an experience as that of today. What here is told, he laid his hand heavily and gravely on the packet of papers as he spoke, may be the beginning of the end to you and me and many another, or it may sound like the knell of the undead who walk the earth. Read all, I pray you, with the open mind, and if you can add in any way to the story here told, do so, for it is all important. You have kept diary of all these things so strange, is it not so? Yes, then we shall go through all these together when we meet. He then made ready for his departure and shortly after drove off to Liverpool Street. I took my way to Paddington, where I arrived about fifteen minutes before the train came in. The crowd melted away after the bustling fashion common to arrival platforms, and I was beginning to feel uneasy, lest I might miss my guest, when a sweet-faced, dainty-looking girl stepped up to me and, after a quick glance, said, Dr. Seward, is it not? And you are Miss Harker, I answered at once, whereupon she held out her hand. I knew you from the description of poor dear Lucy, but... She stopped suddenly, and a quick blush overspread her face. The blush that rose to my own cheeks somehow set us both at ease, for it was a tacit answer to her own. I got her luggage, which included a typewriter, and we took the underground to Fenchurch Street after I had sent a wire to my housekeeper to have a sitting room and a bedroom prepared at once for Mrs. Harker. In due time, we arrived. She knew, of course, that the place was a lunatic asylum, but I could see that she was unable to repress a shudder when we entered. She told me that, if she might, she would come presently to my study, as she had much to say. So here I am, finishing my entry in my phonograph diary whilst I wait her. As yet I have not had the chance of looking at the papers which Van Helsing left with me, though they lie open before me. I must get her interested in something so I may have an opportunity of reading them. She does not know how precious time is or what a task we have in hand. I must be careful not to frighten her. Here she is. Mina Harker's Journal 29 September After I had tidied myself, I went down to Dr. Seward's study. At the door, I paused a moment, for I thought I heard him talking with someone. As, however, he had pressed me to be quick, I knocked at the door, and on his calling out, come in, I entered. To my intense surprise, there was no one with him. He was quite alone, and on the table opposite him was what I knew at once from the description to be a phonograph. I had never seen one, and was much interested. I hope I did not keep you waiting, I said, but I stayed at the door as I heard you talking and thought there was someone with you. Oh, he replied with a smile, I was only entering my diary. Your diary? I asked him in surprise. Yes, he answered, I keep it in this. As he spoke, he laid a hand on the phonograph. I felt quite excited over it and blurted out, Why, this beats even shorthand. May I hear it say something? Certainly, he replied with alacrity and stood up to put it in train for speaking. Then he paused, and a troubled look overspread his face. The fact is, he began awkwardly, I only keep my diary in it, and as it is entirely, almost entirely, about my cases, it may be awkward, that is, I mean... He stopped, and I tried to help him out of his embarrassment. You helped to attend dear Lucy at the end. Let me hear how she died. For all that I know of her, I shall be very grateful. She was very, very dear to me. To my surprise, he answered with a horror-struck look on his face. Tell you of her death, not for the wide world. Why not? I asked, for some grave, terrible feeling was coming over me. Again he paused, and I could see that he was trying to invent an excuse. At length he stammered out. You see, I do not know how to pick out any particular part of the diary. Even while he was speaking, an idea dawned upon him, and he said with unconscious simplicity, in a different voice, and with the naivety of a child, that's quite true upon my honour, honest Indian. I could not but smile, at which he grimaced. I gave myself away that time, he said. But do you know that, although I have kept the diary for months past, it never once struck me how I was going to find any particular part of it in case I wanted to look it up. By this time my mind was made up that the diary of a doctor who attended Lucy might have something to add to the sum of our knowledge about that terrible being, and I said boldly, Then, Dr. Seward, you had better let me copy it out for you on my typewriter. He grew to a positively deathly pallor, as he said, No, 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 not for all the world. I wouldn't let you know that terrible story. 
and it was terrible. My intuition was right. For a moment I thought, and as my eyes ranged the room unconsciously looking for something or some opportunity to aid me, they lit on a great batch of typewriting on the table. His eyes caught the look in mine, and, without his thinking, followed their direction. As they saw the parcel, he realized my meaning. "'You do not know me,' I said. "'When you have read those papers, my own diary and my husband's also, which I have typed, you will know me better. I had not faltered in giving every thought of my own heart in this case, but, of course, you do not know me, and I must not expect you to trust me so far. He is certainly a man of noble nature. Poor dear Lucy was right about him.' He stood up and opened a large drawer, in which were arranged in order a number of hollow cylinders of metal covered with dock wax, and said, You are quite right. I did not trust you because I did not know you, but I know you now, and let me say, that I should have known you long ago. I know that Lucy told you of me. She told me of you too. May I make the only atonement in my power? Take the cylinders and hear them. The first half dozen of them are personal to me, and they will not horrify you. Then you will know me better. Dinner will by then be ready. In the meantime, I shall read over some of these documents, and shall be better able to understand certain things. He carried the phonograph himself up to my sitting room and adjusted it for me. Now I shall learn something pleasant, I am sure, for it will tell me the other side of a true love episode which I know one side already. Dr. Seward's Diary 29 September I was so absorbed in that wonderful diary of Jonathan Harker and that other of his wife that I let time run on without thinking. Mrs. Harker was not down when the maid came to announce dinner, so I said, She is possibly tired. Let dinner wait an hour. And I went on with my work. I had just finished Mrs. Harker's diary when she came in. She looked sweetly pretty, but very sad, and her eyes were flushed with crying. This somehow moved me much. Of late I have had cause for tears, God knows. But the relief of them was denied me, and now the sight of those sweet eyes, brightened with recent tears, went straight to my heart. So I said as gently as I could, I greatly fear I have distressed you. Oh no, not distressed me, she replied, but I have been more touched than I can say by your grief. That is a wonderful machine, but it is cruelly true. It told me in its very tones the anguish of your heart. It was like a soul crying out to Almighty God. No one must hear them spoken ever again. See, I have tried to be useful. I have copied out the words on my typewriter, and none other need now hear your heart beat as I did. No one need ever know, shall ever know. I said in a low voice. She laid her hand on mine and said very gravely, Ah, but they must. Must? But why? I asked. Because it is a part of the terrible story. A part of poor dear Lucy's death and all that led to it. Because in the struggle which we have before us to rid the earth of this terrible monster, we must have all the knowledge and all the help which we can get. I think that the cylinders which you gave me contained more than you intended me to know, but I can see that there are in your record many lights to this dark mystery. You will let me help, will you not? I know all up to a certain point, and I see already, though your diary only took me to 7 September, how poor Lucy was beset, and how her terrible doom was being wrought out. Jonathan and I have been working day and night since Professor Van Helsing saw us. He has gone to Whitby to get more information, and he will be here tomorrow to help us. We need have no secrets amongst us. Working together and with absolute trust, we can surely be stronger than if some of us were in the dark. She looked at me so appealingly, and at the same time manifested such courage and resolution in her bearing, that I gave in at once to her wishes. You shall, I said, do as you like in the manner. God forgive me if I do wrong, there are terrible things yet to learn of. But if you have so far travelled on the road to poor Lucy's death, you will not be content, I know, to remain in the dark. Nay, the end, the very end, may give you a gleam of peace. Come, there is dinner. We must keep one another strong for what is before us. We have a cruel and dreadful task. When you have eaten, you shall learn the rest, and I shall answer any question you ask. If there be anything which you do not understand, though it was apparent to us who were present. Mina Harker's Journal 29 September After dinner, I came with Dr. Seward to his study. He brought back the phonograph from my room, and I took my typewriter. He placed me in a comfortable chair, and arranged the phonograph so that I could touch it without getting up, and showed me how to stop it in case I wanted to pause. Then he very thoughtfully took a chair, with his back to me, so that I might be as free as possible, and began to read. I put the forked metal to my ears and listened. When the terrible story of Lucy's death and, and all that followed, was done, I lay back in my chair, powerless. Fortunately, I am not of a fainting disposition. 
When Dr. Seward saw me, he jumped up with a horrified exclamation and hurriedly, taking a case bottle from a cupboard, gave me some brandy, which in a few minutes somewhat restored me. My brain was all in a whirl, and only that there came through all the multitude of horrors, the holy ray of light that my dear, dear Lucy was at last at peace. I do not think I could have borne it without making a scene. It is also wild and mysterious and strange that if I had not known Jonathan's experience in Transylvania, I could not have believed. As it was, I didn't know what to believe, and so got out of my difficulty by attending to something else. I took the cover off my typewriter and said to Dr. Seward, Let me write this all out now. We must be ready for Dr. Van Helsing when he arrives. I have sent a telegram to Jonathan to come on here when he arrives in London from Whitby. In this matter, dates are everything, and I think that if we got all our material ready, and have every item put in chronological order, we shall have done much. You tell me that Lord Godalming and Mr. Morris are coming too. Let us be able to tell him when they come. He accordingly set out the phonograph at a slow pace, and I began to typewrite from the beginning of the seventh cylinder. I used manifold and so took three copies of the diary, just as I had done with all the rest. It was late when I got through, but Dr. Seward went about his work of going his round of the patients. When he had finished, he came back and sat near me, reading, so that I did not feel too lonely whilst I worked. How good and thoughtful he is. The world seems to be full of good men, even if there are monsters in it. Before I left him, I remembered what Jonathan put in his diary of the professor's perturbation at reading something in an evening paper at the station in Exeter. So, seeing that Dr. Seward kept his newspapers, I borrowed the files of the Westminster Gazette and the Pall Mall Gazette and took them to my room. I remember how much the Daily Graph and the Whitby Gazette, of which I had made cuttings, helped us to understand the terrible events at Whitby when Count Dracula landed. So I shall look through the evening paper since then, and perhaps I shall get some new light. I am not sleepy, and the work will help me to keep quiet. Dr. Seward's Diary 30 September Mr. Harker arrived at nine o'clock. He had got his wife's wire just before starting. He is uncommonly clever, if one can judge from his face and full of energy. If this journal be true, and, judging by one's own wonderful experiences, it must be, he is also a man of great nerve. That going down to the vault a second time was a remarkable piece of daring. After reading his account of it, I was prepared to meet a good specimen of manhood, but hardly the quiet, business-like gentleman who came here today. Later. After lunch, Harker and his wife went back to their own room, and as I passed a while ago, I heard the click of the typewriter. They are hard at it. Mrs. Harker says they are knitting together in chronological order every scrap of evidence they have. Harker has got the letters between the consignee of the boxes at Whitby and the carriers in London who took charge of them. He is now writing his wife's typescript of my diary. I wonder what they make out of it. Here it is. Strange that it never struck me that the very next house might be the Count's hiding place. Goodness knows that we have had enough clues from the conduct of the patient Renfield. The bundle of letters relating to the purchase of the house were with the typescript. Oh, if we had only had them earlier, we might have saved poor Lucy. Stop. That way madness lies. Harker has gone back and is again collating his material. He says that by dinner time they will be able to show the whole connected narrative. He thinks that in the meantime I should see Renfield, as hitherto he has been a sort of index to the coming and going of the Count. I hardly see this yet but when I get at the dates, I suppose I shall. What a good thing that Mrs. Harker put my cylinders into type. We could never have found the dates otherwise. I found Renfield sitting placidly in his room with his hands folded, smiling benignly. At the moment, he seemed as sane as anyone I ever saw. I sat down and talked with him on a lot of subjects, all of which he treated naturally. He then, of his own accord, spoke of going home, a subject he has never mentioned, to my knowledge, during his sojourn here. In fact, he spoke quite confidently of getting his discharge at once. I believe that, had I not had the chat with Harker and read the letters and the dates of his outburst, I should have been prepared to sign for him after a brief time of observation. As it is, I am darkly suspicious. All these outbreaks were in some way linked with proximity of the Count. What then does this absolute content mean? Can it be that his instinct is satisfied as to the vampire's ultimate triumph? Stay. He is himself zoophagous and in his wild ravings outside the chapel door of the deserted house he always spoke of master. This all seems confirmation of our idea. However, after a while I came away, my friend is just a little too sane at present to make it safe to probe him too deep with questions. He might begin to think, and then... So I came away. I mistrust these quiet moods of his. 
so I have given the attendant a hint to look closely after him, and to have a straight waistcoat ready in case of need. Jonathan Harker's Journal 29 September, in train to London. When I received Mr. Billington's courteous message that he would give me any information in his power, I thought it best to go down to Whitby and make, on the spot, such inquiries as I wanted. It was now my object to trace that horrid cargo of the Count's to its place in London. Later, we may be able to deal with it. Billington Jr., a nice lad, met me at the station and brought me to his father's house, where they had decided that I must stay the night. They are hospitable, with true Yorkshire hospitality. Give a guest everything and leave him free to do as he likes. They all knew that I was busy and that my stay was short, and Mr. Billington had read in his office all the papers concerning the consignment of boxes. It gave me almost a turn to see again one of the letters which I had seen on the Count's table before I knew of his diabolical plans. Everything had been carefully thought out, and done systematically and with precision. He seemed to have been prepared for every obstacle which might be placed by accident in the way of his intentions being carried out. To use an Americanism, he had taken no chances, and the absolute accuracy with which his instructions were fulfilled was simply the logical result of his care. I saw the invoice and took note of it. Fifty cases of common earth to be used for experimental purposes. Also, the copy of a letter to Carter Peterson, and their reply, of both these I got copies. This was all the information Mr. Billington could give me, so I went down to the port and saw the coast guards, the customs officers and the harbour master. They had all something to say of the strange entry of the ship, which is already taking its place in local tradition. But no one could add to the simple description, fifty cases of common earth. I then saw the station master who kindly put me in communication with the men who had actually received the boxes. The tally was exact with the list, and they had nothing to add except that the boxes were main and mortal heavy, and that shifting them was dry work. One of them added that it was hard lines that there wasn't any gentleman, such as yourself, squire, to show some sort of appreciation of the efforts in a liquid form. Another put in a rider that the thirst then generated was such that even the time which had elapsed had not completely allayed it. Needless to add, I took care before leaving to lift, forever and adequately, this source of reproach. 30 September The station master was good enough to give me a line to his old companion the station master at King's Cross, so that, when I arrived there in the morning, I was able to ask him about the arrival of the boxes. He, too, put me at once in communication with the proper officials, and I saw that the tally was correct with the original invoice. The opportunities of acquiring an abnormal thirst had here been limited. A noble use of them had, however, been made, and again, I was compelled to deal with the result in an ex post facto manner. From thence, I went on to Carter Patterson's central office, where I met with the utmost courtesy. They looked up the transaction in the day book and letter book, and at once telephoned to their King's Cross office for more details. By good fortune, the men who did the teaming were waiting for work, and the official at once sent them over. Sending also by one of them the way bill and all the papers connected with the delivery of the boxes at Carfax. Here again I found the tally agreeing exactly the carrier's men were able to supplement the paucity of the written words with few details. These were, I shortly found, connected almost solely with the dusty nature of the job, and of the consequent thirst engendered in the operators. On my affording an opportunity, through the medium of the currency of the realm, of the allaying, at a later period, this beneficial evil, one of the men remarked, That here house, governor, is the roomiest I ever was in. Blime me, but it ain't been touched since a hundred years. There was just that tick in the place that you might have slept on it without hurting out your bones, and the place was that neglected that you might have smelled old Jerusalem in it. But the old chapel, that took the kike, that did. Me my may, we thought we wouldn't ever get out quick enough, lor. I wouldn't take less nor quit a moment to stay there after dark. Having been in the house, I could well believe him. But if he knew what I know, he would, I think, have raised his terms. Of one thing I am now satisfied, that all the boxes which arrived at Whitby from Barna in the Demeter were safely deposited in the old chapel at Carfax. There should be fifty of them there, unless any have since been removed, as from Dr. Seward's diary, I fear. I shall try to see the carter who took away the boxes from Carfax when Renfield attacked them. By following up this clue, we may learn a good deal. Later. Mina and I have worked all day, and we have put all the papers into order. Mina Harker's Journal 30 September I am so glad that I hardly know how to contain myself. 
It is, I suppose, the reaction from the haunting fear which I've had, that this terrible affair and the reopening of his old wounds might act detrimentally on Jonathan. I suddenly for Whitby with as brave a face as I could, but I was sick with apprehension. The effort has, however, done him good. He was never so resolute, never so strong, never so full of volcanic energy as at present. It is just as that dear, good Professor Van Helsing said. He is true grit, and he improves under strain that would kill a weaker nature. He came back full of life and hope and determination. We have got everything in order for tonight. I feel myself quite wild with excitement. I suppose one ought to pity anything so hunted as the Count. That is just it. This thing is not human, not even beast. To read Dr. Seward's account of poor Lucy's death and what followed is enough to dry up the springs of pity in one's heart. Later, Lord Godalming and Mr. Morris arrived earlier than we expected. Dr. Seward was out on business and had taken Jonathan with him, so I had to see them. It was to me a painful meeting, for it brought back all poor dear Lucy's hopes of only a few months ago. Of course, they had heard Lucy speak of me, and it seemed that Dr. Van Helsing, too, has been quite blowing my trumpet, as Mr. Morris expressed it. Poor fellows, neither of them is aware that I know all about the proposals they made to Lucy. They did not quite know what to say or do, as they were ignorant of the amount of my knowledge, so they had to keep on neutral subjects. However, I thought the matter over and came to the conclusion that the best thing I could do would be to post them in affairs right up to date. I knew from Dr. Seward's diary that they had been at Lucy's death, her real death, and that I need not fear to betray any secret before the time. So I told them, as well as I could, that I had read all the papers and diaries, and that my husband and I, having typewritten them, had just finished putting them in order. I gave them each a copy to read in the library. When Lord Godalming got his and turned it over, it does make a pretty good pile, he said. Did you write all this, Mrs. Harker? I nodded, and he went on. I don't quite see the drift of it, but you people are all so good and kind, and have been working so earnestly and so energetically that all I can do is to accept your ideas blindfold and try to help you. I have had one lesson already in accepting facts that should make a man humble to the last hour of his life. Besides, I know you love my poor Lucy. Here he turned away and covered his face with his hands. I could hear the tears in his voice. Mr. Morris, with instinctive delicacy, just laid a hand for a moment on his shoulder and then walked quietly out of the room. I suppose there is something in women's nature that makes a man free to break down before her and express his feelings on the tender or emotional side without feeling it derogatory to his manhood. For when Lord Godalming found himself alone with me, he sat down on the sofa and gave way utterly and openly. I sat down beside him and took his hand. I hope he didn't think it forward of me, and that if he ever thinks of it afterwards, he will never have such a thought. There I wrong him. I know he never will. He is too true a gentleman. I said to him, for I could see that his heart was breaking. I loved dear Lucy, and I know what she was to you, and what you were to her. She and I were like sisters, and now she is gone. Will you not let me be like a sister to you in your trouble? I know what sorrows you have had, though I cannot measure the depth of them. If sympathy and pity can help in your affliction, won't you let me be of some little service? For Lucy's sake. In an instant, the poor dear fellow was overwhelmed with grief. It seemed to me that all that he had had of late been suffering in silence found a vent at once. He grew quite hysterical, and raising his open hands, beat his palms together in a perfect agony of grief. He stood up and then sat down again, and the tears rained down his cheeks. I felt an infinite pity for him, and opened my arms unthinkingly. With a sob he laid his head on my shoulder and cried like a weary child, whilst he shook with emotion. We women have something of the mother in us that makes us rise above smaller matters when the mother spirit is invoked. I felt this big sorrowing man's head resting on me, as though it were that of the baby that some day may lie on my bosom, and I stroked his hair as though he were my own child. I never thought at the time how strange it all was. After a little bit his sobs ceased, and he raised himself with an apology, though he made no disguise of his emotion. He told me that for days and nights past, weary days and sleepless nights, he had been unable to speak with anyone, as a man must speak in his time of sorrow. There was no woman whose sympathy could be given to him, or with whom, owing to the terrible circumstances with which his sorrow was surrounded, he could speak freely. I know now how I suffered, 
he said as he dried his eyes, but I do not know even yet, and none other can ever know, how much your sweet sympathy has been to me today. I shall know better in time, and believe me that, though I am not ungrateful now, my gratitude will grow with my understanding. You will let me be like a brother, will you not, for all our lives, for dear Lucy's sake? For dear Lucy's sake, I said as we clasped hands. I and for your own sake, he added. For if a man's esteem and gratitude are ever worth the winning, you have won mine today. If ever the future shall bring to you a time when you need a man's help, believe me, you will not call in vain. God grant that no such time may ever come to you to break the sunshine of your life, but if it should ever come, promise me that you will let me know. He was so earnest, and his sorrow was so fresh that I felt it would comfort him, so I said, I promise. As I came along the corridor, I saw Mr. Morris looking out of a window. He turned as he heard my footsteps. How's art? he said. Then noticing my red eyes, he went on. Ah, I see you have been comforting him. Poor old fellow, he needs it. No one but a woman can help a man when he's in trouble of the heart. And he had no one comfort him. He bore his own trouble so bravely that my heart bled for him. I saw the manuscript in his hand, and I knew that when he read it, he would realize how much I knew. So I said to him, I wish I could comfort all who suffer from the heart. Will you let me be your friend? And will you come to me for comfort if you need it? You will know later on why I speak. He saw that I was in earnest, and stooping took my hand, and raising it to his lips, kissed it. It seemed but poor comfort to so brave and unselfish a soul, and impulsively I bent over and kissed him. The tears rose in his eyes, and there was a momentary choking in his throat. He said quite calmly, Little girl, you will never regret that true-hearted kindness so long as ever you live. Then he went into the study to his friend. Little girl, the very words he had used to Lucy, and, oh, but he proved himself a friend. End of chapter 17 Recording by Corinne LePage Chapter 18 of Dracula by Bram Stoker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Corinne LePage. Chapter 18 Dr. Seward's Diary. 30 September. I got home at five o'clock and found that Godalming and Morris had not only arrived, but had already studied the transcripts of the various diaries and letters which Harker and his wonderful wife had made and arranged. Harker had not yet returned from his visit to the carrier's men of whom Dr. Hennessy had written to me. Mrs. Harker gave us a cup of tea, and I can honestly say that, for the first time since I've lived in it, this old house seemed like home. When we had finished, Mrs. Harker said, Dr. Seward, may I ask a favour? I want to see a patient, Mr. Renfield. Do let me see him. What you have said of him in your diary interests me so much. She looked so appealing and so pretty that I could not refuse her, and there was no possible reason why I should, so I took her with me. When I went into the room, I told the man that a lady would like to see him, to which he simply answered, Why? She's going through the house and wants to see everyone in it, I answered. Oh, very well, he said. Let her come in, by all means, but just wait a minute till I tidy up the place. His method of tidying was peculiar. He simply swallowed all the flies and spiders in the boxes before I could stop him. It was quite evident that he feared, or was jealous of, some interference. When he had got through his disgusting task, he said cheerfully, let the lady come in, and sat down on the edge of his bed with his head down, but with his eyelids raised so that he could see her as she entered. For a moment I thought that he might have some homicidal intent. I remembered how quiet he had been just before he attacked me in my own study, and I took care to stand where I could seize him at once if he attempted to make a spring at her. She came into the room with an easy gracefulness which would at once command the respect of any lunatic, for easiness is one of the qualities mad people most respect. She walked over to him, smiling pleasantly, and held out her hand. "'Good evening, Mr. Renfield,' said she. "'You see, I know you, for Dr. Seward has told me of you.' He made no immediate reply, but eyed her all over intently with a set frown on his face. This look gave way to one of wonder, which merged into doubt. Then, to my intense astonishment, he said, "'You're not the girl the doctor wanted to marry, are you? 
You can't be, you know, for she's dead. Mrs. Harker smiled sweetly as she replied, Oh no, I have a husband of my own to whom I was married before I ever saw Dr. Seward, or he me. I am Mrs. Harker. Then what are you doing here? My husband and I are staying on a visit with Dr. Seward. Then don't stay. But why not? I felt that this style of conversation might not be pleasant to Mrs. Harker any more than it was to me, so I joined in. How did you know I wanted to marry anyone? His reply was simply contemptuous, given in a pause in which he turned his eyes from Mrs. Harker to me, instantly turning them back again. What an asinine question! I don't see that at all, Mr. Enfield, said Mrs. Harker, at once championing me. He replied to her with as much courtesy and respect as he had shown contempt to me. You will, of course, understand, Mrs. Harker, that when a man is so loved and honoured as our host is, everything regarding him is of interest in our little community. Dr. Seward is loved not only by his household and his friends, but even by his patients, who, being some of them hardly in mental equilibrium, are apt to distort causes and effects. Since I myself have been an inmate of a lunatic asylum, I cannot but notice that the sophistic tendencies of some of its inmates leaned towards the airs of non causa and ignoratio lenti. I positively opened my eyes at this new development. Here was my own pet lunatic, the most pronounced of his type that I had ever met with, talking elemental philosophy and with the manner of a polished gentleman. I wonder if it was Mrs. Harker's presence which had touched some chord in his memory. If this new face was spontaneous, or in any way due to her unconscious influence, she must have some rare gift or power. We continued to talk for some time, and, seeing that he was seemingly quite reasonable, she ventured, looking at me questioningly, as she began, to lead him to his favourite topic. I was again astonished, for he addressed himself to the question with the impartiality of the completest sanity. He even took himself as an example when he mentioned certain things. Why, I myself am an instance of a man who had a strange belief. Indeed, it was no wonder that my friends were alarmed and insisted on my being put under control. I used to fancy that life was a positive and perpetual entity, and that, by consuming a multitude of live things, no matter how low in the scale of creation, one might indefinitely prolong life. At times I held the belief so strongly that I actually tried to take human life. The doctor here will bear me out that on one occasion I tried to kill him for the purpose of strengthening my vital powers by the assimilation with my own body of his life through the medium of his blood. By the assimilation with my own body of his life through the medium of his blood, relying, of course, upon the scriptural phrase, for the blood is the life, though indeed the vendor of a certain nostrum has vulgarized the truism to the very point of contempt. Isn't that true, doctor? I nodded assent, for I was so amazed that I hardly knew what to either think or say. It was hard to imagine that I had seen him eat up all his spiders and flies not five minutes before. Looking at my watch, I saw that I should go to the station to meet Van Helsing, so I told Mrs. Harker that it was time to leave. She came at once after saying pleasantly to Mr. Enfield, Goodbye, and I hope I may see you often, under auspices pleasanter to yourself. To which, to my astonishment, he replied, Goodbye, my dear. I pray God I may never see your sweet face again. May he bless and keep you. When I went to the station to meet Van Helsing, I left the boys behind me. Poor Ard seemed more cheerful than he has been since Lucy first took ill, and Quincy is more like his own bright self than he has been for many a long day. Van Helsing stepped from the carriage with the eager nimbleness of a boy. He saw me at once and rushed up to me, saying, Ah, friend John, how goes all? Well, so I have been busy, for I come here to stay if need be. All affairs are settled with me, and I have much to tell. Madamina is with you? Yes, and her so fine husband? And Arthur and my friend Quincy, they are with you too? Good. As I drove to the house, I told him of what had passed, and of how my own diary had come to be of some use through Mrs. Hawker's suggestion, at which the professor interrupted me. Ah, that wonderful Madame Mina! She has a man's brain, a brain that a man should have were he much gifted, and a woman's heart. The good God fashioned her for a purpose, believe me, when he made that so good combination. Friend John, up to now, fortune has made that woman of help to us. After tonight, she must not have to do with this so terrible affair. It is not good that she run a risk so great. We men are determined, nay, are we not pledged, to destroy this monster. But it is no part for a woman. Even if she be not harmed, her heart may fail her in so much and so many horrors, and hereafter she may suffer both in waking from her nerves and in sleep 
from her dreams. And, besides, she is a young woman and not so long married. There may be other things to think of some time, if not now. You tell me she has wrote all, then she must consult with us. But tomorrow, she say goodbye to this work, and we go alone. I agreed heartily with him, and then I told him what we had found in his absence, that the house which Dracula had bought was the very next one to my own. He was amazed, and a great concern seemed to come on him. Oh, that we had known it before, he said, for then we might have reached him in time to save poor Lucy. However, the milk that is spilt cries not out afterwards, as you say. We shall not think of that, but go on our way to the end. Then he fell into a silence that lasted till we entered my own gateway. Before we went to prepare for dinner, he said to Mrs. Harker, I am told, Madame Mina, by my friend John, that you and your husband have put up in exact order all things that have been up to this moment. Not up to this moment, Professor, she said impulsively, but up to this morning. But why not up to now? We have seen hitherto how good, light, all the little things have made. We have told our secrets, and yet no one who has told it is the worse for it. Mrs. Harker began to blush, and taking a paper from her pockets, she said, Dr. Van Helsing, will you read this and tell me if it must go in? It is my record of today. I too have seen the need of putting down at present everything, however trivial. But there is little in this except what is personal. Must it go in? The professor read it over gravely and handed it back, saying, it need not go in if you do not wish it, but I pray that it may. It can but make your husband love you the more and all of us, your friends, more honour you, as well as more esteem and love. She took it back with another blush and a bright smile. And so now, up to this very hour, all the records we have are complete and in order. The professor took away one copy to study after dinner, and before our meeting, which is fixed for nine o'clock, the rest of us have already read everything. So when we meet in study, we shall all be informed as to facts, and can arrange our plan of battle with this terrible and mysterious enemy. Mina Harker's Journal 30 September When we met in Dr. Seward's study two hours after dinner, which had been at six o'clock, we unconsciously formed a sort of border committee. Professor Van Helsing took the head of the table, to which Dr. Seward motioned him as he came into the room. He made me sit next to him on his right and asked me to act as secretary, Jonathan sat next to me. Opposite us were Lord Godalming, Dr. Seward, and Mr. Morris, Lord Godalming being next to the professor, and Dr. Seward in the centre. The professor said, I may, I suppose, take it that we are all acquainted with the facts that are in these papers. We all expressed assent, and he went on. Then it were, I think, good that I tell you something of the kind of enemy with which we have to deal. I shall then make it known to you something of the history of this man, which has been ascertained for me. So we may then discuss how we shall act, and can take our measure accordingly. There are such beings as vampires. Some of us have evidence that they exist. Even had we not the proof of our own unhappy experience, the teachings and the records of the past give proof enough for sane peoples. I admit that, at the first, I was sceptic. Were it not that through long years I have trained myself to keep an open mind, I could not have believed until such time as that fact thunder on my ear, See, see, I prove, I prove. Alas, had I known, at the first, what I know now, nay, had I even guessed at him, one so precious life had been spared to many of us who did love her. But it is gone, and we must so work, that other poor souls perish not whilst we can save. The Nosferatu do not die like the bee when he sting once. He is only stronger, and being stronger, has yet more power to work evil. This vampire, which is amongst us, is of himself so strong in person as twenty men. He is of cunning more than mortal. For his cunning be the growth of ages. He have still the aids of necromancy, which is, as his etymology imply, the divination by the dead, and all the dead that he can come nigh to are for him at command. He is brute, and more than brute. He is devil in callous, and the heart of him is not. He can, within limitations, appear at will when, and where, and in any of the forms that are to him, he can, within his range, direct the elements, the storm, the fog, the thunder, he can command all the meaner things, the rat and the owl and the bat, the moth and the fox and the wolf. He can grow and become small, he can at times vanish and come unknown. 
How then are we to begin our strike to destroy him? How shall we find his where? And having found it, how can we destroy? My friends, this is much. It is a terrible task that we undertake, and there may be consequence to make the brave shudder. For if we fail in this fight, he must surely win. And then where end we? Life is nothings, I heed him not. But to fail here is not mere life or death. It is that we become as him, that we henceforth become foul things of the night like him, without heart or conscience, preying on the bodies and the souls of those we love best. To us for ever are the gates of heaven shut, for who shall open them to us again? We go on for all time abhorred by all, a blot on the face of God's sunshine, an arrow in the sight of him who died for man. But we are face to face with duty, and in such case must we shrink. For me, I say, no. But then I am old, and life with his sunshine, his fair places, his song of birds, his music and his love, lie far behind. You others are young. Some have seen sorrow, but there are fair days yet in store. What say you? Whilst he was speaking, Jonathan had taken my hand. I feared oh so much that the appalling nature of our danger was overcoming him when I saw his hand stretch out, but it was life to me to feel its touch, so strong, so self-reliant, so resolute. A brave man's hand can speak for itself. It does not even need a woman's love to hear its music. When the professor had done speaking, my husband looked in my eyes and I in his. There is no need for speaking between us. I answer for Mina and myself he said. Count me in, Professor, said Mr. Quincy Morris, laconically as usual. I am with you, said Lord Godalming, for Lucy's sake, if for no other reason. Dr. Seward simply nodded. The Professor stood up and, after laying his golden crucifix on the table, held out his hand on either side. I took his right hand, and Lord Godalming his left. Jonathan held my right with his left and stretched across to Mr. Morris, so as we all took hands, our solemn compact was made. I felt my heart icy cold, but it did not even occur to me to draw back. We resumed our places, and Dr. Van Helsing went on with a sort of cheerfulness which showed that the serious work had begun. It was to be taken as gravely and in as businesslike a way as any other transaction of life. Well, you know what we have to contend against, but we, too, are not without strength. We have on our side power of combination, a power denied to the vampire kind. We have sources of science, we are free to act and think, and the hours of the day and the night are ours equally. In fact, so far as our powers extend, they are unfettered, and we are free to use them. We have self-devotion in a cause and an end to achieve which is not a selfish one. These things are much. Now, let us see how far the general powers arrayed against us are restrict and how the individual cannot. In fact, let us consider the limitations of the vampire in general, and of this one in particular. All we have to go upon are traditions and superstitions. These do not at the first appear much. When the matter is one of life and death, nay, of more than either life or death, yet must we be satisfied in the first place because we have to be, no other means is at our control, and secondly, because after all, these things, tradition and superstition, are everything. Does not the belief in vampires rest for others, though not, alas, for us, on them? A year ago, which of us would have received such a possibility in the midst of our scientific, sceptical, matter-of-fact nineteenth century? We even scouted a belief that we saw justified under our very eyes. Take it, then, that the vampire and the belief in his limitations and his care rest for the moment on the same base. For let me tell you, he is known everywhere that men have been. In old Greece, in old Rome, he flourished in Germany or all over, in France, in India, even in Charno Seas, and in China, so far from us, in all ways, there even is he, and the peoples fear him at this day. We have followed the wake of the berserker Icelander, the devil begotten Hun, the Slav, the Saxon, the Magyar. So far, then, we have all we may act upon, and let me tell you, that very much of the beliefs are justified by what we have seen, what we have seen in our own so unhappy experience. The vampire live on, and cannot die by mere passing of the time. 
he can flourish when that he can fatten on the blood of the living. Even more, we have seen amongst us that he can even grow younger, that his vital faculties grow strenuous and seem as though they refresh themselves when his special pabulum is plenty. But he cannot flourish without this diet. He eat not as others. Even friend Jonathan, who lived with him for weeks, did never see him to eat, never. He throws no shadow, he make in the mirror no reflect, as again Jonathan observe. He has the strength of many on his hand. Witness again Jonathan when he shut the door against the wolves, and when he help him from the diligence too. He can transform himself to wolf, as we gather from the ship arrival in Whitby. When he tear open the dog, he can be as bat as Madame Mina saw him on the window at Whitby and as friend John saw him fly from this so near house, and as my friend Quincy saw him at the window of Miss Lucy. He can come in mist which he create, that noble ship's captain proved him of this, but, from what we know, the distance he can make of this mist is limited, and can only be round himself. He come on moonlight rays as elemental dust, as again Jonathan saw those sisters in the castle of Dracula. He become so small, we ourselves saw Miss Lucy, ere she was at peace, slip through a hairbreadth space at the tomb door. He can, when once he find his way, come out from anything or into anything, no matter how close it be bound, or even fussed up with fire, soldier you call it. He can see in the dark, no small power this, in a world which is one half shut from the light. Ah, but hear me though. He can do all these things, yet he is not free, nay, he is even more prisoner than the slave of the galley, than the madman in his cell. He cannot go where he lists. He who is not of nature has yet to obey some of nature's laws. Why, we know not. He may not enter anywhere at the first, unless there be some one of the household who bid him to come, though afterwards he can come as he please. His power ceases, as does that of all evil things at the coming of the day. Only at certain times can he have limited freedom. If he be not at the place whither he is bound, he can only change himself at noon, or at exact sunrise or sunset. These things we are told, and in this record of ours we have proof by inference. Thus, whereas he can do as he will within his limit, when he have his earth home, his coffin home, his hell home, the place unhallowed as we saw when we went to the grave of the suicide at Whitby, still, at other time, he can only change when the time come. It is said, too, that he can only pass running water at the slack or the flood of the tide. Then there are things which so afflict him that he has no power, as the garlic that we know of, and as for things sacred, as this symbol, my crucifix, that was amongst us even now when we resolve, to them he is nothing. But in their presence he takes his place far off and silent with respect. There are others, too, which I shall tell you of, lest in our speaking we may need them. The branch of wild rose on his coffin keep him, that he move not from it. A sacred bullet fired into the coffin kill him, so that he be true dead. And as for the stake through him, we know already of its peace, or the cut-off head that giveth rest. We have seen it with our own eyes. Thus, when we find the habitation of this man that was, we can confine him to his coffin and destroy him, if we obey what we know. But he is clever. I have asked my friend Arminius of Budapest University to make his record, and from all the means that are, he tell me of what he has been. He must indeed have been that Vivod Dracula, who won his name against the Turk over the great river on the very frontier of Turkeyland. If it be so, then he was no common man, for in that time, and for centuries after, he was spoken of as the cleverest and the most cunning, as well as the bravest of the sons of the land beyond the forest. That mighty brain and that iron resolution went with him to his grave, and are even now arrayed against us. The Draculas were, says Arminius, a great and noble race, though now and again were Scions, who were held by the Kovals to have had dealings with the evil one. They learned his secrets in the Skullaments. Amongst the mountains over Lake Hermannstadt, where the devil claims the tenth scholar as his due. In the records are such words as Stergoica, witch, Ordog, and Fokul, Satan and Hell. And in one manuscript, this very Dracula is spoken of as Vampire, which we all understand too well. 
there have been from the loins of this very one great man, and good women, and their graves make sacred the earth, where alone this foulness can dwell. For it is not the least of its towers, that this evil thing is rooted deep in all good, in soil barren of holy memories it cannot rest. Whilst they were talking, Mr. Morris was looking steadily at the window, and he now got up quietly and went out of the room. There was a little pause, and the professor went on. And now we must settle what we do. We have here much data, and we must proceed to lay out our campaign. We know from the inquiry of Jonathan that from the castle to Whitby came fifty boxes of earth, all of which were delivered at Carthax. We also know that at least some of these boxes have been removed. It seems to me that our first step should be to ascertain whether all the rest remain in the house beyond that wall where we look today, or whether any more have been removed. If the latter, we must trace. Here we were interrupted in a very startling way. Outside the house came the sound of a pistol shot. The glass of the window was shattered with a bullet which, ricocheting from the top of the embrasure, struck the far wall of the room. I am afraid I am at heart a coward, for I shrieked out. The men all jumped to their feet. Lord Godalming flew over to the window and threw up the sash. As he did, we heard Mr. Morris's voice without. Sorry, I fear I've alarmed you. I shall come in and tell you about it. A minute later he came in and said, It was an idiotic thing for me to do, and I ask your pardon. Mrs. Harker most sincerely. I fear I must have frightened you terribly. But the fact is that whilst the professor was talking there came a big bat and sat on the window sill. I have got such a horror of the damp brutes from recent events that I cannot stand them, and I went out to have a shot, as I have been doing of late evenings, whenever I have seen one. You used to laugh at me for it then, Arp. Did you hit it? asked Dr. Van Helsing. I don't know, I fancy not, for it flew away into the wood. Without saying any more, he took his seat, and the professor began to resume his statement. We must trace each of these boxes, and when we are ready, we must either capture or kill this monster in his lair, or we must, so to speak, sterilize the earth, so that no more he can seek safety in it. Thus, in the end, we may find him in his form of man between the hours of noon and sunset, and so engage with him when he is at his most weak. And now for you, Madame Mina, this night is the end until all be well. You are too precious to us to have such risk. When we part tonight, you no more must question. We shall tell you all in good time. We are men and are able to bear, but you must be our star and our hope, and we shall act all the more free that you are not in the danger such as we are. All the men, even Jonathan, seemed relieved, but it did not seem to me that they should brave danger and perhaps lessen their safety, strength being the best safety, through care of me. But their minds were made up, and, though it was a bitter pill for me to swallow, I could say nothing, save to accept their chivalrous care of me. Mr. Morris resumed the discussion. As there is no time to lose, I vote. We have a look at his house right now. Time is everything with him, and swift action on our part might save another victim. I own that my heart began to fail me when the time for action came so close, but I did not say anything, for I had a greater fear that if I appeared as a drag or a hindrance to their work, they might even leave me out of the councils altogether. They have now gone off to Carfax, which means to get into the house. Manlike, they have told me to go to bed and sleep, as if a woman can sleep when those she loves are in danger. I shall lie down and pretend to sleep, lest Jonathan have added anxiety about me when he returns. Dr. Seward's Diary 1 October, 4 a.m. Just as we were about to leave the house, an urgent message was brought to me from Renfield to know if I would see him at once, as he had something of the utmost importance to say to me. I told the messenger to say that I would attend to his wishes in the morning. I was busy just at the moment. The attendant added, He seems very importunate, sir. I have never seen him so eager. I don't know but what, if you don't see him soon, he will have one of his violent fits. I knew the man would not have said this without some cause, so I said, all right, I'll go now, and I asked the others to wait a few minutes for me, as I had to go and see my patient. Take me with you, friend John, said the professor. His case in your diary interested me much, and it had bearing, too, now and again, on our case. I should much like to see him, and especial, when his mind is disturbed. May I come also? asked Lord Godalming. 
Me too, said Quincy Morris. May I come, said Harker. I nodded, and we all went down the passage together. We found him in a state of considerable excitement, but far more rational in his speech and manner than I had ever seen him. There was an unusual understanding of himself, which was unlike anything I had ever met in a lunatic. And he took it for granted that his reasons would prevail with others entirely sane. We all four went into the room, but none of the others at first said anything. His request was that I would at once release him from the asylum and send him home. This he backed up with arguments regarding his complete recovery, and adduced to his own existing sanity. I appeal to your friends, he said. They will, perhaps, not mind sitting in judgment on my case. By the way, you have not introduced me. I was so much astonished that the oddness of introducing a madman in an asylum did not strike me at the moment, and, besides, there was a certain dignity in the man's manner, so much of the habit of equality that I at once made the introduction. Lord Godalming, Professor Van Helsing, Mr. Quincy Morris of Texas, Mr. Renfield. He shook hands with each of them, saying in turn, Lord Godalming, I had the honour of seconding your father at Wyndham. I grieve to know by your holding the title that he is no more. He was a man loved and honoured by all who knew him, and in his youth was, I have heard, the inventor of a bunt rum punch, much patronised on Derby night. Mr. Morris, you should be proud of your great state. Its reception into the Union was a precedent which many have far-reaching effects hereafter, when the pole and the tropics may hold alliance to the stars and stripes. The power of treaty may yet prove a vast engine of enlargement. When the Monroe Doctrine takes its true place as a political fable, what shall any man save his pleasure at meeting Van Helsing? Sir, I make no apology for dropping all forms of conventional prefix. When an individual has revolutionized therapeutics by his discovery of the continuous evolution of brain matter, conventional forms are unfitting, since they would seem to limit him to one of a class. You, gentlemen, who by nationality, by heredity, or by the possession of natural gifts, are fitted to hold your respective places in the moving world. I take to witness that I am as sane as at least the majority of men who are in full possession of their liberties. And I am sure that you, Dr. Seward, humanitarian and medical jurist as well as scientist, will deem it a moral duty to deal with me as one to be considered as under exceptional circumstances. He made this last appeal with a courtly air of conviction which was not without its own charm. I think we were all staggered, for my own part, I was under the conviction, despite my knowledge of the man's character and history, that his reason had been restored, and I felt under a strong impulse to tell him that I was satisfied as to his sanity, and would see about the necessary formalities for his release in the morning. I felt it better to wait, however, before making so grave a statement, for of old I knew the sudden changes to which this particular patient was liable. So I contented myself with making a general statement that he appeared to be improving very rapidly, that I would have a longer chat with him in the morning, and would then see what I could do in the direction of meeting his wishes. This did not at all satisfy him, for he said quickly, But I fear, Dr. Seward, that you hardly apprehend my wish. I desire to go at once, here, now, this very hour, this very moment, if I may. Time presses, and in our implied agreement with the old scytheman it is of the essence of the contract. I am sure it is only necessary to put before so admirable a practitioner as Dr. Seward so simple yet so momentous a wish to ensure its fulfilment. He looked at me keenly, and seeing the negative in my face turned to the others and scrutinized them closely. Not meeting any sufficient response, he went on. Is it possible that I have erred in my supposition? You have, I said frankly, but at the same time, as I felt, brutally. There was a considerable pause, and then he said slowly, Then I suppose I must only shift my ground of request. Let me ask for this concession, boon, privilege, what you will. I am content to implore in such a case, not on personal grounds, but for the sake of others. I'm not at liberty to give you the whole of my reasons, but you may, I assure you, take it from me that they are good ones, sound and unselfish, and spring from the highest sense of duty. Could you look, sir, into my heart, you would approve to the full the sentiments which animate me. Nay more, you would count me amongst the best and truest of your friends. Again, he looked at us all keenly. I had a growing conviction that this sudden change of his entire intellectual method was but yet another form or phase of his madness, and so determined to let him go on a little longer, knowing from experience that he would, like all lunatics, give himself away in the end. Van Helsing was gazing at him with a look of utmost intensity, 
his bushy eyebrows almost meeting with the fixed concentration of his look. He said to Renfield, in a tone which did not surprise me at the time, but only when I thought of it afterwards, for it was as of one addressing an equal, Can you not tell, frankly, your real reason for wishing to be free tonight? I will undertake that if you will satisfy even me, a stranger, without prejudice, and with the habit of keeping an opened mind, Dr. Seward will give you, at his own risk, and on his own responsibility, the privilege you seek. He shook his head sadly, and with a look of poignant regret on his face, the professor went on. Come, sir, bethink yourself. You claim the privilege of reason in the highest degree since you seek to impress us with your complete reasonableness. You do this, whose sanity we have reason to doubt, since you are not yet released from medical treatment for this very defect. If you will not help us in our efforts to choose the wisest course, how can we perform the duty which you yourself put upon us? Be wise and help us, and if we can, we shall aid you to achieve your wish. He still shook his head as he said, Dr. Van Helsing, I have nothing to say. Your argument is complete, and if I were free to speak, I should not hesitate a moment, but I am not my own master in the matter. I can only ask you to trust me. If I am refused, the responsibility does not rest with me. I thought it was now time to end the scene, which was becoming too comically grave, so I went towards the door simply saying, Come, my friends, we have work to do. Good night. As, however, I got near the door, a new change came over the patient. He moved towards me so quickly that for the moment I feared that he was about to make another homicidal attack. My fears, however, were groundless, for he held up his two hands imploringly and made his petition in a moving manner. As he saw that the very excess of his emotion was militating against him, by restoring us more to our old relations he became still more demonstrative. I glanced at Van Helsing and saw my conviction reflected in his eyes, so I became a little more fixed in my manner, if not more stern, and motioned to him that his efforts were unavailing. I had previously seen something of the same constantly growing excitement in him, when he had to make some request of which at the time he had thought much such, for instance, as when he wanted a cat, and I was prepared to see the collapse into the same sullen acquiescence on this occasion. My expectation was not realised, for, when he found that his appeal would not be successful, he got into quite a frantic condition. He threw himself on his knees and held up his hands, wringing them in plaintive supplication, and poured forth a torrent of entreaty, with the tears rolling down his cheeks and his whole face and form expressive of the deepest emotion. Let me entreat you, Dr. Seward. Oh, let me implore you to let me out of this house at once. Send me away how you will and where you will. Send keepers with me with whips and chains. Let them take me in a straight waistcoat, manacled in leg iron, even to a jail. But let me go out of this. You don't know what you do by keeping me here. I am speaking from the depths of my heart, of my very soul. You do not know whom you wrong or how, and I may not tell. Woe is me, I may not tell. By all you hold sacred, by all you hold dear, by your love that is lost, by your hope that lives, for the sake of the Almighty, take me out of this and save my soul from guilt. Can't you hear me, man? Can't you understand? Will you never learn? Don't you know that I am sane and earnest now, that I am no lunatic in a mad fit but the same man fighting for his soul? Oh, hear me! Hear me! Let me go! Let me go! Let me go! I thought that the longer this went on, the wilder he would get, and so would bring on a fit, so I took him by the hand and raised him up. Come, I said sternly, no more of this. We have had quite enough already. Get to your bed and try to behave more discreetly. He suddenly stopped and looked at me intently for several moments. Then, without a word, he rose and, moving over, sat down on the side of the bed. The collapse had come, as on former occasion, just as I had expected. When I was leaving the room, last of our party, he said to me in a quiet, well-bred voice, You will, I trust, Dr. Seward, do me the justice to bear in mind, later on, that I did what I could to convince you tonight. End of chapter 18 Recording by Corinne LePage Chapter 19 of Dracula 
by Bram Stoker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Corinne LePage. Chapter 19 Jonathan Harker's Journal 1 October, 5 a.m. I went with the party to the search with an easy mind, for I think I never saw Nina so absolutely strong and well. I am so glad that she consented to hold back and let us men do the work. However, it was a dread to me that she was in this fearful business at all. But now that her work is done, and that it is due to her energy and brains and foresight that the whole story is put together in such a way that every point tells, she may well feel that her part is finished and that she can henceforth leave the rest to us. We were, I think, all a little upset by the scene with Mr. Renfield. When we came away from his room, we were silent till we got back to the study. Then Mr. Moore said to Dr. Seward, Say, Jack, if that man was an attempt in a bluff, he is about the sanest lunatic I ever saw. I am not sure, but I believe that he had some serious purpose. And if he had, it was pretty rough on him not to get a chance. Lord Godalming and I were silent. But Dr. Van Helsing added, Friend John, you know more of lunatics than I do, and I'm glad of it, for I fear that if it had been to me to decide, I would before that last hysterical outburst have given him free. But we live and learn, and in our present task we must take no chance. As my friend Quincy would say, all is best as they are. Dr. Seward seemed to answer them both in a dreamy kind of way. I don't know but that I agree with you. If that man had been an ordinary lunatic, I would have taken my chance of trusting him. But he seems so mixed up with the Count in an indexy kind of way that I am afraid of doing anything wrong by helping his fads. I can't forget how he prayed with almost equal fervor for a cat, and then tried to tear my throat out with his teeth. Besides, he called the Count Lord and Master, and he may want to get out to help him in some diabolical way. That horrid thing has the wolves and the rats and his own kind to help him, so I suppose he isn't above trying to use a respectable lunatic. He certainly did seem earnest, though. I only hope we have done what is best. These things in conjunction with the wild work we have in hand help to unnerve a man. The professor stepped over and, laying his hand on his shoulder, said in his grave kindly way, Friend John, have no fear. We are trying to do our duty in a very sad and terrible case. We can only do as we deem best. What else have we to hope for except the pity of the good God? Lord Godalming had slipped away for a few minutes, but now he returned. He held up a little silver whistle as he remarked, That old place may be full of rats, and if so, I've got an antidote on call. Having passed the wall, we took our way to the house, taking care to keep in the shadows of the trees on the lawn when the moonlight shone out. When we got to the porch, the professor opened his bag and took out a lot of things, which he had laid on the step, sorting them into four little groups, evidently one for each. Then he spoke. My friends, we are going into a terrible danger, and we need arms of many kinds. Our enemy is not merely spiritual. Remember that he has the strength of twenty men, and that our necks or our windpipes are of the common kind, and therefore breakable or crushable. His are not amenable to mere strength. A stronger man, or a body of men more strong in all than him, can at certain times hold him, but they cannot hurt him as we can be hurt by him. We must, therefore, guard ourselves from his touch. Keep this near your heart. As he spoke, he lifted a little silver crucifix and held it out to me, I being nearest to him. Put these flowers round your neck. Here he handed to me a wreath of withered garlic blossoms. For other enemies more mundane, this revolver and this knife, and for aid in all, these so small electric lamps, which you can fasten to your breast, and for all, and above all, at last, this, which we must not desecrate needless. This was a portion of sacred wafer, which he put in an envelope and handed to me. Each of the others was similarly equipped. Now, he said, friend John, where are the skeleton keys? If so that we can open the door, we need not break house by the window, as before at Miss Lucy's. Dr. Seward tried one or two skeleton keys, his mechanical dexterity as a surgeon, standing him in good stead. Presently he got one to suit. After a little play back and forward, the bolt yielded and, with a rusty clang, shot back. We pressed on the door. The rusty hinges creaked, and it slowly opened. It was startlingly like the image conveyed to me in Dr. Seward's diary, of the opening of Miss Westerner's tomb. I fancy that the same idea seemed to strike the others, for with one accord they shrank back. 
The professor was the first to move forward and stepped into the open door. In manus tuas, Domine, he said, crossing himself as he passed over the threshold. We closed the door behind us, lest when we should have lit our lamps we should possibly attract attention from the road. The professor carefully tried the lock, lest we might not be able to open it from within should we be in a hurry, making our exit. Then we all lit our lamps and proceeded on our search. The light from the tiny lamps fell in all sorts of odd forms, as the rays crossed each other or the opacity of our bodies threw great shadows. I could not for my life get away from the feeling that there was someone else amongst us. I suppose it was the recollection so powerfully brought home to me by the grim surroundings of that terrible experience in Transylvania. I think the feeling was common to us all, for I noticed that the others kept looking over their shoulders at every sound and every new shadow, just as I felt myself doing. The whole place was thick with dust. The floor was seemingly inches deep, except where there were recent footsteps, in which, on holding down my lamp, I could see marks of hobnails where the dust was cracked. The walls were fluffy and heavy with dust, and in the corners were masses of spider's webs whereon the dust had gathered till they looked like old tattered rags, as the weight had torn them partly down. On the table in the hall was a great bunch of keys, with a time-yellowed label on each. They had been used several times, for on the table were several similar rents in the blankets of dust, similar to that exposed when the professor lifted them. He turned to me and said, You know this place, Jonathan. You have copied maps of it, and you know it at least more than we do. Which is the way to the chapel? I had an idea of its direction, though on my former visit I had not been able to get admission to it, so I led the way and after a few wrong turnings found myself opposite a low arched oaken door, ribbed with iron bands. This is the spot, said the professor as he turned his lamp on a small map of the house, copied from the file of my original correspondence regarding the purchase. With a little trouble we found the key on the bunch and opened the door. We were prepared for some unpleasantness, for as we were opening the door, a faint, malodorous air seemed to exhale through the gaps, but none of us ever expected such an odour as we encountered. None of the others had met the Count at all at close quarters, and when I had seen him he was either in the fasting stage of his existence in rooms, or, when he was gloated with fresh blood, in a ruined building open to the air, but here the place was small and close, and the long disuse had made the air stagnant and foul. There was an earthy smell, as of some dry miasma, which came through the fouler air. But as to the odour itself, how shall I describe it? It was not alone that it was composed of all the ills of mortality and with the pungent acrid smell of blood, but it seemed as though corruption had become itself corrupt. For it sickens me to think of it. Every breath exhaled by that monster seemed to have clung to the place and intensified its loathsomeness. Under ordinary circumstances such a stench would have brought our enterprise to an end, but this was no ordinary case, and the high and terrible purpose in which we were involved gave us a strength which rose above merely physical considerations. After the involuntary shrinking consequent on the first nauseous whiff, we one and all set about our work as though that loathsome place were a garden of roses. We made an accurate examination of the place, the professor saying as we began, the first thing is to see how many of the boxes are left. We must, then, examine every hole and corner and cranny and see if we cannot get some clue as to what has become of the rest. A glance was sufficient to show how many remained, for the great earth chests were bulky and there was no mistaking them. There were only twenty-nine left out of the fifty. Once I got a fright for seeing Lord Godalming suddenly turn and look out of the vaulted door into the dark passage beyond, I looked too and for an instant my heart stood still. Somewhere, looking out from the shadow, I seemed to see the highlights of the Count's evil face, the ridge of the nose, the red eyes, the red lips, the awful pallor. It was only for a moment, for, as Lord Godalming said, I thought I saw a face, but it was only the shadows, and resumed his inquiry. I turned my lamp in the direction and stepped into the passage. There was no sign of anyone, and as there were no corners, no doors, no aperture of any kind, but only the solid walls of the passage there could be no hiding place, even for him. I took it that fear had helped imagination and said nothing. A few minutes later I saw Morris step suddenly back from a corner which he was examining. We all followed his movement with our eyes, for undoubtedly some nervousness was growing on us, and we saw a whole mass of phosphorescence which twinkled like stars. We all instinctively drew back, 
the whole place was becoming alive with rats. For a moment or two we stood appalled, all save Lord Godalming, who was seemingly prepared for such an emergency, rushing over to the great iron-bound oaken door which Dr. Seward had described from the outside, and which I had seen myself. He turned the key in the lock, drew the huge bolts, and swung the door open. Then, taking his little silver whistle from his pocket, he blew a low, shrill call. It was answered from behind Dr. Seward's house by the yelping of dogs, and after about a minute, three terriers came dashing round the corner of the house. Unconsciously, we had all moved towards the door, and as we moved, I noticed that the dust had been much disturbed. The boxes which had been taken out had been brought this way. But even in the minute that had elapsed, the number of rats had vastly increased. They seemed to swarm over the place all at once, till the lamplight, shining on their moving dark bodies and glittering baleful eyes, made the place look like a bank of earth set with fireflies. The dogs dashed on, but at the threshold something stopped and snarled, and then, simultaneously lifting their noses, began to howl in a most lugubrious fashion. The rats were multiplying in thousands, and we moved out. Lord Godalming lifted one of the dogs, and carrying him in, placed him on the floor. The instant his feet touched the ground he seemed to recover his courage, and rushed at his natural enemies. They fled before him so fast that before he had shaken the life out of a score, the other dogs, who had by now been lifted in the same manner, had but small prey ere the whole mass had vanished. With their going it seemed as if some evil presence had departed, for the dogs frisked about and barked merrily as they made sudden darts at their prostrate froes, and turned them over and over and tossed them in the air with vicious shakes. We all seemed to find our spirits rise, whether it was the purifying of the deadly atmosphere by the opening of the chapel door, or the relief which we experienced by finding ourselves in the open, I know not, but most certainly the shadow of dread seemed to slip from us like a robe, and the occasion of our coming lost something of its grim significance, though we did not slacken a whit in our resolution. We closed the outer door, and barred and locked it, and bringing the dogs with us, began our search of the house. We found nothing throughout except dust in extraordinary proportions, and all untouched save for my own footsteps when I had made my first visit. Never once did the dogs exhibit any symptom of uneasiness, and even when we returned to the chapel they frisked about as though they had been rabbit hunting in a summer wood. The morning was quickening in the east when we emerged from the front. Dr. Van Helsing had taken the key of the hall door from the bunch and locked the door in orthodox fashion, putting the key into his pocket when he had done. So far, he said, our night has been eminently successful. No harm has come to us such as I feared might be, and yet we have ascertained how many boxes are missing. More than all do I rejoice that this, our first and perhaps our most difficult and dangerous, step has been accomplished without the bringing therein to our most sweet Madame Mina or troubling her waking or sleeping thoughts with sights and sounds and smells of horror which she might never forget. One lesson, too, we have learned if it be allowable to argue a particulari, that the brute beasts which are to the Count's command are yet themselves not amenable to his spiritual power. For look, these rats that would come to his call, just as from his castle top he summoned the wolves to your going, and to that poor mother's cry, though they come to him, they run pell-mell from the so little dogs of my friend Arthur. We have other matters before us, other dangers, other fears, and that monster. He has not used his power over the brute world, for the only or the last time. He has not used his power over the brute world, for the only or the last time tonight. So be it that he has gone elsewhere. Good. It has given us opportunity to cry check in some ways in this chess game, which we play for the stake of human souls. And now let us go home. The dawn is close at hand, and we have reason to be content with our first night's work. It may be ordained that we have many nights and days to follow, if full of peril, but we must go on, and from no danger shall we shrink. The house was silent when we got back, save for some poor creature who was screaming away in one of the distant wards, and a low, moaning sound from Renfield's room. The poor wretch was doubtless torturing himself after the manner of the insane, with needless thoughts of pain. I came tiptoe into our own room and found Mina asleep, breathing so softly that I had to put my ear down to hear it. She looks paler than usual. I hope the meeting tonight has not upset her. I am truly thankful that she is to be left out of our future work, and even of our deliberations. It is too great a strain for a woman to bear. I did not think so at first, but I know better now. Therefore I am glad that it is settled. There may be things which would frighten her to hear, 
and yet to conceal them from her might be worse than to tell her if once she suspected that there was any concealment. Henceforth our work is to be a sealed book to her, till at least such time we can tell her that all is finished, and the earth free from a monster of the netherworld. I dare say it will be difficult to begin to keep silence after such confidence as ours. But I must be resolute, and tomorrow I shall keep dark over tonight's doings, and shall refuse to speak of anything that has happened. I rest on the sofa so as not to disturb her. 1st October. Later. I suppose it was natural that we should have all overslept ourselves, for the day was a busy one, and the night had no rest at all. Even Mina must have felt its exhaustion, for, though I slept till the sun was high, I was awake before her, and had to call two or three times before she awoke. Indeed, she was so sound asleep that for a few seconds she did not recognize me, but looked at me with a sort of blank terror as one who has been waked out of a bad dream. She complained a little of being tired, and I let her rest till later in the day. We now know of twenty-one boxes having been removed, and if it be that several were taken in any of those removals, we may be able to trace them all. Such will, of course, immensely simplify our labour, and the sooner the matter is attended to, the better. I shall look up Thomas Snelling today. Dr. Seward's Diary 1st October It was towards noon when I was awakened by the professor walking into my room. He was more jolly and cheerful than usual, and it is quite evident that last night's work has helped to take some of the brooding weight off his mind. After going over the adventure of the night, he suddenly said, Your patient interests me much. May it be that with you I visit him this morning? Or, if that you are too occupied, I can go alone if it may be. It is a new experience to me to find a lunatic who talk philosophy and reason so sound. I had some work to do which pressed, so I told him that, if he would go alone, I would be glad, as then I should not have to keep on waiting. So I called an attendant and gave him the necessary instructions. Before the professor left the room, I cautioned him against getting any false impression from my patient. But, he answered, I want him to talk of himself and his delusion as to consuming live things. He said to Madame Mina, as I see in your diary of yesterday, that he had once such a belief. Why do you smile, friend John? Excuse me, I said, but the answer is here. I laid my hand on the typewritten matter. When our sane and learned lunatic made that very statement of how he used to consume life, his mouth was actually nauseous with the flies and spiders which he had eaten just before Mrs. Harker entered the room. Van Helsing smiled in turn. Good, he said. Your memory is true, friend John. I should have remembered. And yet, it is this very obliquity of thought and memory which makes mental disease such a fascinating study. Perhaps I may gain more knowledge out of the folly of this madman than I shall from the teaching of the most wise. Who knows? I went on with my work, and before long was through that in hand. It seemed that the time had been very short indeed, but there was Van Helsing back in the study. Do I interrupt? he asked politely as he stood at the door. Not at all, I answered. Come in. My work is finished and I am free. I can go with you now if you like. It is needless. I have seen him. Well? I fear that he does not appraise me at much. Our interview was short. When I entered his room, he was sitting on a stool in the centre with his elbows on his knees, and his face was the picture of sullen discontent. I spoke to him as cheerfully as I could, and with such a measure of respect as I could assume. He made no reply whatever. Don't you know me? I asked. His answer was not reassuring. I know you well enough. You are the old fool Van Helsing. I wish you would take yourself and your idiotic brain there is somewhere else. Damn all thick-headed Dutchmen. Not a word more would he say, but sat in his implacable sullenness as indifferent to me as though I had not been in the room at all. Thus departed for a time my chance of much learning from this so clever lunatic. So I shall go, if I may, and cheer myself with a few happy words with that sweet soul, Madame Mina. Friend John, it does rejoice me unspeakable that she is no more to be pained no more to be worried with our terrible things. Though we shall much miss her help, it is better so. I agree with you with all my heart, I answered earnestly, for I did not want him to weaken in this matter. Mrs. Harker is better out of it. Things are quite bad enough for us, all men of the world, and who have been in many tight places in our time. But it is no place for a woman, and if she had remained in touch with the affair, it would in time infallibly have wrecked her. So Van Helsing has gone to confer with Mrs. Harker and Harker, Quincy and Art are all out following up the clues as to the earth boxes. I shall finish my round of work and we shall meet tonight. Mina Harker's Journal 
1st October. It is strange to me to be kept in the dark as I am today. After Jonathan's full confidence for so many years to see him manifestly avoid certain matters, and those the most vital of all. This morning I slept late after the fatigues of yesterday, and though John was late too, he was the earlier. He spoke to me before he went out, never more sweetly or tenderly, but he never mentioned a word of what had happened in the visit to the Count's house. And yet he must have known how terribly anxious I was. Poor dear fellow, I suppose it must have distressed him even more than it did me. They all agreed that it was best that I should not be drawn further into this awful work, and I acquiesced. But to think that he keeps anything from me, and now I am crying like a silly fool when I know it comes from my husband's great love and from the good, good wishes of those other strong men. That has done me good. Well, some day Jonathan will tell me all, and lest it should ever be that he should think for a moment that I kept anything from him, I still keep my journal as usual. Then, if he has feared of my trust, I shall show it to him, with every thought of my heart put down for his dear eyes to read. I feel strangely sad and low-spirited today. I suppose it is the reaction from the terrible excitement. Last night I went to bed when the men had gone simply because they told me so. I didn't feel sleepy, and I did feel full of devouring anxiety. I kept thinking over everything that has been ever since Jonathan came to see me in London, and it all seems like a horrible tragedy, with fate pressing on relentlessly to some destined end. Everything that one does seems, no matter how right it may be, to bring on the very thing which is most to be deplored. If I hadn't gone to Whitby, perhaps poor dear Lucy would be with us now. She hadn't taken to visiting the churchyard till I came, and if she hadn't come there in the daytime with me, she wouldn't have walked there in her sleep. And if she hadn't gone there at night in the sleep, that monster couldn't have destroyed her as it did. Oh, why did I ever go to Whitby? There now, crying again. I wonder what has come over me today. I must hide it from Jonathan, for if he knew that I'd been crying twice in one morning. I, who never cried on my own account, and whom he has never caused to shed a tear, the dear fellow would fret his heart out. I shall put a bold face on, and if I do feel weepy, he shall never see it. I suppose it is one of the lessons that we poor women have to learn. I can't quite remember how I fell asleep last night. I remember hearing the sudden barking of the dogs, and a lot of queer sounds like praying on the very tumultuous scale from Mr. Renfield's room, which is somewhere under this. And then there was silence over everything. Silence so profound that it startled me, and I got up and looked out of the window. All was dark and silent, the black shadows thrown by the moonlight seeming full of a silent mystery of their own. Not a thing seemed to be stirring, but all to be grim and fixed as death or fate, so that a thin streak of white mist that crept with almost imperceptible slowness across the grass towards the house seemed to have a sentience and a vitality of its own. I think that the discretion of my thoughts must have done me good, for when I got back to bed I found a lethargy creeping over me. I lay a while, but could not quite sleep, so I got out and looked out of the window again. The mist was spreading, and was now close up to the house, so that I could see it lying thick against the wall, as though it were sealing up to the windows. The poor man was more loud than ever, and though I could not distinguish a word he said, I could in some way recognize his tone, some passionate entreaty on his part. Then there was the sound of a struggle, and I knew that the attendants were dealing with him. I was so frightened that I crept into bed and pulled the clothes over my head, putting my fingers in my ears. I was not then a bit sleepy, at least so I thought, but I must have fallen asleep, for, except my dreams, I do not remember anything until the morning, when Jonathan woke me. I think that it took me an effort and a little time to realize where I was, and that it was Jonathan who was bending over me. My dream was very peculiar, and was almost typical of the way that waking thoughts become merged in or continued in dreams. I thought that I was asleep, and waiting for Jonathan to come back. I was very anxious about him, and I was powerless to act. My feet and my hands and my brain were weighted so that nothing could proceed at the usual pace. So I slept uneasily and thought. Then it began to dawn upon me that the air was heavy and dank and cold. I put back the clothes from my face and found, to my surprise, that all was dim around. The gaslight which I had left lit for Jonathan, but turned down, came only like a tiny red spark through the fog, which had evidently grown thicker and poured into the room. Then it occurred to me that I had shut the window before I had come to bed. I would have got out to make certain on the point, but some leaden lethargy seemed to chain my limbs and even my will. I lay still and endured. That was all. I closed my eyes, but could still see through my eyelids. 
It is wonderful what tricks our dreams play on us and how conveniently we can imagine. The mist grew thicker and thicker, and I could see now how it came in, for I could see it like smoke, or with the white energy of boiling water, pouring in not through the window, but through the joinings of the door. It got thicker and thicker till it seemed as if it became concentrated into a sort of pillar of cloud in the room, through the top of which I could see the light of the gas shining like a red eye. Things began to whirl through my brain just as the cloudy column was now whirling in the room, and through it all came the scriptural words, a pillar of cloud by day and of fire by night. Was it indeed some spiritual guidance that was coming to me in my sleep? But the pillar was composed of both the day and the night guiding, for the fire was in the red eye, which at the thought got a new fascination for me, till, as I looked, the fire divided, and it seemed to shine on me through the fog like two red eyes, such as Lucy told me of in a momentary mental wandering when, on the cliff, the dying sunlight struck the windows of St. Mary's Church. Suddenly, the horror burst upon me that it was thus that Jonathan had seen those awful women growing into a reality through the woolly mist in the moonlight, and in my dream I must have fainted, for all became black darkness. The last conscious effort which imagination made was to show me a livid white face bending over me out of the mist. I must be careful of such dreams, for they would unseat one's reason if there were too much of them. I would get Dr. Van Helsing or Dr. Seward to prescribe something for me which would make me sleep, only that I feared to alarm them. Such a dream at the present time would become woven into the fears for me. Tonight I shall strive hard to sleep naturally. If I do not, I shall tomorrow night get them to give me a dose of chloral. That cannot hurt me for once, and it will give me a good night's sleep. Last night tired me more than if I had not slept at all. 2 October, 10 p.m. Last night I slept, but did not dream. I must have slept soundly, for I was not waked by Jonathan coming to bed. But the sleep has not refreshed me, for today I feel terribly weak and spiritless. I spent all yesterday trying to read or lying down dosing. In the afternoon, Mr. Renfield asked if he might see me. Poor man, he was very gentle, and when I came away, he kissed my hand and bade God bless me. Some way it affected me much. I'm crying when I think of him. This is a new weakness, of which I must be careful. Jonathan would be miserable if he knew I had been crying. He and the others were out till dinner time, and they all came in tired. I did what I could to brighten them up and I suppose that the effort did me good, for I forgot how tired I was. After dinner they sent me to bed, and all went off to smoke together, as they said, but I knew that they wanted to tell each other of what had occurred to each during the day. I could see from Jonathan's manner that he had something important to communicate. I was not so sleepy as I should have been, so before they went I asked Dr. Seward to give me a little opiate of some kind, as I had not slept well the night before. He very kindly made me up a sleeping draught, which he gave to me, telling me that it would do me no harm, as it was very mild. I have taken it, and am waiting for sleep, which still keeps aloof. I hope I have not done wrong, for as sleeps begin to flirt with me, a new fear comes, that I may have been foolish in thus depriving myself of the power of waking. I might want it. Here comes sleep. Good night. End of chapter 19 Recording by Corinne LePage Chapter 20 of Dracula by Bram Stoker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Corinne Page. Chapter 20 Jonathan Harker's Journal. 1 October, evening. I found Thomas Snelling in his house at Bethnal Green, but unhappily he was not in a condition to remember anything. The very prospect of beer, which my expected coming had opened to him, had proved too much, and he had begun too early on his expected debauch. I learned, however, from his wife, who seemed a decent poor soul, that he was only the assistant to Smollett, who, of the two mates, was the responsible person. So off I drove to Walworth, and found Mr. Joseph Smollett, at home, and in his shirt sleeves, taking a late tea out of a saucer. He is a decent, intelligent fellow, distinctly a good, reliable type of workman, with a headpiece of his own. He remembered all about the incident of the boxes, and from a wonderful dog's-eared notebook, which he produced from some mysterious receptacle about the seat of his trousers, and which had hieroglyphical entries in the thick, half-obliterated pencil, he gave me the destinations of the boxes. 
There were, he said, six in the cartload which he took from Carfax and left at 197 Chicksand Street, Mile End, Newtown, and another six which he deposited at Jamaica Lane, Bomonsi. If then the Count meant to scatter these ghastly refuges of his over London, these places were chosen as the first of delivery, so that later he might distribute more fully. The systematic manner in which this was done made me think that he could not mean to confine himself to two sides of London. He was now fixed on the far east of the northern shore, on the east of the southern shore, and on the south. The north and west were surely never meant to be left out of his diabolical scheme, let alone the city itself in the very heart of fashionable London in the southwest and west. I went back to Smollett and asked him if he could tell us if any other boxes had been taken from Carfax. He replied, Well, Governor, you've treated me very handsome. I had given him half a sovereign, and I tell you all I know, I heard a man, by the name of Bloxham, say four nights ago, in the air and ounds in Pincher's Alley, as how he and his mate had had a rare, dusty job in an old house in Perfect. There ain't a many of such jobs as this here, and I'm thinking that there may be some Bloxham could tell you some. I asked if he could tell me where to find him. I told him that if he could get me the address, it would be worth another half sovereign to him. So he gulped down the rest of his tea and stood up, saying that he was going to begin the search then and there. At the door, he stopped and said, Look here, Governor, there ain't no sense in me keeping you here. I may find Sam soon or I mayn't. But anyhow, he ain't like to be in a way to tell ye much tonight. Sam is a rare one when he starts in the booze. If you can give me an envelope with a stamp on it and put your address on it, I'll find out where Sam is to be found and post it to you tonight. But you'd better be up arter him soon in the morning. Or maybe you won't catch him. For Sam gets off main early, then wind the booze the night of four. This was all practical, so one of the children went off with a penny to buy an envelope and a sheet of paper and to keep the change. When she came back, I addressed the envelope and stamped it, and when Smollett had again faithfully promised to post the address when found, I took my way home. We're on the track anyhow. I am tired tonight, and want to sleep. Mina is fast asleep and looks a little too pale. Her eyes look as though she had been crying. Poor dear, I've no doubt it frets her to be kept in the dark, and it may make her doubly anxious about me and the others. But it is best as it is. It is better to be disappointed and worried in such a way than to have her nerve broken. The doctors were quite right to insist on her being kept out of this dreadful business. I must be firm, for on me this particular burden of silence must rest. I shall not ever enter on the subject with her under any circumstances. Indeed, it may not be a hard task after all, for she herself has become reticent on the subject and has not spoken of the Count or his doing ever since we told of our decision. 2 October, evening. A long and trying and exciting day. By the first post, I got my directed envelope with a dirty scrap of paper enclosed, on which was written with a carpenter's pencil in a sprawling hand, Sam Bloxham, Corcoran's, 4, Potter's Court, Bartle Street, Woolworth. Ask for the depite. I got the letter in bed and rose without waking Mina. She looked heavy and sleepy and pale and far from well. I determined not to wake her, but that, when I should return from this new search, I would arrange for her going back to Exeter. I think she would be happier in her own home with her daily tasks to interest her than being here amongst us and in ignorance. I only saw Dr. Seward for a moment and told him where I was off to, promising to come back and tell the rest so soon as I should have found out anything. I drove to Woolworth and found with some difficulty Potter's Court. Mr. Smollett's spelling misled me as I asked for Potter's Court instead of Potter's Court. However, when I had found the court, I had no difficulty in discovering Corcoran's lodging house. When I asked the man who came to the door for the depite, he shook his head and said, I'd know him. There ain't no such a person here. I never heard of him in all my blooming days. Don't believe there ain't nobody of that kind living here or anywheres. I took out Smollett's letter and, as I read it, seemed to me that the lesson of the spelling of the name of the court might guide me. What are you? I asked. I'm the deputy, he answered. I thought once that I was on the right track. Phonetic spelling had again misled me. A half-crown tip put the deputy's knowledge at my disposal, and I learned that Mr. Bloxham, who had slept off the remains of his beer on the previous night at Corcoran's, had left for his work at Poplar at five o'clock that morning. He could not tell me where the place of work was situated, but he had a vague idea that it was some kind of a new-fangled warehouse, and with this slender clue I had to start for Poplar. It was twelve o'clock before I got any satisfactory hint of such a building, and this I got at a coffee shop where some workmen were having their dinner. 
One of these suggested that there was being erected at Cross Angel Street a new cold storage building, and as this suited the condition of a newfangled wearer's, I at once drove to it. An interview with a surly gatekeeper and a surlier foreman, both of whom were appeased with the coin of the realm, put me on the track of Bloxham. He was sent for on my suggesting that I was willing to pay his day's wages to his foreman for the privilege of asking him a few questions on a private matter. He was a smart enough fellow, though rough of speech and bearing. When I had promised to pay for his information and given him an earnest, he told me that he had made two journeys between Carfax and a house in Piccadilly, and had taken from his house to the latter nine great boxes, main heavy ones, with a horse and cart hired by him for this purpose. I asked him if he could tell me the number of the house in Piccadilly, to which he replied, Well, Governor, I forgets the number, but it was only a few doors from a big white church or something of the kind, but... But it was only a few doors down from a big white church or something of the kind, not long built. It was a dusty old house too, though nothing to the dustiness of the house we took the bloomin' boxes from. How did you get into the houses if they were both empty? There was the old party what engaged me await in the house at Purfleet. He helped me to lift the boxes and put them in the dray. Curse me, but he was the strongest chap I ever struck, and him an old seller, with a white moustache. When that thin, you think he couldn't throw a shatter. How this phrase thrilled through me. Why, he took up his end of the boxes like they was pounds of tea, and me a puffin' and a blowin' afore I could up and mine anyhow, and I'm no chicken either. How did you get into the house in Piccadilly? I asked. He was there too. He must have started off and got there afore me, for when I rung of the bell he came and opened the door hisself and helped me to carry the boxes into the hall. The whole nine? I asked. Yes, there was five in the first load and four in the second. It was mean dry work, and I don't so well remember how I got home. I interrupted him. Were the boxes left in the hall? Yes, it was a big hall, and there was nothing else in it. I made one more attempt to further matters. He didn't have any key. Never used no key nor nothing. The old gent, he opened the door himself and shut it again when I drove off. Don't remember the last time, but that was the beer. And you can't remember the number of the house? No, sir. But she needn't have no difficulty about that. It's an iron with a stone front with a bow on it, and I steps up to the door. I know them steps haven't had to carry the boxes up with three loafers what come round to earn a copper. The old gent give them shillings, and they see and they got so much they wanted more. But he took one of them by the shoulder and was like to throw him down the steps till the lot of them went away cussing. I thought that with this description I could find the house, so, having paid my friend for his information, I started off for Piccadilly. I had gained a new painful experience. The Count could, it was evident, handle the earth boxes himself. If so, time was precious, for, now that he had achieved a certain amount of distribution, he could, by choosing his own time, complete the task unobserved. At Piccadilly Circus I discharged my cap and walked westward. Beyond the junior constitutional I came across the house described, and was satisfied that this was the next of the layers arranged by Dracula. The house looked as though it had been long untenanted, the windows were encrusted with dust, and the shutters were up. All the framework was black with time, and from the iron the paint had mostly scaled away. It was evident that, up to lately, there had been a large notice board in front of the balcony. It had, however, been roughly torn away, the uprights which had supported it still remaining. Behind the rails of the balcony I saw that there were some loose boards, whose raw edges looked white. I would have given a good deal to have been able to see the notice board intact as it would, perhaps, have given some clue to the ownership of the house. I remembered my experience of the investigation and purchase of Carfax, and I could not but feel that if I could find the former owner, there might be some means discovered of gaining access to the house. There was at present nothing to be learned from the Piccadilly side, and nothing could be done, so I went round to the back to see if anything could be gathered from this quarter. The mews were active, the Piccadilly houses being mostly in occupation, I asked one or two of the grooms and helpers whom I saw around if they could tell me anything about the empty house. One of them said that he had it had lately been taken, but he couldn't say from whom. He told me, however, that up to very lately there had been a notice board of for sale up, and that perhaps Mitchell Sons and Candy, the house agents, could tell me something, as he thought he remembered seeing the name of that firm on the board. I did not wish to seem too eager, or to let my informant know or guess too much, so thanking him in the usual manner, I strolled away. It was now growing dusk and the autumn night was closing in, so I did not lose any time. 
Having learned the address of Mitchell, Sons & Candy from a directory at the Berkeley, I was soon at their office in Sackville Street. The gentleman who saw me was particularly suave in manner, but uncommunicative in equal proportion. Having once told me that the Piccadilly house, which throughout our interview he called a mansion, was sold, he considered my business as concluded. When I asked who had purchased it, he opened his eyes a thought wider and paused for a few seconds before replying. It is sold, sir. Pardon me, I said with equal politeness, but I have a special reason for wishing to know who purchased it. Again he paused longer and raised his eyebrows still more. It is sold, sir, was again his laconic reply. Surely, I said, you do not mind letting me know so much. But I do mind, he answered. The affairs of their clients are absolutely safe in the hands of Mitchell, Sons and Candy. This was manifestly a prick of the first water, and there was no use arguing with him. I thought I had best meet him on his own ground, so I said, Your clients, sir, are happy in having so resolute a guardian of their confidence. I am myself a professional man. Here I handed him my card. In this instant I am not prompted by curiosity. I act on the part of Lord Godalming, who wishes to know something of the property which was, he understood, lately for sale. These words put a different complexion on affairs. He said, I would like to oblige you if I could, Mr. Harker, and especially would like to oblige his lordship. We once carried out a small matter of renting some chambers for him when he was the Honourable Arthur Holmwood. If you will let me have his lordship's address, I will consult the house on the subject, and will, in any case, communicate with his lordship by tonight's post. It will be a pleasure if we can so far deviate from our rules as to give the required information to his lordship. I wanted to secure a friend, and not make an enemy, so I thanked him, gave the address at Dr. Seward's, and came away. It was now dark, and I was tired and hungry. I got a cup of tea at the aerated bread company, and came down to Perfleet by the next train. I found all the others at home, Mina was looking tired and pale, but she made a gallant effort to be bright and cheerful. It wrung my heart to think that I had had to keep anything from her, and so caused her inquietude. Thank God this will be the last thing of her looking on our conferences, and feeling the sting of our not showing our confidence. It took all my courage to hold to the wise resolution of keeping her out of our grim task. She seems somehow more reconciled, or else the very subject seems to have become repugnant to her, for when any accidental illusion is made, she actually shudders. I am glad we made our resolution in time, as with such a feeling as this, our growing knowledge would be tortured to her. I could not tell the others of the day's discovery till we were alone, so after dinner, followed by little music to save appearances even amongst ourselves, I took Mina to her room and left her to go to bed. The dear girl was more affectionate with me than ever, and clung to me as though she would detain me, but there was much to be talked of, and I came away. Thank God the ceasing of telling things has made no difference between us. When I came down again, I found the others all gathered round the fire in the study. In the train I had written my diary so far, and simply read it off to them as the best means of letting them get abreast of my own information. When I had finished, Van Helsing said, This has been a great day's work, friend Jonathan. Doubtless we are on the track of the missing boxes. If we find them all in that house, then our work is near the end. But if there be some missing, we must search until we find them. Then shall we make our final coup and hunt the wretch to his real death. We all sat silent a while, and all at once Mr. Moore spoke. Say, how are we going to get into that house? We got into the other, answered Lord Godalming quickly. But Art, this is different. We broke house in Carfax, but we had night and a walled park to protect us. It will be a mighty different thing to commit burglary in Piccadilly, either by day or night. I confess I don't see how we are going to get in unless that agency duck can find us a key of some sort. Perhaps we shall know when you get his letter in the morning. Lord Godalming's brows contracted, and he stood up and walked about the room. By and by he stopped and said, turning from one to the other of us. Quincy's head is level. His burglary business is getting serious. We got off once all right, but we have now a rare job on hand, unless we can find the Count's key basket. As nothing could well be done before morning, and as it would be at least advisable to wait till Lord Godalming should hear from Mitchell's, we decided not to take any active step before breakfast time. For a good while, we sat and smoked, discussing the matter in its various lights and bearings. I took the opportunity of bringing this diary right up to the moment. I am very sleepy and shall go to bed. Just a line. Mina sleeps soundly and her breathing is regular. Her forehead is puckered up into little wrinkles as though she thinks even in her sleep. She is still too pale, but it does not look so haggard as she did this morning. Tomorrow will, I hope, mend all this. 
she will be herself at home in Exeter. Oh, but I'm sleepy. Dr. Seward's Diary 1. October I am puzzled afresh about Renfield. His moods change so rapidly that I find it difficult to keep touch of them, and as they always mean something more than his own well-being, they form more than an interesting study. This morning, when I went to see him after his repulsive Van Helsing, his manner was that of a man commanding destiny. He was, in fact, commanding destiny, subjectively. He did not really care for any of the things of mere earth. He was in the clouds and looked down on all the weaknesses and wants of us poor mortals. I thought I would improve the occasion and learn something, so I asked him, What about the flies these times? He smiled on me in quite a superior sort of way, such a smile as would have become the face of Malvolio, as he answered me. The fly, my dear sir, has one striking feature. Its wings are typical of the aerial powers of the psychic faculties. The ancients did well when they typified the soul as a butterfly. I thought I would push his analogy to its utmost logically, so I said quickly, Oh, it is a soul you are after now, is it? His madness foiled his reason, and a puzzled look spread over his face as, shaking his head with a decision which I had but seldom seen in him, he said, Oh no, oh no, I want no souls. Life is all I want. Here he brightened up. I am pretty indifferent about it at present. Life is all right. I have all I want. You must get a new patient, doctor, if you wish to study zoophagy. This puzzled me a little, so I drew him on. Then you command life. You are a god, I suppose. He smiled with an ineffably benign superiority. Oh no, far be it from me to arrogate myself the attributes of a deity. I'm not even concerned in his especially spiritual doings. If I may state my intellectual position, I am, so far as concerns things purely terrestrial, somewhat in the position which Enoch occupied spiritually. This was a poser to me. I could not at the moment recall Enoch's appositeness, so I had to ask a simple question, though I felt that by so doing I was lowering myself in the eyes of the lunatic. And why with Enoch? Because he walked with God. I could not see the analogy, but did not like to admit it, so I harked back to what he had denied. So you don't care about life and you don't want souls, why not? I put my question quickly and somewhat sternly, on purpose to disconcert him. The effort succeeded, for an instant he unconsciously relapsed into his old servile manner, bent low over me, and actually fawned upon me as he replied, I don't want any souls, indeed, indeed, I don't. I couldn't use them if I had them. They would be no manner of use to me. I couldn't eat them, or... He suddenly stopped, and the old cunning look spread over his face like a wind sweep on the surface of the water. And darker as to life. What is it, after all? When you've got all you require, and you know that you will never want, that is all. I have friends, good friends, like you, Dr. Seward. This was said with a leer of inexpressible cunning. I know that I shall never lack the means of life. I think that through the cloudiness of his insanity he saw some antagonism in me, for he at once fell back on the last refuge of such as he, a dogged silence. After a short time I saw that for the present it was useless to speak with him. He was sulky, and so I came away. Later in the day he sent for me. Ordinarily I would not have come without special reason, but just at present... I am so interested in him that I would gladly make an effort. Besides, I am glad to have anything to help to pass the time. Harker is out, following up clues, and so are Lord Godalming and Quincy. Van Helsing sits in my study poring over the record prepared by the Harkers. He seems to think that by accurate knowledge of all details he will light upon some clue. He does not wish to be disturbed in the work without cause. I would have taken him with me to see the patient, only I thought that, after his last repulse, he might not care to go again. There was also another reason. Renfield might not speak so freely before a third person as when he and I were alone. I found him sitting out in the middle of the floor on his stool, a pose which is generally indicative of some mental energy on his part. When I came in, he said at once, as though the question had been waiting on his lips, What about souls? It was evident that my surmise had been correct. Unconscious cerebration was doing its work, even with the lunatic. I determined to have the matter out. What about them yourself? I asked. He did not reply for a moment, but looked all round him and up and down, as though he expected to find some inspiration for an answer. I don't want any souls, he said in a feeble, apologetic way. The matter seemed preying on his mind, and so I determined to use it, to be cruel only to be kind, so I said, You like life, you want life. Oh yes, but that is all right, you needn't worry about that. 
But, I said, how are we to get the life without getting the soul also? This seemed to puzzle him, so I followed it up. A nice time you'll have some time when you're flying out there, with the souls of a thousand flies and spiders and birds and cats buzzing and twittering and meowing all round you. You've got their lives, you know, and you must put up with their souls. Something seemed to affect his imagination, for he put his fingers to his ears and shut his eyes, screwing them up tightly just as a small boy does when his face is being soaked. There was something pathetic in it that touched me. It also gave me a lesson, for it seemed that before me was a child, only a child, though the features were worn and the stubble in the jaws was white. It was evident that he was undergoing some process of mental disturbance, and, knowing how his past moods had interpreted things seemingly foreign to himself, I thought I would enter into his mind as well as I could and go with him. The first step was to restore confidence, so I asked him, speaking pretty loud so that he would hear me through his closed ears, "'Would you like some sugar to get your flies round again?' He seemed to wake up all at once and shook his head. With a laugh, he replied, "'Not much. Flies are poor things, after all.' After a pause, he added, "'But I don't want their souls buzzing round me all the same.' "'Or spiders,' I went on. "'Blow spiders? What's the use of spiders? There isn't anything in them to eat, or—' He stopped suddenly, as though reminded of a forbidden topic. "'So-so,' I thought to myself. "'This is the second time he has suddenly stopped at the word drink. What does it mean?' Renfeld seemed himself aware of having made a lapse, for he hurried on, as though to distract my attention from it. "'I don't take any stock at all in such matters. Rats and mice and such small deer, as Shakespeare has it, chicken feed of the larder, they might be called, and past all that sort of nonsense. You might as well ask a man to eat molecules with a pair of chopsticks as to try to interest me about the lesser carnivora, when I know what is before me. I see, I said. You want big things that you can make your teeth meet in. How would you like to breakfast on elephant? What ridiculous nonsense you are talking. He was getting too wide awake, so I thought I would press him hard. I wonder, I said reflectively, what an elephant's soul is like. The effect I desired was obtained, for he at once fell from his high horse and became a child again. I don't want an elephant's soul or any soul at all, he said. For a few moments he sat despondently. Suddenly he jumped to his feet with his eyes blazing and all the signs of intense cerebral excitement. To hell with you and your souls, he shouted. Why do you plague me about souls? Haven't I got enough to worry and pain and distract me already without thinking of souls? He looked so hostile that I thought he was in for another homicidal fit, so I blew my whistle. The instant, however, that I did so, he became calm, and said apologetically, Forgive me, doctor. I forgot myself. You do not need any help. I am so worried in my mind that I am apt to be irritable. If you only knew the problem I have to face, and that I am working out, you would pity and tolerate and pardon me. Pray do not put me in a straight waistcoat. I want to think, and I cannot think freely when my body is confined. I am sure you will understand. He had evidently self-control, so when the attendants came, I told them not to mind, and they withdrew. Renfield watched them go. When the door was closed, he said, with considerable dignity and sweetness, Dr. Seward, you have been very considerate towards me. Believe me that I am very, very grateful to you. I thought it well to leave him in his mood, and so I came away. There was certainly something to ponder over this man's state. Several points seem to make that the American interviewer calls a story, if one could only get them in proper order. Here they are. We'll not mention drinking. Fears the thought of being burdened with the soul of anything. Has no dread of wanting life in the future. Despises the meaner forms of life altogether, though he dreads being haunted by their souls. Logically, all these things point one way. He has assurance of some kind that he will acquire some higher life. He dreads the consequence, the burden, of a soul. Then it is a human life he looks to. And the assurance? Merciful God! The Count has been to him, and there is some new scheme of terror afoot. Later. I went after my round to Van Helsing and told him of my suspicion. He grew very grave, and after thinking the matter over for a while, asked me to take him to Renfield. I did so. And as we came to the door, we heard the lunatic within singing gaily, as he used to do in the time which now seemed so long ago. When we entered, we saw with amazement that he had spread out his sugar as of old. The flies, lethargic with the autumn, were beginning to buzz into the room. We tried to make him talk of the subject of our previous conversation, but he would not attend. 
he went on with his singing, just as though he had not been present. He had got a scrap of paper and was folding it into a notebook. We had to come away as ignorant as we went in. He is a curious case indeed. We must watch him tonight. Letter. Mitchell, Sons and Candy to Lord Godalming. 1st October. My lord, we are at all times only too happy to meet your wishes. We beg, with regard to the desire of your lordship expressed by Mr. Harker on your behalf, to supply the following information concerning the sale and purchase of number 347 Piccadilly. The original vendors are the executors of the late Mr. Archibald Winter Suffield. The purchaser is a foreign nobleman, Count Deville, who effected the purchase himself, paying the purchase money in notes over the counter, if your lordship will pardon us using so vulgar an expression. Beyond this, we know nothing whatever of him. We are, my lord, your lordship's humble servants, Mitchell, Sons, and Candy. Dr. Seward's Diary 2nd October I placed a man in the corridor last night, and told him to make an accurate note of any sound he might hear from Renfield's room, and give him instructions that if there should be anything strange he was to call me. When we had all gathered round the fire in the study, Mrs. Harker having gone to bed, we discussed the attempts and discoveries of the day. Harker was the only one who had any result, and we are in great hopes that his clue may be an important one. Before going to bed, I went round to the patient's room and looked in through the observation trap. He was sleeping soundly, and his heart rose and fell with regular respiration. This morning, the man on duty reported to me that a little after midnight he was restless, and kept saying his prayers somewhat loudly. I asked him if that was all. He replied that it was all he heard. There was something about his manner so suspicious that I asked him, point blank, if he had been asleep. He denied sleep, but admitted to having dozed for a while. It is too bad that men cannot be trusted unless they are watched. Today, Harker is following up his clue, and Art and Quincy are looking after horses. Godalming thinks that it will be well to have horses always in readiness, for when we get the information we seek there will be no time to lose. We must sterilize all the imported earth between sunrise and sunset. We shall thus catch the Count at his weakest, and without a refuge to fly to. Van Helsing is off to the British Museum looking up some authorities on ancient medicine. The old physicians took account of things which their followers do not accept, and the professor is searching for witch and demon cures which may be useful to us later. I sometimes think we must be all mad, and that we shall wake to sanity in straight waistcoats. Later. We have met again. We seem at last to be on the track, and our work of tomorrow may be the beginning of the end. I wonder if Renfield's quiet has anything to do with this. His moods have so followed the doings of the Count that the coming destruction of the monster may be carried to him in some subtle way. If we could only get some hint as to what passed in his mind between the time of my argument with him today and his resumption of fly-catching, it might afford us a valuable clue. He is now seemingly quiet for a spell. Is he... That wild yell seemed to come from his room. The attendant came bursting into my room and told me that Renfield had somehow met with some accident. I had heard him yell and, when he went to him, found him lying on his face on the floor, all covered with blood. I must go at once. End of chapter 20 Recording by Corinne LePage <laughs> Chapter 21 of Dracula by Bram Stoker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Corinne LePage. Chapter 21 Dr. Seward's Diary. 3rd October. Let me put down with exactness all that happened, as well as I can remember it since last I made an entry. Not a detail that I can recall must be forgotten. In all calmness, I must proceed. When I came to Renfield's room, I found him lying on the floor in his left side in a glittering pool of blood. When I went to move him, it became at once apparent that he had received some terrible injuries. There seemed none of that unity of purpose between the parts of the body which marks even lethargic sanity. As the face was exposed, I could see that it was horribly bruised, as though it had been beaten against the floor. Indeed, it was from the face wounds that the pool of blood originated. The attendant who was kneeling beside the body said to me as we turned him over, I think, sir, his back is broken. See, both his right arm and leg and the whole side of his face are paralyzed. How such a thing could have happened puzzled the attendant beyond measure. He seemed quite bewildered and his brows were gathered in as he said, 
I can't understand the two things. He could mark his face like that by beating his own head on the floor. I saw a young woman do it once at the Eversfield Asylum before anyone could lay hands on her. And I suppose he might have broke his neck by falling out of bed if he got in an awkward kink. But for the life of me, I can't imagine how the two things occurred. If his back was broke, he couldn't beat his head. And if his face was like that before the fall out of bed, there would be marks of it. I said to him, Go to Dr. Van Helsing and ask him kindly to come here at once. I want him without an instant's delay. The man ran off, and within a few minutes the professor, in his dressing gown and slippers, appeared. When he saw Renfield on the ground, he looked keenly at him a moment, and then turned to me. I think he recognized my thought in my eyes, for he said very quietly, manifestly for the ears of the attendant, Ah, a sad accident. He will need very careful watching, and much attention. I shall stay with you myself, but I shall first dress myself. If you will remain, I shall in a few minutes join you. The patient was now breathing stertorously, and it was easy to see that he had suffered some terrible injury. Van Helsing returned with extraordinary celerity, bearing with him a surgical case. He had evidently been thinking, and had his mind made up, for almost before he looked at the patient he whispered to me, Send the attendant away. We must be alone with him when he becomes conscious, after the operation. So I said, I think that will do now, Simmons. We have done all that we can at present. You had better go your round and... Dr. Van Helsing will operate. Let me know instantly if there be anything unusual anywhere. The man withdrew, and we went into a strict examination of the patient. The wounds of the face were superficial. The real injury was a depressed fracture of the skull, extending right up through the motor area. The professor thought a moment and said, We must reduce the pressure and get back to normal conditions, as far as can be. The rapidity of the suffusion shows the terrible nature of his injury. The whole motor area seems affected. The sufficient of the brain will increase quickly, so we must trephine at once or it may be too late. As he was speaking, there was a soft tapping at the door. I went over and opened it and found in the corridor without, Arthur and Quincy in pajamas and slippers. The former spoke. I heard your man call up Dr. Van Helsing and tell him of an accident, so I woke Quincy, or rather called for him as he was not asleep. Things are moving too quickly and too strangely for sound sleep for any of us these times. I've been thinking that tomorrow night we'll not see things as they have been. We'll have to look back, and forward a little more than we have done. May we come in? I nodded and held the door open till they had entered, then I closed it again. When Quincy saw the attitude and state of the patient and noted the horrible pool on the floor, he said softly, My God, what has happened to him? Poor, poor devil. I told him briefly and added that we expected he would recover consciousness after the operation, for a short time at all events. He went at once and sat down on the edge of the bed, with Godalming beside him. We all watched in patience. We shall wait, said Van Helsing, just long enough to fix the best spot for trephining, so that we may most quickly and perfectly remove the blood clot, for it is evident that the hemorrhage is increasing. The minutes during which we waited passed with fearful slowness. I had a horrible sinking in my heart, and from Van Helsing's face, I gathered that he felt some fear or apprehension as to what was to come. I dreaded the words that Renfield might speak. I was positively afraid to think, but the conviction of what was coming was on me, as I have read of men who have heard the death watch. The poor man's breathing came in uncertain gasps. Each instant he seemed as though he would open his eyes and speak, and then would follow a prolonged stertuous breath, and she would relapse into a more fixed insensibility. Inured as I was to sick beds and death, this suspense grew and grew upon me, and could almost hear the beating of my own heart, and the blood surging through my temple sounded like blows from a hammer. The silence finally became agonizing. I looked at my companions one after another, and saw from their flushed faces and damp brows that they were enduring equal torture. There was a nervous suspense over us all, as though overhead some dread bell would peal out powerfully when we should least expect it. At last there came a time when it was evident that the patient was sinking fast. He might die at any moment. I looked up at the professor and caught his eyes fixed on mine. His face was sternly set as he spoke. There is no time to lose. His words may be worth many lives. I have been thinking so as I stood here. It may be that there is a soul at stake. We shall operate just above the ear. Without another word he made the operation. For a few moments the breathing continued to be stertuous. Then there came a breath so prolonged that it seemed as though it would tear open his chest. Suddenly his eyes opened, 
and became fixed in a wild, helpless stare. This was continued for a few moments, then it softened into a glad surprise, and from the lips came a sigh of relief. He moved convulsively, and as he did so, said, I'll be quiet, doctor. Tell them to take off the straight waistcoat. I had a terrible dream, and it has left me so weak that I cannot move. What's wrong with my face? It feels all swollen, and it smarts dreadfully. He tried to turn his head, but even with the effort his eyes seemed to grow glassy again, so I gently put it back. Then Van Helsing said in a quiet, grave tone, Tell us your dream, Mr. Renfield. As he heard the voice, his face brightened. Through its mutilation, he said, That is Dr. Van Helsing. How good it is of you to be here. Give me some water, my lips are dry, and I shall try to tell you. I dreamed. He stopped and seemed fainting. I called quietly to Quincy. The brandy, it is in my study, quick. He flew and returned with a glass, the decanter of brandy and a carafe of water. We moistened the parched lips, and the patient quickly revived. It seemed, however, that his poor injured brain had been working in the interval, for, when he was quite conscious, he looked at me piercingly with an agonized confusion, which I shall never forget, and said, I must not deceive myself. It was no dream, but all a grim reality. Then his eyes roved around the room. As they caught sight of the two figures sitting patiently on the edge of the bed, he went on, If I were not sure already, I would know from them... For an instant, his eyes closed, not with pain or sleep, but voluntarily, as though he were bringing all his faculties to bear. When he opened them, he said, hurriedly, and with more energy than he had yet displayed, Quick, doctor, quick, I am dying. I feel that I have but a few minutes, and then I must go back to death. Or worse, wet my lips with brandy again. I have something I must say before I die or before my poor crushed brain dies anyhow. Thank you. It was that night after you left me when I implored you to let me go away. I couldn't speak then, for I felt my tongue was tied, but I was as sane then, except in that way as I am now. I was in an agony of despair for a long time after you left me. It seemed hours. Then there came a sudden peace to me. My brain seemed to become cool again, and I realized where I was. I heard the dogs bark behind our house, but not where he was. As he spoke, Van Helsing's eyes never blinked, but his hand came out and met mine and gripped it hard. He did not, however, betray himself. He nodded slightly and said, Go on, in a low voice. Renfield proceeded. He came up to the window in the mist, as I had seen him often before. But he was solid then, not a ghost, and his eyes were fierce like a man's when angry. He was laughing with his red mouth. The sharp white teeth glinted in the moonlight when he turned to look back over the belt of trees to where the dogs were barking. I wouldn't ask him to come in at first, though I knew he wanted to, just as he had wanted all along. Then he began promising me things, not in words, but by doing them. He was interrupted by a word from the professor. How? By making them happen, just as he used to send in the flies when the sun was shining. Great, big, fat ones with steel and sapphire on their wings, and big moths in the night, with skull and crossbones on their backs. Van Helsing nodded to him as he whispered to me unconsciously. The Acherontiae tetrapos of the Sphinges, what you call death's head moth. The patient went on without stopping. Then he began to whisper, Rats, 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 hundreds, thousands, millions of them, and every one a life, and dogs to eat them, and cats too, all lives, all red blood, with years of life in it, and not merely buzzing flies. I laughed at him, for I wanted to see what he could do. Then the dogs howled, away beyond the dark trees in his house. He beckoned me to the window. I got up and looked out, and he raised his hands and seemed to call out without using any words. A dark mass spread over the grass, coming on like the shape of a flame on fire, and then he moved the mist to the right and left, and I could see that there were thousands of rats with their eyes blazing red, like his, only smaller. He held up his hand, and they all stopped, and I thought he seemed to be saying, All these lives I will give you, I, and many more and greater, through countless ages if you will fall down and worship me. 
and then a red cloud, like the colour of blood, seemed to close over my eyes, and before I knew what I was doing, I found myself opening the sash and saying to him, Come in, Lord and Master, the rats were gone, but he slid into the room through the sash, though it was only open an inch wide, just as the moon herself has often come in through the tiniest crack and stood before me in all her size and splendour. His voice was weaker, so I moistened his lip with the brandy again, and he continued, but it seemed as though his memory had gone on working in the interval for his story was further advanced. I was about to call him back to the point, but Van Helsing whispered to me, Let him go on. Do not interrupt him. He cannot go back, and maybe could not proceed at all if he lost the thread of his thought. He proceeded. All day I waited to hear from him, but he did not send me anything, not even a blowfly, and when the moon got up I was pretty angry with him. When he slid in through the window, though it was shut, and did not even knock, I got mad with him. He sneered at me, and his white face looked out of the mist with his red eyes gleaming, and he went on as though he owned the whole place. And I was no one. He didn't even smell the same as he went by me. I couldn't hold him. I thought that, somehow, Mrs. Harker had come into the room. The two men sitting on the bed stood up and came over, standing behind him so that he could not see them, but what they could hear better. They were both silent, but the professor started and quivered. His face, however, grew grimmer and sterner still. Renfield went on without noticing. When Mrs. Harker came in to see me this afternoon, she wasn't the same. It was like tea after the teapot had been watered. Here we all moved, but no one said a word. He went on. I didn't know that she was here till she spoke. And she didn't look the same. I don't care for the pale people. I like them with lots of blood in them, and hers had all seemed to have run out. I didn't think of it at the time, but when she went away, I began to think, and it made me mad to know that he had been taking the life out of her. I could feel that the rest quivered, as I did, but we remained otherwise still. So when he came tonight, I was ready for him. I saw the mist stealing in, and I grabbed it tight. I had heard that madmen have unnatural strength, and as I knew I was a madman, at times, anyhow, I resolved to use my power. I and he felt it too, for he had come out of the mist to struggle with me. I held tight, and I thought I was going to win, for I didn't mean him to take any more of her life till I saw his eyes. They burned into me, and my strength became like water. He slipped through it, and when I tried to cling to him, he raised me up and flung me down. There was a red cloud before me and a noise like thunder, and the mist seemed to steal away under the door. There was a red cloud before me and a noise like thunder, and the mist seemed to steal away under the door. His voice was becoming fainter and his breath more stertorous. Van Helsing stood up instinctively. We know the worst now, he said. He is here, and we know his purpose. It may not be too late. Let us be armed, the same as we were the other night, but lose no time. There is not an instant to spare. There is no need to put our fear, nay, our conviction into words. We shared them in common. We all hurried and took from our rooms the same things that we had when we entered the Count's house. The professor had his ready, and as we met in the corridor he pointed to them significantly as he said, They never leave me. They shall not until this unhappy business is over. Be wise also, my friends. This is no common enemy that we deal with. Alas! Alas, that dear Madame Mina should suffer! He stopped. His voice was breaking, and I do not know if rage or terror predominated in my own heart. Outside the hawker's door, we paused. Art and Quincy held back, and the latter said, Should we disturb her? We must, said Van Helsing grimly. If the door be locked, I shall break it in. May it not frighten her terribly. It is unusual to break into a lady's room. Van Helsing said solemnly, You are always right, but this is life and death. All chambers are alike to the doctor, and even were they not, they are all as one to me tonight. Friend John, when I turn the handle, if the door does not open, do you put your shoulder down and shove, and you two of my friends. No. He turned the handle as he spoke, but the door did not yield. We threw ourselves against it. With a crash, it burst open, and we almost fell headlong into the room. 
The professor did actually fall, and I saw across him as he gathered himself up from hands and knees. What I saw appalled me. I felt my hair rise like bristles on the back of my neck, and my heart seemed to stand still. The moonlight was so bright that through the thick yellow blind the room was light enough to see. On the bed beside the window lay Jonathan Harker, his face flushed and breathing heavily as though in a stupor. Kneeling on the near edge of the bed facing outwards was the white-clad figure of his wife. By her side stood a tall, thin man clad in black. His face was turned from us, but the instant we saw we all recognized the Count, in every way, even to the scar on his forehead. With his left hand he held both Mrs. Harker's hands, keeping them away with her arms at full tension. His right gripped her by the back of the neck, forcing her face down on his bosom. Her white nightdress was smeared with blood, and a thin stream trickled down the man's bare breast, which was shown by his torn open dress. The attitude of the two had a terrible resemblance to a child, forcing a kitten's nose into a saucer of milk to compel it to drink. As we burst into the room, the Count turned his face, and the hellish look that I had heard described seemed to leap into it. His eyes flamed red with devilish passion. The great nostrils of the white aquiline nose opened wide and quivered at the edge, and the white sharp teeth, behind the full lips of the blood-dripping mouth, champed together like those of a wild beast. With a wrench he threw his victim back upon the bed as though hurled from a height. He turned and sprang at us, but by this time the professor had gained his feet and was holding towards him the envelope which contained the sacred wafer. The Count suddenly stopped, just as poor Lucy had done outside of the tomb, and cowered back. Further and further back he cowered as we, lifting our crucifixes, advanced. The moonlight suddenly failed, as a great black cloud sailed across the sky, and when the gaslight sprang up under Quincy's match, we saw nothing but a faint vapour. This, as we looked, trailed under the door, which, with the recoil from its bursting open, had swung back to its old position. Van Helsing, Art and I moved forward to Mrs. Harker, who by this time had drawn her breath, and with it had given a scream so wild, so ear-piercing, so despairing, that it seems to me now that it will ring in my ears to my dying day. For a few seconds, she lay in her helpless attitude in disarray. Her face was ghastly, with a pallor which was accentuated by the blood which smeared her lips and cheeks and chin. From her throat trickled a thin stream of blood. Her eyes were mad with terror. Then she put before her face her poor, crushed hands which bore on their whiteness the red mark of the Count's terrible grip, and from behind them came the low, desolate wail which made the terrible scream seem only the quick expression of an endless grief. Van Helsing stepped forward and drew the coverlet gently over her body, whilst Art, after looking at her face for an instant, despairingly, ran out of the room. Van Helsing whispered to me, Jonathan is in a stupor such as we know the vampire can produce. We can do nothing with poor Madame Mina for a few moments till she recovers herself. I must wake him. He dipped the end of a towel in cold water, and with it began to flick him on the face, his wife all the while holding her face between her hands and sobbing in a way that was heartbreaking to hear. I raised the blind and looked out of the window. There was much moonshine, and as I looked I could see Quincy Morris run across the lawn and hide himself in the shadow of a great yew tree. It puzzled me to think why he was doing this, but at the instant I heard Harker's quick exclamation as he woke to partial consciousness, and turned to the bed. On his face, as there might well be, was a look of wild amazement. He seemed dazed for a few seconds, then full consciousness seemed to burst upon him all at once, and he started up. His wife was aroused by the quick movement, and turned to him with her arms stretched out, as though to embrace him. Instantly, however, she drew them in again, and putting her elbows together, held her hands before her face, and shuddered till the bed beneath her shook. "'In God's name, what does this mean?' Harker cried out. "'Dr. Seward? Dr. Van Helsing, what is it? What has happened? What is wrong? Mina, dear, what is it? What does that blood mean? My God, my God, has it come to this?' And raising himself to his knees, he beat his hands wildly together. "'Good God, help us! Help her! Oh, help her!' With a quick movement, he jumped from the bed and began to pull on his clothes, all the man in him awake at the need for instant exertion. "'What has happened? Tell me all about it!' he cried without pausing. "'Dr. Van Helsing, you love Mina, I know. Oh, do something to save her! It cannot have gone too far yet. God her while I look for him!' 
His wife, through her terror and horror and distress, saw some sure danger to him. Instantly forgetting her own grief, she seized hold of him and cried out, No, no, Jonathan, you must not leave me. I have suffered enough tonight. God knows without the dread of his harming you. You must stay with me. Stay with these friends who will watch over you. Her expression became frantic as she spoke, and, he yielding to her, she pulled him down sitting on the bedside and clung to him fiercely. Van Helsing and I tried to calm them both. The professor held up his little golden crucifix and said with wonderful calmness, Do not fear, my dear. We are here, and whilst this is close to you, no foul thing can approach. You are safe for tonight, and we must be calm and take counsel together. She shuddered and was silent, holding down her head on her husband's breast. When she raised it, his white nightrobe was stained with blood where her lips had touched, and where the thin, open wound in her neck had sent forth drops. The instant she saw it, she drew back, with a low wail and whispered amidst choking sobs, Unclean, unclean, I must hurt him or kiss him no more. Oh, that it should be that it is I, who am now his worst enemy, and whom he may have the most cause to fear. To this, he spoke out resolutely. Nonsense, Mina. It is a shame to me to hear such a word. I would not hear it of you, and I shall not hear it from you. May God judge me by my deserts, and punish me with more bitter suffering than even this hour, if by any act or will of mine anything ever come between us. He put out his arms and folded her to his breast, and for a while she lay there sobbing. He looked at us over her bowed head, with eyes that blinked damply above his quivering nostrils. His mouth was set as steel. After a while her sobs became less frequent and more faint, and then he said to me, speaking with a studied calmness which I felt, tried his nervous power to the utmost. And now, Dr. Seward, tell me all about it. Too well I know the broad fact. Tell me all that has been. I told him exactly what had happened, and he listened with seeming impassiveness, but his nostrils twitched and his eyes blazed, as I told how the ruthless hands of the Count had held his wife in that terrible and horrid position, with a mouth to the opened wound in his breast. It interested me, even at that moment, to see that, whilst the face of the white-set passion worked convulsively over the bowed head, the hands tenderly and lovingly stroked the ruffled hair. Just as I had finished, Quincy and Godalming knocked at the door. They entered in obedience to our summons. Van Helsing looked at me questioningly. I understood him to mean that if we were to take advantage of their coming, to divert if possible the thoughts of the unhappy husband and wife from each other and from themselves. So on nodding acquiescence to him, he asked them what they had seen or done. To which Lord Godalming answered, I could not see him anywhere in the passage, or in any of our rooms. I looked in the study, but, though he had been there, he had gone. He had, however. He stopped suddenly, looking at the poor drooping figure on the bed. Van Helsing said gravely, Go on, friend Arthur. We want here no more concealments. Our hope, now, is in knowing all. Tell freely. So Arch went on. He had been there, and though it could have only been for a few seconds, he made rare hay of the place. All the manuscript had been burned, and the blue flames were flickering amongst the white ashes. The cylinders of your phonograph, too, were thrown on the fire, and the wax had helped the flames. Here I interrupted. Thank God there is another copy in the safe. His face lit for a moment, but fell again as he went on. I ran downstairs then, but could see no sign of him. I looked into Renfield's room, but there was no trace there except... Again he paused. Go on, said Harker hoarsely. So he bowed his head, and moistening his lips with his tongue added, Except that the poor fellow is dead. Mrs. Harker raised her head, looking from one to the other of us, she said solemnly. God's will be done. I could not feel that Art was keeping back something, but, as I took it that it was with a purpose, I said nothing. Van Helsing turned to Morris and asked, And you, friend Quincy, have you any to tell? A little, he answered. It may be much eventually, but at present I can't say. I thought it well to know if possible where the Count would go when he left the house. I did not see him, but I saw a bat rise up from Renfield's window and flap westward. I expected to see him in some shape go back to Carfax, but he evidently sought some other lair. He will not be back tonight, for the sky is reddening in the east and the dawn is close. We must work tomorrow. He said the latter words through his shut teeth. For a space of perhaps a couple of minutes, there was silence, and I could fancy that I could hear the sound of our hearts beating. Then Van Helsing said, placing his hand very tenderly on Mrs. Harker's head, 
And now, Madame Mina. Poor dear, dear Madame Mina. Tell us exactly what happened. God knows that I do not want that you be pained, but it is need that we know all. For now more than ever has all work to be done, quick and sharp and in deadly earnest. The day is close to us that must end all, if it may be so, and now is the chance that we may live and learn. The poor dear lady shivered, and I could see the tension of her nerves as she clasped her husband closer to her and bent her head lower and lower still on his breast. Then she raised her head proudly and held out one hand of Van Helsing who took it in his, and after stooping and kissing it reverently, held it fast. The other hand was locked in that of her husband, who held his other arm thrown around her protectingly. After a pause in which she was evidently ordering her thoughts, she began. I took the sleeping draught which you had so kindly given me, but for a long time it did not act. I seemed to become more wakeful, and myriads of horrible fancies began to crowd in upon my mind, all of them connected with death and vampires with blood and pain and trouble. Her husband involuntarily groaned as she turned to him and said lovingly, Do not fret, dear, you must be brave and strong and help me through the horrible task. If you only knew what an effort it is to me to tell of this fearful thing at all, you would know how much I need your help. Well, I saw I must try to help the medicine to its work with my will, if it was to do me any good, so I resolutely set myself to sleep. Sure enough, sleep must soon have come to me, for I remember no more. Jonathan coming in had not waked me, for he lay by my side, when I next remember. There was in the room the same thin white mist that I had before noticed. But I forget now, if you know of this, you will find it in my diary, which I shall show you later. I felt the same vague terror which had come to me before, and the same sense of some presence. I turned to wake Jonathan, but found that he slept so soundly that it seemed as if it was he who had taken the sleeping draught and not I. I tried, but I could not wake him. This caused me a great fear, and I looked around, terrified. Then indeed my heart sank within me, beside the bed, as if he had stepped out of the mist, or rather as if the mist had turned into his figure, for it had entirely disappeared, stood a tall, thin man, all in black. I knew him at once from the description of the others, the waxen face, the high aquiline nose on which the light fell a thin white line, the parted red lips, with the sharp white teeth showing between, and the red eyes that I seemed to see in the sunset of the windows of St. Mary's Church at Whitby. I knew, too, the red scar on his forehead where Jonathan had struck him. For an instant, my heart stood still, and I could have screamed out only that I was paralysed. In the pause, he spoke a sort of keen, cutting whisper, pointing as he spoke to Jonathan. Silence. If you make a sound, I shall take him and dash his brains out before your very eyes. I was appalled and was too bewildered to do or say anything. With a mocking smile, he placed one hand upon my shoulder and, holding me tight, bared my throat with the other, saying as he did so, First a little refreshment to reward my exertions. You may as well be quiet. It is not the first time or the second that your veins have appeased my thirst. I was bewildered and... Strangely enough, I did not want to hinder him. I suppose it is part of the horrible curse that such is when his touch is on his victim. And, oh my God, my God, pity me. He placed his reeking lips upon my throat. Her husband groaned again. She clasped his hand harder and looked at him pityingly as if he were the injured one, and went on. I felt my strength fading away, and I was in a half swoon. How long this horrible thing lasted I know not, but it seemed that a long time must have passed before he took his foul, awful, sneering mouth away. I saw it drip with the fresh blood. The remembrance seemed for a while to overpower her, and she drooped and would have sunk down but for her husband's sustaining arm. With a great effort she recovered herself and went on. Then he spoke to me mockingly, and so you, like the others, would play your brains against mine. You would help these men to hunt me and frustrate me in my designs. You know now that they know in part already, and will know in full before long what it is to cross my path. They should have kept their energies for use closer to home, whilst they played wits against me, against me who commanded nations, and intrigued for them, and fought for them hundreds of years before they were born. I was countermining them, and you, their best beloved one, are now to me flesh of my flesh, blood of my blood, kin of my kin, my bountiful wine press for a while, 
and shall be later on my companion and my helper. You shall be avenged in turn, for not one of them but shall minister to your needs. But as yet you are to be punished for what you have done. You have aided in thwarting me. Now you shall come to my call. When my brain says come to you, you shall cross land or sea to do my bidding, and to that end this. With that he pulled open his shirt, and with his long sharp nails opened a vein in his breast. When the blood began to spurt out, he took my hands in one of his, holding them tight, and with the other seized my neck and pressed my mouth to the wound, so that I must either suffocate or swallow some of the... Oh my God, oh my God, what have I done? What have I done to deserve such a fate? I who have tried to walk in meekness and righteousness all my days. God pity me, look down on a poor soul in worse than mortal peril, and in mercy pity those to whom she is dear. Then she began to rub her lips as though to cleanse them from pollution. As she was telling her terrible story, the eastern sky began to quicken, and everything became more and more clear. Harker was still and quiet, but over his face, as the awful narrative went on, came a grey look which deepened and deepened in the morning light, till, when the first red streak of the coming dawn shot up, the flesh stood darkly out against the whitening hair. We have arranged that one of us is to stay within the call of the unhappy pair, till we can meet together and arrange about taking action. Of this I am sure. The sun rises today on no more miserable house in all the great round of its daily course. End of chapter 21 Recording by Corinne LePage Chapter 22 of Dracula. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Corinne LePage. Chapter 22. Jonathan Harker's Journal. 3rd October. As I must do something or go mad, I write this diary. It is now six o'clock and we are to meet in the study half an hour and take something to eat. For Dr. Van Helsing and Dr. Seward are agreed that if we do not eat we cannot work our best. Our best will be, God knows, required today. I must keep a writing at every chance, for I dare not stop to think. All big and little must go down. Perhaps at the end, the little things may teach us most. The teaching big or little could not have landed Mina or me anywhere worse than we are today. However, we must trust and hope. Poor Mina told me just now, with the tears running down her dear cheeks, that it is in trouble and trial that our faith is tested that we must keep on trusting, and that God will aid us to the end. The end? Oh my God, what end? To work. To work. When Dr. Van Helsing and Dr. Seward had come back from seeing Paul Renfield, we went gravely into what was to be done. First, Dr. Seward told us that when he and Dr. Van Helsing had gone down to the room below, they had found Renfield lying on the floor, all in a heap. His face was all bruised and crushed in, and the bones of the neck were broken. Dr. Seward asked the attendant who was on duty in the passage if he had heard anything. He said that he had been sitting down, he confessed to half-dozing, when he heard loud voices in the room, and then Renfield had called out loudly several times, God, God, God! After that there was the sound of falling, and when he entered the room, he found him lying on the floor, face down, just as the doctors had seen him, Van Helsing asked if he had heard voices, or a voice, and he said that he could not say, that at first it had seemed to him as if there were two, but as there was no one in the room, it could have been only one. He could swear to it, if required, that the word God was spoken by the patient. Dr. Seward said to us, when we were alone, that he did not wish to go into the matter, the question of an inquest had to be considered, and it would never do to put forward the truth, as no one would believe it. As it was, he thought that on the attendant's evidence, he could give a certificate of death by misadventure in falling from bed. In case the coroner should demand it, there would be a formal inquest necessarily to the same result. When the question began to be discussed as to what should be our next step, the very first thing we decided was that Mina should be in full confidence, that nothing of any sort, no matter how painful, should be kept from her. She herself agreed as to its wisdom, and it was pitiful to see her so brave and yet so sorrowful, 
and in such a depth of despair. There must be no concealment, she said. Alas, we have had too much already, and besides there is nothing in all the world that can give me more pain than I have already endured, than I suffer now. Whatever may happen, it must be of new hope or of new courage to me. Van Helsing was looking at her fixedly as she spoke, and said, suddenly but quietly, But, dear Madame Mina, are you not afraid, not for yourself, but for others from yourself, after what has happened? Her face grew set in its lines, but her eyes shone with the devotion of a martyr as she answered, Ah, no, for my mind is made up. To what? he asked gently, whilst we were all very still, for each in our own way, we had a sort of vague idea of what she meant. Her answer came with direct simplicity, as though she were simply stating a fact. Because if I find in myself, and I shall watch keenly for it, a sign of harm to any that I love, I shall die. You would not kill yourself? He asked hoarsely. I would, if there were no friend who loved me, who would save me such a pain and so desperate an effort. She looked at him meaningly as she spoke. He was sitting down, but now he rose and came close to her and put his hand on her head as he said solemnly, My child, there is such an one if it were for your good. For myself, I could hold it in my account with God to find such an euthanasia for you, even at this moment if it were best. Nay, were it safe, but my child. For a moment he seemed choked, and a great sob rose in his throat. He gulped it down and went on. There are some who would stand between you and death. You must not die. You must not die by any hand, but least of all by your own. Until the other who has fouled your sweet life is true dead, you must not die. For if he is still with the quick undead, your death would make you even as he is. No, you must live. You must struggle and strive to live. Though death would seem a boon unspeakable, you must fight death himself, though he come to you in pain or in joy, by the day or the night, in safety or in peril. On your living soul I charge you that you do not die, nay, nor think of death, till this great evil be past. The poor dear grew white as death, and shock and shivered, as I've seen quicksand shake and shiver at the incoming of the tide. We were all silent. We could do nothing. At length she grew more calm, and, turning to him, said, sweetly but, oh, so sorrowfully, as she held out her hand, I promise you, my dear friend, that if God will let me live, I shall strive to do so, till, if it may be in his good time, this horror may have passed away from me. She was so good and brave that we all felt our hearts were strengthened to work and endure for her, and we began to discuss what we were to do. I told her that she was to have all the papers in the safe, and all the papers or diaries and phonographs we might hereafter use, and was to keep the record as she had done before. She was pleased with the prospect of anything to do if, pleased it could be used in connection with so grim an interest. As usual, Van Helsing had thought ahead of everyone else, and was prepared with an exact ordering of our work. It is perhaps well, he said, that our meeting after our visit to Carfax we decided not to do anything with the earth boxes that lay there. Had we done so, the Count must have guessed our purpose, and would doubtless have taken measures in advance to frustrate such an effort with regard to the others. But now he does not know our intentions. Nay, more in all probability, he does not know that such a power exists to us, as can sterilize his layers, so that he cannot use them as of old. We are now so much further advanced in our knowledge as to their disposition that, when we have examined the house in Piccadilly, we may track the very last of them. Today, then, is ours, and in it rests our hope. The sun that rose on our sorrow this morning guards us in its course. Until it sets tonight, that monster must retain whatever form he now has. He is confined within the limitations of his earthly envelope. He cannot melt into thin air, nor disappear through cracks or chinks or crannies. If he go through a doorway, he must open the door like a mortal. And so we have this day to hunt out all his layers and sterilize them. So we shall, if we have not yet catch him and destroy him, drive him to bay in some place where the catching and the destroying shall be in time sure. 
Here I started out, for I could not contain myself at the thought that the minutes and seconds so preciously laden with Mina's life and happiness were flying from us, since whilst we talked, action was impossible. But Van Helsing held up his hand warning me. Nay, friend Jonathan, he said, in this, the quickest way home is the longest way, so your proverb say. We shall all act, and act with desperate quick, when the time has come. But think, in all probable, the key of the situation is in that house in Piccadilly. The Count may have many houses which he has bought. Of them, he will have deeds of purchase, keys, and other things. He will have paper that he write on. He will have his book of checks. There are many belongings that he must have somewhere. Why not in this place so central, so quiet, where he come and go by the front or back at all hour, when in the very vast of traffic there is none to notice? We shall go there and search that house, and when we learn what it holds, then we do what our friend Arthur call, in his phrases of hunt, stop the earths, and so we run down our old fox. So, is it not? Then let us come at once, I cried. We are wasting the precious, precious time. The professor did not move, but simply said, And how are we to get into that house in Piccadilly? Anyway, I cried, we shall break in if need be. And your police, where will they be and what will they say? I was staggered, but I knew that if he wished to delay he had good reason for it, so I said as quietly as I could, Don't wait more than need be. You know I am sure of what torture I am in. Ah, my child, that I do. And indeed there is no wish of me to add to your anguish. But just think, what can we do until all the world be at movement? Then will come our time. I have thought and thought, and it seems to me that the simplest way is the best of all. Now we wish to get into the house, but we have no key, is it not so? I nodded. Now suppose that you were, in truth the owner of that house, and could not still get it, and think that there was, to you, no conscience of the housebreaker, what would you do? I should get a respectable locksmith and set him to work to pick the lock for me. And your police? They would interfere, would they not? Oh no, not if they knew the man was properly employed. Then, he looked at me as keenly as he spoke. All that is in doubt is the conscience of the employer, and the belief of your policeman as to whether or no that employer has a good conscience or a bad one. Your police must indeed be zealous men and clever, oh so clever, in reading the heart that they trouble themselves in such a matter. No, no, my friend Jonathan, you go take the lock off a hundred empty house in this your London or of any city in the world, and if you do it as such things are rightly done, and at the time such things are rightly done, no one will interfere. I have read of a gentleman who owned a so fine house in London, and when he went for months of summer to Switzerland and lock up his house, some burglar came and broke window at back and got in. Then he went and made open the shutters in front and walk out through the door, before the very eyes of the police. Then he have an auction in that house and advertise it and put up big notice and when the day come he sell off by a great auctioneer all the goods of that other man who owned them. Then he go to a builder, and he sell him that house, making an agreement that he pull it down and take away within a certain time, and your police and other authority help him all they can, and when that owner come back from his holiday in Switzerland, he find only an empty hole where his house had been. This was all done en regal and in our work we shall be en regal too. We shall not go so early that the policemen who have then little to think of shall deem it strange, but we shall go after ten o'clock, when there are many about, and such things would be done were we indeed owners of the house. I could not but see how right he was, and the terrible despair of Mina's face became relaxed to thought. There was hope in such good counsel. Van Helsing went on. When once within that house... We may find more clues. At any rate, some of us can remain there, whilst the rest find the other places where there may be more earth boxes, at Bermondsey and Mile End. Lord Godalming stood up. I can be of some use here, he said. I shall wire to my people to have horses and carriages where they will be most convenient. Look here, old fellow, said Morris. 
It is a capital idea to have all ready in case we want to go horseback riding, but don't you think that one of your snap carriages with its heraldic adornments in a byway of Walworth a mile end would attract too much attention for our purposes? It seems to me we ought to take cabs when we go south or east, and even leave them somewhere near the neighborhood we are going to. Friend Quincy is right, said the professor. His head is what you call in plain with the horizon. It is a difficult thing that we go to do, and we do not want no peoples to watch us, if so it may. Mina took a growing interest in everything, and I was rejoiced to see that the exigency of affairs was helping her to forget for a time the terrible experience of the night. She was very, very pale, almost ghastly, and so thin that her lips were drawn away, showing her teeth in somewhat of prominence. I did not mention this last lest it should give her needless pain, but it made my blood run cold in my veins to think of what had occurred with poor Lucy when the Count had sucked her blood. As yet there was no sign of the teeth growing sharper, but the time, as yet, was short, and there was time for fear. When we came to the discussion of the sequence of our efforts and of the disposition of our forces, there were new sources of doubt. It was finally agreed that before starting for Piccadilly, we should destroy the Count's lair close at hand, in case he should find it out too soon. We should thus be still ahead of him in our work of destruction, and his presence in his purely material shape, and at his weakest, might give us some new clue. As to the disposal of forces, it was suggested by the professor that, after a visit to Carfax, we should all enter the house in Piccadilly, that the two doctors and I should remain here, whilst Lord Godalming and Quincy found the lairs at Woolworth and Mile End and destroyed them. It was possible, if not likely, the professor urged, that the Count might appear in Piccadilly during the day, and that, if so, we might be able to cope with him then and there. At any rate, we might be able to follow him in force. To this plan I strenuously objected, and so far as my going was concerned, for I said that I intended to stay and protect Mina. I thought that my mind was made up on the subject, but Mina would not listen to my objection. She said that there might be some law matter in which I could be useful, that amongst the Count's papers might be some clue which I could understand out of my experience in Transylvania, and that, as it was, all the strength we could muster was required to cope with the Count's extraordinary power. I had to give in, for Mina's resolution was fixed. She said that it was the last hope for her that we should all work together. As for me, she said, I have no fear. Things have been as bad as they can be, and whatever may happen must have in it some element of hope or comfort. Go, my husband. God can, if he wishes it, guard me as well alone as with anyone present. So I started up crying out, In God's name let us come at once, for are we all losing time? The Count may come to Piccadilly earlier than we think. Not so, said Van Helsing, holding up his hand. But why? I asked. Do you forget, he said, with actually a smile, that last night he banqueted heavily and will sleep late? Did I forget? Shall I ever, can I ever, can any of us ever forget that terrible scene? Mina struggled hard to keep a brave countenance, but the pain overmastered her and she put her hands before her face and shuddered whilst she moaned. Van Helsing had not intended to recall her frightful experience. He had simply lost sight of her and her part in the affair in his intellectual effort. When it struck him what he said, he was horrified at his thoughtlessness and tried to comfort her. Oh, Madame Mina, he said, dear, dear Madame Mina, alas, that I of all who so reverence you should have said anything so forgetful. These stupid old lips of mine and this stupid old head do not deserve so, but you will forget it, will you not? He bent low beside her as he spoke. She took his hand and looking at him through her tears said hoarsely, No, I shall not forget, for it is well that I remember and with it I have so much in memory of you that is sweet, but I take it all together. Now you must all be going soon. Breakfast was a strange meal to us all. We tried to be cheerful and encourage each other, and Mina was the brightest and most cheerful of us. When it was over, Van Helsing stood up and said, Now, my dear friends, we go forth to our terrible enterprise. We are all armed, as we were on that night when first we visited our enemy's lair armed against ghostly as well as carnal attack? Are we all armed as we were on that night when first we visited our enemy's lair? 
armed against ghostly as well as carnal attack? We all assured him. Then it is well. Now, Madame Mina, you are in any case quite safe here until sunset, and before then we shall return. If we shall return. But before we go, let me see you armed against personal attack. I have myself, since you came down, prepared your chamber by the placing of things of which we know, that he may not enter. Now let me guard yourself. On your forehead I touch this piece of sacred wafer in the name of the Father, the Son, and... There was a fearful scream which almost froze our hearts to hear. As he had placed the wafer on Mina's forehead, it had seared it, had burned into the flesh as though it had been a piece of white-hot metal. My poor darling's brain had told her the significance of the fact as quickly as her nerves received the pain of it, and the two so overwhelmed her that her overwrought nature had its voice in that dreadful scream. But the words to her thought came quickly. The echo of the scream had not ceased to ring on the air, and there came the reaction, and she sank on her knees on the floor in an agony of abasement. Pulling her beautiful hair over her face, as the leper of old his mantle, she wailed out, Unclean, unclean, even the Almighty shuns my polluted flesh. I must bear this mark of shame upon my forehead until judgment day. They all paused. I had thrown myself beside her in an agony of helpless grief, and putting my arms around her, held her tight. For a few minutes, our sorrowful hearts beat together, whilst the friends around us turned away their eyes that ran tears silently. Then Van Helsing turned and said gravely, so gravely that I could not help feeling that he was in some way inspired and was stating things outside himself. It may be that you may have to bear that mark till God himself see fit, as he most surely shall, on the judgment day, to redress all wrongs of the earth and of his children that he has placed thereon. And, O oh, Madame Mina, my dear, my dear, may we who love you be there to see when that red scar, the sign of God's knowledge of what has been, shall pass away and leave your forehead as pure as the heart we know. For so surely as we live, that scar shall pass away when God sees right to lift the burden that is hard upon us. Till then we bear our cross, as his son did in obedience to his will. It may be that we are chosen instruments of his good pleasure and that we ascend to his bidding, as that other through stripes and shame, through tears and blood, through doubts and fears, and all that makes the difference between God and man. There was hope in his words, and comfort, and they made for resignation. Mina and I both felt so, and simultaneously we each took one of the old man's hand and bent over and kissed it. Then, without a word, we all knelt down together, and all holding hands, swore to be true to each other, we men pledged ourselves to raise the veil of sorrow from the head of her whom, each in his own way, we loved, and we prayed for help and guidance in the terrible task which lay before us. It was then time to start, so I said farewell to Mina, a parting which neither of us shall forget to our dying day, and we set out. To one thing I have made up my mind. If we find out that Mina must be a vampire in the end, then she shall not go into that unknown and terrible land alone. I suppose it is thus that in old times when vampire meant many, just as their hideous bodies could only rest in sacred earth, so the holiest love was the recruiting surgeon for their ghastly ranks. We entered Carfax without trouble and found all things the same as on the first occasion. It was hard to believe that amongst the so prosaic surroundings of neglect and dust and decay there was any ground for such fear as already we knew. Had not our minds been made up, and had there not been terrible memories to spur us on, we could hardly have proceeded with our task. We found no papers or any sign of use in the house, and in the old chapel the great boxes looked just as we had seen them last. Dr. Van Helsing said to us solemnly as we stood before them, And now, my friends, we have a duty here to do. We must sterilize this earth, so sacred of holy memories that he has brought from a far distant land, for such fell use. He has chosen this earth because it has been holy. Thus we defeat him with his own weapon, for we make it more holy still. It was sanctified to such use of man. Now we sanctify it to God. As he spoke, he took from his bag a screwdriver and a wrench, and very soon the top of one of the cases was thrown open. 
The earth smelled musty and close, but we did not somehow seem to mind, for our attention was concentrated on the professor. Taking from his box a piece of the sacred wafer, he laid it reverently on the earth, and then, shutting down the lid, began to screw it home, we aiding him as he worked. One by one we treated in the same way each of the great boxes, and left them as we had found them to all appearance, but in each was a portion of the host. When we closed the door behind us, the professor said solemnly, So much is already done. If it may be that with all the others we can be so successful, then the sunset of this evening may shine on Madame Mina's forehead all white as ivory and with no stain. As we passed across the lawn on our way to the station to catch our train, we could see the front of the asylum. I looked eagerly, and in the window of my own room saw Mina. I waved my hand to her, and nodded to tell that our work there was successfully accomplished. She nodded in reply to show that she understood. The last I saw, she was waving her hand in farewell. It was with a heavy heart that we sought the station, and just caught the train, which was streaming in as we reached the platform. I have written this in the train. Piccadilly, 12.30 o'clock. Just before we reached Fenchurch Street, Lord Godalming said to me, Quincy and I will find a locksmith. You had better not come with us in case there should be any difficulty, for under the circumstances it wouldn't seem so bad for us to break into an empty house. But you are a solicitor, and the Incorporated Law Society might tell you that you should have known better. I demurred as to my not sharing any danger, even of odium, but he went on. Besides, it will attract less attention if there are not too many of us. My title will make it all right with the locksmith, and with any policeman that may come along. You had better go with Jack and the professor and stay in the green park, somewhere inside of the house, and when you see the door opened and the smith has gone away, do you all come across. We shall be on the lookout for you and shall let you in. The advice is good, said Van Helsing, so we said no more. Godalming and Morris hurried off in a cab, we following in another. At the corner of Arlington Street, our contingent got out and strolled into the green park. My heart beat as I saw the house, on which so much of our hope was centred, looming up grim and silent in its deserted condition amongst its more lively and spruce-looking neighbours. We sat down on a bench, within good view, and began to smoke cigars so as to attract as little attention as possible. The minutes seemed to pass with leaden feet as we waited for the coming of the others. At length we saw a four-wheeler drive up, out of it, in leisurely fashion, got Lord Godalming and Morris. And down from the box descended a thick-set working man with his rush-woven basket of tools. Morris paid the cabman, who touched his hat and drove away. Together the two ascended the steps, and Lord Godalming pointed out what he wanted done. The workman took off his coat leisurely and hung it on one of the spikes of the rail, saying something to a policeman who just then sauntered along. The policeman nodded acquiescence, and the man, kneeling down, placed his bag beside him. After searching through it, he took out a selection of tools which he produced to lay beside him in orderly fashion. Then he stood up, looked into the keyhole, blew into it, and turning to his employers, made some remark. Lord Godalming smiled, and the man lifted a good-sized bunch of keys. Selecting one of them, he began to probe the lock, as if feeling his way with it. After fumbling about for a bit, he tried a second, and then a third. All at once, the door opened under a slight push from him, and he and the two others entered the hall. We sat still, my own cigar burnt furiously, but Van Helsing's went cold altogether. We waited patiently as we saw the workman come out and bring in his bag. Then he held the door partly open, steadying it with his knees, whilst he fitted a key into the lock. This he finally handed to Lord Godalming, who took out his purse and gave him something. The man touched his hat, took his bag, put on his coat, and departed. Not a soul took the slightest notice of the whole transaction. When the man had fairly gone, we three crossed the street and knocked at the door. It was immediately opened by Quincy Morris, beside whom Lord Godalming, lighting a cigar. The place smells so vilely, said the latter as we came in. It did indeed smell vilely, like the old chapel at Colfax, and with our previous experience it was plain to us that the Count had been using the place pretty freely. We moved to explore the house, all keeping together in case of attack, for we knew we had a strong and wily enemy to deal with and as yet we did not know whether the Count might not be in the house. In the dining room, which lay at the back of the hall, we found eight boxes of earth, eight boxes only out of the nine which we sought. Our work was not over, and it would never be until we have found the missing box. First we opened the shutters of the window, which looked out across a narrow stone-flagged yard at the blank face of a stable, 
pointed to look like the front of a miniature house. There were no windows in it, so we were not afraid of being overlooked. We did not lose any time in examining the chests. With the tools which we had brought with us, we opened them, one by one, and treated them as we had treated those others in the old chapel. It was evident to us that the Count was not at present in the house, and we proceeded to search for any of his effects. After a cursory glance at the rest of the rooms, from basement to attic, we came to the conclusion that the dining room contained any effects which might belong to the Count, and so we proceeded to minutely examine them. There lay in a sort of orderly disorder on the great dining room table. There were title deeds of the Piccadilly house in a great bundle, deeds of the purchase of the house at Mile End and Bermondsey, note paper, envelopes, and pens and ink. All were covered up in thin wrapping paper to keep them from the dust. There were also a clothes brush, a brush and comb, and a jug and basin, the latter containing dirty water which was reddened as if with blood. Last of all was a little heap of keys of all sorts and sizes probably those belonging to the other houses. When we had examined this last find, Lord Godalming and Quincy Morris, taking accurate notes of the various addresses of the houses in the east and the south, took with them the keys in a great bunch and set out to destroy the boxes in these places. The rest of us are, with what patience we can, waiting their return, or the coming of the Count. End of chapter 22 Recording by Corinne LePage Chapter 23 Dr. Seward's Diary 3rd October The time seemed terrible long whilst we were waiting for the coming of Godalming and Quincy Morris. The professor tried to keep our minds active by using them all the time. I could see his beneficent purpose by the side glances which he threw from time to time at Harker. The poor fellow is overwhelmed in a misery that is appalling to see. Last night he was a frank, happy-looking man, with strong, youthful face, full of energy, and with dark brown hair. Today he is a drawn, haggard old man, whose white hair matches well with the hollow burning eyes and grief-written lines of his face. His energy is intact, in fact, he is like a living flame. This may be yet his salvation, for, if it all go well, it will tide him over the despairing period. He will then, in a kind of way, wake again to the realities of life. Poor fellow, I thought my own trouble was bad enough, but his. The professor knows this well enough, and is doing his best to keep his mind active. What he has been saying was, under the circumstances of absorbing interest, so well as I can remember, here it is. I have studied over and over again since they came into my hands all the papers relating to this monster, and the more I have studied, the greater seems the necessity to utterly stamp him out. All through there are signs of his advance, not only of his power, but of his knowledge of it. As I learned from the researches of my friend Arminius of Budapest, he was in life a most wonderful man, soldier, statesman, and alchemist which latter was the highest development of the science knowledge of his time. He had a mighty brain, a learning beyond compare, and a heart that knew no fear and no remorse. He dared even to attend the scholomance, and there was no branch of knowledge in his time that he did not essay. Well, in him the brain power survived the physical death, though it would seem that memory was not all complete. In some faculties of mind he has been, and is, only a child, but he is growing, and some things that were childish at the first are now of man's stature. He is experimenting and doing it well, and if it had not been that we have crossed his path, he would be yet. He may be yet if we fail, the father or furtherer of a new order of beings, whose road must lead through death, not life. Harker groaned and said, And this is all arrayed against my darling. But how is he experimenting? The knowledge may help us to defeat him. He has all along, since his coming, been trying his power, slowly but surely. That big child brain of his is working. Well for us it is, as yet, a child brain, for had he dared, at the first, to attempt certain things, he would, long ago, have been beyond our power. However, he means to succeed, and a man who has centuries before him can afford to wait and to go slow. Festina Lente may well be his motto. 
I fail to understand, said Harker warily. Oh, do be more plain to me. Perhaps grief and trouble are dulling my brain. The professor laid his hand tenderly on his shoulder as he spoke. Ah, my child, I will be plain. Do you not see how, of late, this monster has been creeping into knowledge experimentally, how he has been making use of the zoophagist patient to effect his entry into friend John's home? For your vampire, though in all afterwards he can come when and how he will, must at the first make entry only when asked thereto by an inmate. But these are not his most important experiments. Do we not see how at the first all these so great boxes were moved by others? He knew not then, but that must be so. But all the time that so great child brain of his was growing, and he began to consider whether he might not himself move the box. So he began to help, and then, when he found that this be all right, he tried to move them all alone, and so he progressed, and he scattered these graves of him, and none but he know where they are hidden. He may have intent to bury them deep in the ground, so that he only use them in the night, or at such time as he can change his form. They do him equal well, and none may know these are his hiding place. But, my child, do not despair, this knowledge come to him just too late. Already all of his layers but one be sterilized as for him, and before the sunset this shall be so. Then we have no place where he can move and hide. I delayed this morning so that we might be sure. Is there not more at stake for us than for him? Then why are we not be even more careful than him? By my clock it is one hour, and already, if all be well, friend Arthur and Quincy are on the way to us. Today is our day, and we must go sure, if slow, and lose no chance. See, there are five of us when those absent ones return. Whilst he was speaking, we were startled by a knock at the hall door, the double postman's knock of the telegraph boy. We all moved out to the hall with one impulse, and Van Helsing, holding up his hand to us to keep silence, stepped to the door and opened it. The boy handed the dispatch. The professor closed the door again and, after looking at the direction, opened it and read it aloud. Look out for D. He has just now, 12.45, come from Carfax hurriedly and hastened towards the south. He seems to be going the round and may want to see you. Mina. There was a pause, broken by Jonathan Harker's voice. Now, God be thanked, we shall soon meet. Van Helsing turned to him quickly and said, God will act in his own way and time. Do not fear, and do not rejoice as yet, for what we wish for at the moment may be our undoings. I care for nothing now, he answered haughtily, except to wipe out this brood from the face of creation. I would sell my soul to do it. Oh, hush, hush, my child, said Van Helsing. God does not purchase souls in this wise, and the devil, though he may purchase, does not keep faith. But God is merciful and just, and knows your pain and your devotion to that dear Madame Mina. Think you how her pain would be doubled did she but hear your wild words. Do not fear any of us. We are all devoted to this cause, and today shall see the end. The time is coming for action. Today this vampire is limit to the powers of man, and till sunset he may not change. It will take him time to arrive here. See, it is twenty minutes past one, and there are yet some times before he can hither come, be he never so quick. What we must hope for is that my Lord Arthur and Quincy arrive first. About half an hour after we had received Mrs. Harker's telegram, there came a quiet, resolute knock at the hall door. It was just an ordinary knock, such as is given hourly by the thousands of gentlemen, but it made the professor's heart and mind beat loudly. We looked at each other and together moved out into the hall. We each held ready to use our various armaments, the spiritual in the left hand, the mortal in the right. Van Helsing pulled back the latch and, holding the door half open, stood back, having both hands ready for action. The gladness of our hearts must have shown upon our faces when on the step, close to the door, we saw Lord Godalming and Quincy Morris. They came quickly in and closed the door behind them, the former saying as they moved along the hall, "'Is all right. We found both places, six bones in each, and we destroyed them all.' "'Destroyed?' asked the professor. "'For him.' We were silent for a minute, and then Quincy said, "'There's nothing to do but wait here. If, however, he doesn't turn up by five o'clock, we must start off, for it won't do to leave Mrs. Harker alone after sunset.' "'He will be here before long now,' 
said Van Helsing, who had been consulting his pocketbook. Nota bene, in Madame's telegram, he went south from Carfax. That means he went to cross the river, and he could only do so at slack of tide, which should be something before one o'clock. That he went south has a meaning for us. He is as yet only suspicious, and he went from Carfax first to the place where he would suspect interference least. He must have been at Bermondsey only a short time before him. That he is not here already shows that he went to Mile End next. This took him some time, for he would then have to be carried over the river in some way. Believe me, my friends, we shall not have long to wait now. We should have ready some plan of attack, so that we may throw away no chance. Hush, there is no time now. Have all your arms. Be ready. He held up a warning hand as he spoke, for we could all hear a key softly inserted in the lock of the hall door. I could not but admire, even at such a moment, the way in which a dominant spirit asserted itself. In all our hunting parties and adventures in different parts of the world, Quincy Morris had always been the one to arrange the plan of action, and Arthur and I had been accustomed to obey him implicitly. Now the old habit seemed to be renewed instinctively. With a swift glance around the room, he had once laid out our plan of attack, and without speaking a word, with a gesture, placed us each in position. Van Helsing, Hawk, and I were just behind the door, so that when it opened the professor could guard it whilst we two stepped between the incomer and the door. Godalming behind and Quincy in front stood just out of sight, ready to move in front of the window. We waited in a suspense that made the seconds pass with a nightmare slowness. The slow, careful steps came along the hall. The Count was evidently prepared for some surprise. At least he feared it. Suddenly, with a single bound, he leaped into the room, winning away past us before any of us could raise a hand to stay him. There was something so panther-like in the movement, something so unhuman, that it seemed to sober us all from the shock of his coming. The first to act was Harker, who, with a quick movement, threw himself before the door, leading into the room in front of the house. As the Count saw us, a horrible sort of snarl passed over his face, showing the eye-teeth long and pointed, but the evil smile as quickly passed into a cold stare of lion-like disdain. His expression again changed as, with a single impulse, we all advanced upon him. It was a pity that we had not some better organized plan of attack, for even at the moment I wondered what we were to do. I did not myself know whether our lethal weapons would avail us anything. Harker evidently meant to try the matter, for he had ready his great kukri knife, and made a fierce and sudden cut at him. The blow was a powerful one. Only the diabolical quickness of the Count's leap back saved him, a second less and the trenchant blade had shone through his heart. As it was, the point just cut the cloth of his coat, making a wide gap whence a bundle of banknotes and a stream of gold fell out. The expression of the Count's face was so hellish that for a moment I feared for Harker, though I saw him throw the terrible knife aloft again for another stroke. Instinctively I moved forward with a protective impulse, holding the crucifix and wafer in my left hand. I felt a mighty power fly along my arm, and it was without surprise that I saw the monster cower back before a similar movement made spontaneously by each one of us. It would be impossible to describe the expression of hate and baffled malignity, of anger and hellish rage, which came over the Count's face. His waxen hue became greenish-yellow by the contrast of his burning eyes, and the red scar on the forehead showed on the pallid skin like a palpitating wound. The next instant, with a sinuous dive, he swept under Harker's arm ere his blow could fall, and, grasping a handful of the money from the floor, dashed across the room, threw himself at the window. Amid the crash and glitter of falling glass, he tumbled into the flagged area below. Through the sound of the shivering glass, I could hear that ting of some gold as some of the sovereigns fell on the flagging. We ran over and saw him spring unhurt from the ground. He, rushing up the steps, crossed the flagged yard and pushed open the stable door. There he turned and spoke to us. You think to baffle me, you, with your pale faces all in a row, like sheep in a butcher's. You shall be sorry yet, each one of you. You think you have left me without a place to rest, but I have more. My revenge is just begun. I spread it over centuries, and time is on my side. Your girls that you all love are mine already, and through them you and others shall yet be mine my creatures to do my bidding and to be my jackals when I want to feed. Bah! With a contemptuous sneer, he passed quickly through the door and we heard the rusty bolt creak as he fastened it behind him. A door beyond opened and shut. 
The first of us to speak was the professor, as, realising the difficulty of following him through the stable, we moved towards the hall. We have learnt something, much, notwithstanding his brave words. He fears us. He fear time, he fear want, for if not, why he hurry so? His very tone betray him, or my ears deceive. Why take that money? You follow quick, you are hunters of wild beast, and understand it so. For me, I make sure that nothing here may be of use to him, if so that he return. As he spoke, he put the money remaining into his pocket, took the title deeds in a bundle as Harker had left them, and swept the remaining things into the open fireplace, where he set fire to them with a match. Godalming and Morris had rushed out into the yard, and Harker had lowered himself from the window to follow the Count. He had, however, bolted the stable door, and by the time they had forced it open, there was no sign of him. Van Helsing and I tried to make inquiry at the back of the house, but the muse was deserted, and no one had seen him depart. It was now late in the afternoon, and sunset was not far off. We had to recognise that our game was up. With heavy hearts, we agreed with the professor when he said, Let us go back to Madame Mina. Poor, poor dear Madame Mina, all we can do just now is done, and we can there, at least, protect her. But we need not despair, there is but one more earth box, and we must try to find it. When that is done, all may yet be well. I could see that he spoke as bravely as he could to comfort Harker. The poor fellow was quite broken down. Now and again he gave a low groan which he could not suppress. He was thinking of his wife. With sad hearts we came back to my house where we found Mrs. Harker waiting us, with an appearance of cheerfulness which did honour to her bravery and unselfishness. When she saw our faces, her own became as pale as death. For a second or two her eyes were closed as if she were in secret prayer, and then she said cheerfully, I can never thank you all enough. Oh, my poor darling. As she spoke, she took her husband's grey head in her hands and kissed it. Lay your poor head here and rest it. All will yet be well, dear. God will protect us if he so will it in his good intent. The poor fellow groaned. There was no place for words in his sublime misery. We had a sort of perfunctory supper together, and I think it cheered us all up somewhat. It was, perhaps, the mere animal heat of food to hungry people, for none of us had eaten anything since breakfast. All the sense of companionship may have helped us, but anyhow we were all less miserable, and we saw the morrow as not altogether without hope. True to our promise, we told Mrs. Harker everything which had passed, and although she grew snowy white at times when danger had seemed to threaten her husband, and red at others when his devotion to her was manifested, she listened bravely and with calmness. When we came to the part where Harker had rushed at the Count so recklessly, she clung to her husband's arm and held it tight, as though her clinging could protect him from any harm that might come. She said nothing, however, till the narration was all done, and matters had been brought right up to the present time. Then, without letting go of her husband's hand, she stood up amongst us and spoke. Oh, that I could give any idea of the scene, of that sweet, sweet, good, good woman, in all the radiant beauty of her youth and animation, with the red scar on her forehead, of which she was conscious, and which we saw with grinding of our teeth, remembering whence and how it came, her loving kindness against our grim hate, her tender faith against all our fears and doubting, and we, knowing that, so far as symbols went, she with all her goodness and purity and faith was an outcast from God. Jonathan, she said, and the words sounded like music on her lips, it was so full of love and tenderness. Jonathan, dear, and you all my true, true friends, I want you to bear something in mind through all this dreadful time. I know that you must fight, that you must destroy even as you destroyed the false Lucy, so that the true Lucy might live hereafter. But it is not a work of hate. That poor soul who has wrought all this misery is the saddest case of all. Just think what will be his joy when he too is destroyed in his worse part than his better part may have spiritual immorality. You must be pitiful to him too, though it may not hold your hands from his destruction. As she spoke, I could see her husband's face darken and draw together, as though the passion in him were shriveling his being to its core. Instinctively, the clasp on his wife's hand grew closer, till his knuckles looked white. She did not flinch from the pain which I knew she must have suffered, but looked at him with eyes that were more appealing than ever. As she stopped speaking, he leapt to his feet, almost tearing his hand from hers as he spoke. May God give him into my hand just for long enough to destroy that earthly life of him which we are aiming at. If beyond it I could send his soul forever and ever to burning hell, I would do it. Oh, hush, 
Oh, hush in the name of good God, don't say such things, Jonathan. My husband, or you will crush me with fear and horror. Just think, my dear, I have been thinking all this long, long day of it, that, perhaps some day, I too may need such pity and that some other like you, and with equal cause for anger, may deny it to me. Oh, my husband, my husband, indeed I would have spared you such a thought had there been another way, but I pray that God may not have treasured your wild words, except as the heartbroken wail of a very loving and sorely stricken man. Oh, God, let these poor white hairs go in evidence of what he has suffered, who all his life has done no wrong, and on whom so many sorrows have come. We men were all in tears now. There was no resisting them, and we wept openly. She wept, too, to see that her sweeter counsels had prevailed. Her husband flung himself on his knees beside her, and putting his arms around her, hid his face in the folds of her dress. Van Helsing beckoned to us, and we stole out of the room, leaving the two loving hearts alone with their god. Before they retired, the professor fixed up the room against any coming of the vampire, and assured Mrs. Harker that she might rest in peace. She tried to school herself to the belief, and manifestly, for her husband's sake, tried to seem content. It was a brave struggle, and was, I think and believe, not without its reward. Van Helsing had placed at hand a bell which either of them was to sound in case of any emergency. When they had retired, Quincy Godalming and I arranged that we should sit up, dividing the night between us, and watch over the safety of the poor stricken lady. The first watch falls to Quincy, so the rest of us shall be off to bed as soon as we can. Godalming has already turned in, for his is the second watch. Now that my work is done, I, too, shall go to bed. Jonathan Harker's Journal 3, 4 October, close to midnight. I thought yesterday would never end. There was over me a yearning for sleep, in some sort of blind belief that to wake would be to find things changed and that any change must now be for the better. Before we parted, we discussed what our next step was to be, but we could arrive at no result. All we knew was that one earth box remained, and that the Count alone knew where it was. If he chooses to lie hidden, he may baffle us for years, and in the meantime, the thought is too horrible. I dare not think of it even now. This I know, that if ever there was a woman who was all perfection, that one is my poor wronged darling, I love her a thousand times more for her sweet pity of last night, a pity that made my own hate of the monster seem despicable. Surely God would not permit the world to be the poor by the loss of such a creature. This is hope to me. We are all drifting reefwards now, and faith is our only anchor. Thank God Mina is sleeping, and sleeping without dreams. I fear what her dreams might be like, with such terrible memories to ground them in. She has not been so calm, within my seeing, since the sunset. Then for a while there came over her face a repose, which was like spring after the blasts of March. I thought at the time that it was the softness of the red sunset on her face, but somehow now I think it has a deeper meaning. I'm not sleepy myself, though I am weary, weary to death. However, I must try to sleep, for there is tomorrow to think of, and there is no rest for me until. Later. I must have fallen asleep, for I was awaked by Mina, who was sitting up in bed with a startled look on her face. I could see easily, for if we did not leave the room in darkness, she had placed a warning hand over my mouth, and now she whispered in my ear, Hush, there is someone in the corridor. I got up softly and, crossing the room, gently opened the door. Just outside, stretched on a mattress, lay Mr. Morris, wide awake. He raised a warning hand for silence as he whispered to me, Hush, go back to bed, it is all right. One of us will be here all night. We don't mean to take any chances. His look and gesture forbade discussion, so I came back and told Mina. She sighed and positively a shadow of a smile stole over her poor, pale face as she put her arms around me and said softly, Oh, thank God for good, brave men. With a sigh, she sank back again to sleep. I write this now, as I am not sleepy, though I must try again. 4 October, morning. Once again during the night I was awakened by Mina. This time we had all had a good sleep, for the grey of the coming dawn was making the windows into sharp oblongs, and the gas flame was like a speck rather than a disc of light. She said to me hurriedly, Go, call the professor, I want to see him at once. Why? I asked. I have an idea. I suppose it must have come in the night and matured without my knowing it. He must hypnotise me before the dawn, and then I shall be able to speak. Go quick, dearest, the time is getting close. I went to the door. Dr. Seward was resting on the mattress, and... 
Seeing me, he sprang to his feet. Is anything wrong? he asked in alarm. No, I replied, but Mina wants to see Dr. Van Helsing at once. I will go, he said, and hurried into the professor's room. In two or three minutes later, Van Helsing was in the room in his dressing gown, and Mr. Morris and Lord Godalming were with Dr. Seward at the door asking questions. When the professor saw Mina, a smile, a positive smile, ousted the anxiety of his face. He rubbed his hands as he said, Oh, my dear Madame Mina, this is indeed a change. See, friend Jonathan, we have got our dear Madame Mina, as of old, back to us today. Then, turning to her, he said cheerfully, And what am I do for you? For at this hour you do not want me for nothings. I want you to hypnotize me, she said. Do it before the dawn, for I feel that then I can speak, and speak freely. Be quick, for the time is short. Without a word, he motioned her to sit upon the bed. Looking fixedly at her, he commenced to make passes in front of her, from over the top of her head downward, with each hand in turn. Mina gazed at him fixedly for a few minutes, during which my own heart beat like a trip hammer, for I felt that some crisis was at hand. Gradually her eyes closed, and she sat, stock still. Only by the gentle heaving of her bosom could one know that she was alive. The professor made a few more passes and then stopped, and I could see that his forehead was covered in great beads of perspiration. Mina opened her eyes, but she did not seem the same woman. There was a far away look in her eyes, and her voice had a sad dreaminess which was new to me. Raising his hand to impose silence, the professor motioned me to bring the others in. They came on tiptoe, closing the door behind them, and stood at the foot of the bed, looking on. Mina appeared not to see them. The stillness was broken by Van Helsing's voice, speaking in a low-level tone which would not break the current of her thoughts. Where are you? The answer came in a neutral way. I do not know. Sleep has no place it can call its own. For several minutes there was silence. Mina sat rigid, and the professor stood staring at her fixedly. The rest of us hardly dared to breathe. The room was growing lighter. Without taking his eyes from Mina's face, Dr. Van Helsing motioned me to pull up the blind. I did so, and the day seemed just upon us. A red streak shot up, and a rosy light seemed to diffuse itself through the room. On the instant, the professor spoke again. Where are you now? The answer came dreamily, but with intention. It were as though she were interpreting something. I have heard her use the same tone when reading her shorthand notes. I do not know. It is all strange to me. What do you see? I can see nothing. It is all dark. What do you hear? I could detect the strain in the professor's patient voice. The lapping of water. It is gurgling by, and little waves weep. I can hear them on the outside. Then you are on a ship. We all looked at each other, trying to glean something each from the other. We were afraid to think. The answer came quick. Oh, yes. What else do you hear? The sound of men stamping overhead as they run about. There is the creaking of a chain and a loud tinkle as the check of the capstan falls into the ratchet. What are you doing? I'm still. Oh, so still. It is like death. The voice faded away into a deep breath as of one sleeping, and the open eyes closed again. By this time the sun had risen, and we were all in the full light of day. Dr. Van Helsing placed his hands upon Mina's shoulders and laid her head down softly on her pillow. She lay like a sleeping child for a few moments and then, with a long sigh, awoke and stared in wonder to see us all around her. Have I been talking in my sleep? was all she said. She seemed, however, to know the situation without telling, though she was eager to know what she had told. The professor repeated the conversation and she said, Then there is not a moment to lose. It may not be yet too late. Mr. Morris and Lord Godalming started for the door, but the professor's calm voice called them back. Stay, my friends. That ship wherever it was, was weighing anchor whilst she spoke. There were many ships weighing anchor at the moment on your so great port of London. Which of them is it that you seek? God be thanked that we have once again a clue, but whither it may lead us we do not. We have been blind somewhat, blind after the manner of men, since when we can look back, we see what we might have seen looking forward if we had been able to see what we might have seen. Alas, but that sentence is in a puddle, is it not? We can see now what was in the Count's mind when he sees that money, though Jonathan's so fierce knife put him in the danger that even he dread. He meant escape. Hear me. Escape. He stole that with but one earth box left and a pack of men following like dogs after a fox. This London was no place for him. 
He have to take his last earth box on board a ship, and he leave the land. He think to escape, but no, we follow him. Tally ho, as friend Arthur would say when he put on his red frock. Our old fox is wily, oh so wily. And we must follow with while. I too am wily, and I think his mind in a little while. In meantime, we may rest, and in peace, for there are waters between us which he do not want to pass, and which he could not if he would, unless the ship were to touch the land, and then only at full or slack tide. See, and the sun is just rose, and all day to sunset is to us. Let us take bath and dress and have breakfast which we all need, and have breakfast which we all need, and which we can eat comfortably since he be not in the same land with us. Nina looked at him appealingly as she asked, But why need we seek him further when he's gone away from us? He took her hand and patted it as he replied, Ask me nothing as yet. When we have breakfast, then I answer all questions. He would say no more, and we separated to dress. After breakfast, Mina repeated her question. He looked at her gravely for a minute and then said sorrowfully, Because, my dear, dear Madame Mina, now more than ever must we find him, even if we have to follow him to the jaws of hell. She grew paler as she asked faintly, Why? Because, he answered solemnly, he can live for centuries, and you are but mortal woman. Time is now to be dreaded, since once he put that mark upon your throat. I was just in time to catch her as she fell forward in a faint. End of chapter 23 Recording by Corinne LePage Chapter 24 of Dracula by Bram Stoker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Corinne LePage. Chapter 24 Dr. Seward's Phonograph Diary, spoken by Van Helsing. This to Jonathan Harker. You are to stay with your dear Madame Mina. We shall go to make our search, if I can call it so, for it is not search but knowing, and we seek confirmation only. But do you stay and take care of her today? This is your best and most holiest office. This day nothing can find him here. Let me tell you that you will know what we four know already, for I tell them. He, our enemy, have gone away. He have gone back to his castle in Transylvania. I know it so well that if a great hand of fire wrote it on the ball, he have prepared for this in some way and that last earth box was ready to ship some fares. For this he took the money. For this he hurried at the last, lest we catch him before the sun go down. It was his last hope, save that he might hide in the tomb that he think poor Miss Lucy, being as he thought like him, keep open to him. But there was not of time, when he fears that he makes straight for his last resource. His last earthwork might say, did I wish double entente. He is so clever, oh so clever. He knows that his game here was finished, and so he decided to go back home. He finds ship going by the route he came, and he go in it. We go off now to find that ship, and whither bound. When we have discovered that, we come back and tell you all. Then we will comfort you and poor dear Madame Mina with new hope. For it will be hope when you think it over, that all is not lost. This very creature that we pursue, he take hundreds of years to get so far as London, and yet in one day, when we know of the disposal of him, we drive him out. He is finite, so he is powerful to do much harm and suffers not as we do. But we are strong, each in our purpose, and we are all more strong together. Take heart afresh, dear husband of Madame Mina. This battle is but begun, and in the end we shall win. So sure as that God sits on high to watch over his children. Therefore, be of much comfort till we return. Van Helsing Jonathan Harker's Journal 4 October When I read to Mina Van Helsing's message in the phonograph, the poor girl brightened up considerably. Already the certainty that the Count is out of the country has given her comfort, and comfort is strength to her. 
For my own part, now that his horrible danger is not face to face with us, it seems almost impossible to believe in it. Even my own terrible experiences in Castle Dracula seem like a long-forgotten dream. Here, in the crisp autumn air, in the bright sunlight. Alas! How can I disbelieve? In the midst of my thought my eye fell on the red scar on my poor darling's white forehead. Whilst that lasts, there can be no disbelief, and afterwards the very memory of it will keep faith crystal clear. Mina and I fear to be idle, so we have been all over the diaries again and again. Somehow, although the reality seems greater each time, the pain and fear seem less. There is something of a guiding purpose manifest throughout which is comforting. Mina says that perhaps we are the instruments of ultimate good. It may be. I shall try to think as she does. We have never spoken to each other yet of the future. It is better to wait till we see the professor and the others after the investigations. The day is running by more quickly than I ever thought a day could run for me again. It is now three o'clock. Mina Harker's Journal 5 October, 5 p.m. Our meeting for report. Present, Professor Van Helsing, Lord Godalming, Dr. Seward, Mr. Quincy Morris, Jonathan Harker, Mina Harker. Dr. Van Helsing described what steps were taken during the day to discover on what boat, and with a bound, Count Dracula made his escape. As I knew that he wanted to get back to Transylvania, I felt sure that he must go by the Danube mouth, or by somewhere in the Black Sea, since by that way he come. It was a dreary blank that was before us, omne ignotium pro magnifico. And so, with heavy hearts, we start to find what ships leave for the Black Sea last night. He was in sailing ship, since Madame Mina tell of sails being set. These not so important as to go in your list of the shipping in the Times, and so we go, by suggestion of Lord Goodalming, to your Lloyds, which are note of all ships that sail, however so small. There we find that only one Black Sea-bound ship go out with the tide. She is the Tsarina Catherine, and she sail from Doolittle's Wharf for Varna, and thence on to other parts and up the Danube. So, said I, this is the ship whereon is the Count. So off we go to Doolittle's Wharf, and there we find a man in an office of wood so small that the man look bigger than the office. From him we inquire of the goings-on of the Tsarina Catherine, he swear much, and he red face and loud of voice, but he good fellow all the same. And when Quincy gave him something from his pocket, which crackle as he roll it up, and put it in a so small bag, which he have hid deep in his clothing, he still better fellow and humble servant to us. He come with us, and ask many men who are rough and hot. These be better fellows too, when they have been no more thirsty. They say much of blood and bloom, and of others which I comprehend not, though I guess what they mean. But nevertheless, they tell us things which we want to know. They make known to us among them how last afternoon at about five o'clock comes a man so hairy, a tall man, thin and pale, with high nose and teeth so white and eyes that seem to be burning, that he be all in black except he have a hat of straw which not suit him nor the sails for the Black Sea and for wear. Some took him to the office and then to the ship, where he will not go aboard, but halt at shore at end of gangplank, and ask the captain, come to him. The captain come, when told he will be pay well, and though he swear much at first, he agreed to turn. Then the thin man go, and someone tell him where horse and cart can be hired. He go there, and soon he come again, himself driving cart on which a great box. This he himself lift down, though it takes several, to put it on truck for the ship. He give much talk to captain as to how and where his box is to be placed, but the captain like it not and swear at him in many tongues, and tell him that if he like, he can come and see where it shall be. But he say, no, that he come not yet, for that he have much to do, whereupon the captain tell him that he had better be quick, with blood, for that his ship will leave the place of blood before the turn of the tide, with blood. Then the thin man smile and say that, of course, he must go when he think fit. But he will be surprised if he go quite so soon. The captain swear again, polyglot, and the thin man make him bow and thank him, and say he will so far intrude on his kindness as to come aboard before sailing. Final, the captain, more red than ever, and in more tongues tell him that he doesn't want no Frenchman, with bloom upon them, and also with blood, on his ship, with blood on her also, 
and so after asking where there might be close at hand a ship where he might purchase ship forms, he departed. No one knew where he went or Blumen were cared, as they said, for they had something else to think of, well with blood again, for it soon became apparent to all that the Tsarina Catherine would not sail as was expected. A thin mist began to creep up from the river, and it grew and grew, till soon a dense fog enveloped the ship and all around her. The captain swore polyglot, very polyglot, polyglot with bloom and blood, but he could do nothing. The water rose and rose, and he began to fear that he would lose the tide altogether. He was in no friendly mood, when just at full tide, the thin man came up the gangplank again and asked to see where his box had been stowed. Then the captain replied that he wished he and his box, old and with much bloom and blood, were in hell. But the thin man did not be offend, and went down with the mate and saw where it was placed, and came up and stood a while on deck in fog. He must have come off by himself, for none noticed him. Indeed, they thought not of him, for soon the fog began to melt away, and all was clear again. My friends of the thirst, and the language that was of bloom and blood laughed, as they told how the captain swears exceeded even his usual polyglot, and was more than ever full of picturesque, when on questioning other mariners who were on movement up and down on the river that hour, he found that few of them had seen any fog at all, except where it lay around the wharf. However, the ship went out on the ebb tide, and was doubtless by morning far down the river mouth. She was by then, when they told us, well out to sea. And so... My dear Madame Mina, it is that we have to rest for a time, for our enemy is on the sea, with the fog at his command, on his way to the Danube mouth. To sail a ship takes time, go she never so quick, and then we start, we go on land more quick, and we meet him there. Our best hope is to come on him when in the box between sunrise and sunset, for then he can make no struggle, and we may deal with him as we should. There are days for us in which we can make ready our plan. We know all about where he go, for we have seen the owner of the ship, who have shown us invoices and all papers that can be. The box we seek is to be landed in Varna and be given to an agent, one Ristix, who will there present his credentials, and so our merchant friend will have done his part. But he asked if there be any wrong for that so he can telegraph and have inquiry made at Varna. We say no, for what is to be done is not for police or other customs. We must be done by us alone and in our own way. When Dr. Van Helsing had done speaking, I asked him if he were certain that the Count had remained on board the ship. He replied, We have the best proof of that, your own evidence, when in the hypnotic trance this morning. I asked him again if it were really necessary that they should pursue the Count for, Oh, I read Jonathan leaving me and I know that he would surely go if the others went. He answered in growing passion, at first quietly. As he went on, however, he grew more angry and more forceful, till, in the end, we could not but see wherein was at least some of the personal dominance which made him so long a master amongst men. Yes, it is necessary. Necessary. Necessary, for your sake in the first, and then for the sake of humanity. This monster has done much harm already in the narrow scope where he find himself, and in the short time when as yet he was only as a body groping his so small measure in darkness and not knowing. All this I have told these others. You, my dear Madame Mina, will learn it on the phonograph of my friend John, or in that of your husband. I have told them how the measure of leaving his own barren land, barren of peoples, and coming to a new land where life of man teems, till they are like the multitude of standing corn, was the work of centuries. Were another of the undead like him to try to do what he has done, perhaps not all the centuries of the world that have been, or that will be, could aid him. With this one, all the forces of nature that are occult and deep and strong must have worked together in some wondrous way. The very place where he have been alive, undead for all these centuries, is full of strangeness of the geologic and chemical world. There are deep caverns and fissures that reach none nor whither. There have been volcanoes, some of whom's openings still send out waters of strange properties and gases that kill or make to vivify. Doubtless there is something magnetic or electric 
in some of these combinations of occult forces which work for physical life, in strange way, and in himself, were from the first some great qualities. In a hard and warlike time, he was a celebrate that he have more iron nerve, more subtle brain, more braver heart than any man. In him some vital principle have in strange way found their utmost, and as his body keep strong and grow and thrive, so his brain grow too. All this without that diabolical aid which is surely to him, for it have to yield to the powers that come from, and are symbolic of good. And now this is what he is to us. He have infect you. Oh, forgive me, my dear, that I must say such, but it is for good of you that I speak. He infect you in such wise that, even if he do no more, you have only to live, to live your own old sweet way, and so in time death, which is of man's common lot with God's sanction, shall make you like to him. This must not be. We have sworn together that it must not. Thus we are ministers of God's own wish, that the world, and man for whom his son die, will not be given over to monsters, whose very existence would defame him. He have allowed us to redeem one soul already, and we go out as the old knights of the cross to redeem more. Like them, we shall travel towards the sunrise, and like them, if we fall, we fall in good cause. He paused, and I said, But will not the Count take his rebuff wisely? Since he has been driven from England, will he not avoid it, as a tiger does the village from which he has been hunted? Aha, he said, Your smile of the tiger good for me, and I shall adopt him. Your man-eater, as they of India call the tiger, who has once tasted the blood of the human, care no more for the other prey, but prowl unceasingly till he get him. This that we hunt from our village is a tiger too, a man-eater, and he never cease to prowl. Nay, in himself, he is not one to retire and stay afar. In his life, his living life, he go over the Turkey frontier and attack his enemy on his own ground. He be beaten back, but did he stay? No, he come again and again and again. Look at his persistence and endurance. With the child brain that was to him, he have long since conceived the idea of coming to a great city. What does he do? He find out the place of all the world most of promise for him. Then he deliberately set himself down to prepare for the task. He find in patience just how is his strength and what are his powers. He study new tongues. He learn new social life, new environment of old ways, the politic, the law, the finance, the science, the habit of a new land, and have a new people who have come to be since he was. His glimpse that he have had, what his appetite only, and in keen his desire. Nay, it help him to grow as to his brain, for it all proved to him how right he was at the first in his surmises. He have done this alone, all alone, from a ruined tomb in a forgotten land. What more may he not do when the greater world of thought is open to him, that he can smile at death as we know him, who can flourish in the midst of diseases that kills off whole peoples. Oh, if such an one was to come from God, and not the devil, what a force for good might he not be in this old world of ours. But we are pledged to set the world free. Our toil must be in silence, and our efforts all in secret. For in this enlightened age, when men believe not even what they see, the doubting of wise man would be his greatest strength. It would be at once his sheath and his armour, and his weapons to destroy us, his enemies, who are willing to peril even our own souls for the safety of one we love, for the good of mankind and for the honour and glory of God. After a general discussion, it was determined that for tonight nothing be definitely settled, that we should all sleep on the facts and try to think out the proper conclusions. Tomorrow, at breakfast, we are to meet again, and, after making our conclusions known to one another, we shall decide on some definite cause of action. I feel a wonderful peace and rest tonight. It is as if some haunting presence were removed from me, perhaps. My surmise was not finished, could not be, for I caught sight in the mirror the red mark upon my forehead, and I knew that I was still unclean. Dr. Seward's Diary 5 October we all rose early, and I think that sleep did much for each and all of us. 
When we met at early breakfast, there was more general cheerfulness than any of us had ever expected to experience again. It is really wonderful how much resilience there is in human nature. Let any obstructing cause, no matter what, be removed in any way, even by death, and we fly back to the first principles of hope and enjoyment. More than once we sat around the table, my eyes opened in wonder whether the whole of the past days had not been a dream. It was only when I caught sight of the red blotch on Mrs. Harker's forehead that I was brought back to reality. Even now, when I am gravely revolting the matter, it is almost impossible to realize that the cause of all our troubles is still existent. Even Mrs. Harker seems to lose sight of her trouble for whole spells. It is only now and again, when something recalls to her mind, that she thinks of her terrible scar. We are to meet here in my study in half an hour and decide on our course of action. I see only one immediate difficulty. I know it by instinct rather than reason. We shall all have to speak frankly, and yet I fear that in some mysterious way poor Mrs. Harker's tongue is tied. I know that she forms conclusions of her own, and from all that has been I can guess how brilliant and how true they must be, but she will not, or cannot, give them utterance. I have mentioned this to Van Helsing, and he and I are to talk it over when we are alone. I suppose it is some of that horrid poison which has got into her veins beginning to work. The Count had his own purposes when he gave her what Van Helsing called the vampire's baptism of blood. Well, there may be a poison that distills itself out of good things. In an age when the existence of Tomains is a mystery, we should not wonder at anything. One thing I know, that if my instinct be true regarding poor Mrs. Harker's silences, then there is a terrible difficulty, an unknown danger in the work before us. The same power that compels her silence may compel her speech. I dare not think further. For so I should in my thoughts dishonor a noble woman. Van Helsing is coming to my study a little before the others. I shall try to open the subject with him. Later. When the professor came in, we talked over the state of things. I could see that he had something on his mind which he wanted to say, but felt some hesitancy in broaching the subject. After beating about the bush a little, he said suddenly, Friend John, there is something that you and I must talk of alone, just at the first in any rate. Later, we may have to take the others into our confidence. Then he stopped, so I waited. He went on. Madame Mina, our poor dear Madame Mina is changing. A cold shiver ran through me to find my worst fears thus endorsed. Van Helsing continued. With the sad experience of Miss Lucy, we must this time be warned before things go too far. Our task is now, in reality, more difficult than ever, and this new trouble makes every hour of the direst importance. I can see the characteristics of the vampire coming in her face. It is now but very, very slight, but it is to be seen if we have eyes to notice without to prejudge. Her teeth are some sharper, and at times her eyes more hard, but these are not all. There is to her the silence now often, as so it was with Miss Lucy. She did not speak, even when she wrote that which she wished to be known later. Now my fear is this. If it be, she can, by a hypnotic trance, tell what the Count see and hear. Is it not more true that he who have hypnotized her first, and who have drink of her very blood, and make her drink of his, should, if he will, compel her mind to disclose to him that which she know. I nodded acquiescence, he went on. Then what we must do is to prevent this. We must keep her ignorant of our intent, and so she cannot tell what she know not. This is a painful task, oh, so painful that it heartbreak me to think of. But it must be. When today we meet, I must tell her that for reason which we will not to speak, she must not more be of our counsel but be simply guarded by us. He wiped his forehead, which had broken out in profuse perspiration, at the thought of the pain which he might have to inflict upon the poor soul already so tortured. I knew that it would be some sort of comfort to him if I told him that I also had come to the same conclusion, for at any rate, it would take away the pain of doubt. I told him, and the effect was as I expected. It is now close to the time of our general gathering. Van Helsing has gone away to prepare for the meeting, and his painful part of it. I really believe his purpose is to be able to pray alone. Later, at the very outset of our meeting, a great personal relief was experienced by both Van Helsing and myself. Mrs. Harker had sent a message by her husband to say she would not join us at present, as she thought it better that we should be free to discuss our movements without a presence to embarrass us. The professor and I looked at each other for an instant, and somehow we both seemed relieved. 
For my own part, I thought that if Mrs. Harker realized the danger herself, it was much pain as well as much danger averted. Under the circumstances we agreed, by a questioning look and answer, with finger on lip to preserve the silence in our suspicions. Until we should have been able to confer alone again, we went at once into our plan of campaign, Van Helsing roughly put the facts before us first. The Tsarina Catherine left the Thames yesterday morning. It will take her, at the quickest speed she has ever made, at least three weeks to reach Varna. But we can travel over land to the same place in three days. Now, if we allow for two days less for the ship's voyage, owing to such weather influences as we know that the Count can bring to bear, and if we allow a whole day and night for any delays which may occur to us, then we have a margin of nearly two weeks. Thus, in order to be quite safe, we must leave here on 17th at latest. Then we shall at any rate be in Varna a day before the ship arrives, and able to make such preparations as may be necessary. Of course, we shall go armed. Armed against evil things spiritual as well as physical. Here Quincy Morris added, I understand that the Count comes from a wolf country, and it may be that he shall get there before us. I propose that we add Winchesters to our armament. I have a kind of belief in a Winchester when there is any trouble of that sort around. Do you remember, Art, when we had the pack after us in Tobolsk? What wouldn't we have given then for a repeater apiece? Good, said Van Helsing. Winchesters it shall be. Quincy's head is level at all times, but most so when there is to hunt, metaphor be more dishonor to science than wolves be of danger to man. In the meantime, we can do nothing here, and as I think that Varna is not familiar to any of us, why not go there more soon? It is as long to wait here as there. Tonight and tomorrow we can get ready, and then, if all be well, we four can set out on our journey. We four, said Harker interrogatively, looking from one to the other of us. Of course, answered the professor quickly, you must remain to take care of your so sweet wife. Harker was silent for a while, and then said in a hollow voice, Let us talk of that part of it in the morning. I want to consult with Mina. I thought that now was the time for Van Helsing to warn him not to disclose our plans to her, but he took no notice. I looked at him significantly and coughed. For answer, he put his finger on his lips and turned away. Jonathan Harker's Journal 5 October Afternoon For some time after our meeting this morning I could not think. The new phases of things leave my mind in a state of wonder which allows no room for active thought. Mina's determination not to take her part in the discussion set me thinking, and as I could not argue the matter with her, I could only guess. I am as far as ever from a solution now. The way the others received it, too, puzzled me. The last time we talked of the subject, we agreed that there was to be no more concealment of anything amongst us. Mina is sleeping now, calmly and sweetly like a little child. Her lips are curved and her face beams with happiness. Thank God there are such moments still for her. Later. How strange it all is. I sat watching Mina's happy sleep, and came as near to being happy myself as I suppose I shall ever be. As the evening drew on, and the earth took its shadows from the sun sinking lower, the silence of the room grew more and more solemn to me. All at once, Mina opened her eyes, and looking at me tenderly, said, Jonathan, I want you to promise me something, on your word of honour. A promise made to me, but made holily, in God's hearing, and not to be broken, though I should go down on my knees and implore you with bitter tears. Quick, you must make it to me at once. Mina, I said, a promise like that, I cannot make at once. I may have no right to make it. But, dear one, she said, with such spiritual intensity that her eyes were like pole stars. It is I who wish it, and it is not for myself. You can ask Dr. Van Helsing if I am not right. If he disagrees, you may do as you will. Nay more, if you all agree, later you are absolved from the promise. I promise, I said, and for a moment she looked supremely happy, though to me all happiness for her was denied by the red scar on her forehead. She said, Promise me that you will not tell me anything of the plans formed for the campaign against the Count, not by word, or inference, or implication, not at any time whilst this remains to me. And she solemnly pointed to the scar. I saw that she was in earnest and said solemnly, I promise. And as I said it, I felt that from that instant a door had been shut between us. Later, midnight. Mina has been bright and cheerful all the evening, so much so that all the rest seemed to take courage, as if infected somewhat by her gaiety. 
As a result, even I myself felt as if the pall of gloom which weighs us down was somewhat lifted. We all retired early. Mina is now sleeping like a little child. It is a wonderful thing that her faculty of sleep remains to her in the midst of her terrible trouble. Thank God for it, for then at least she can forget her care. Perhaps her example may affect me as her gaiety did tonight. I shall try it. Oh, for a dreamless sleep. 6 October, morning. Another surprise. Mina woke me early, about the same time as yesterday, to ask me to bring Dr. Van Helsing. I thought that it was another occasion for hypnotism, and without question went for the professor. He had evidently expected some such call, for I found him dressed in his room. His door was ajar, so that he could hear the opening of the door of our room. He came at once. As he passed into the room, he asked Mina if the others might come too. No, she said quite simply. It will not be necessary. You can tell them just as well. I must go with you on your journey. Dr. Van Helsing was as startled as I was. After a moment's pause, he asked, But why? You must take me with you. I am safer with you, and you shall be safer too. But why, dear Madame Mina, you know that your safety is our solemnest duty. We go into danger, to which you are, or may be, more liable than any of us from, from circumstances, things that have been. He paused, embarrassed. As she replied, she raised her finger and pointed to her forehead. I know. That is why I must go. I can tell you now, whilst the sun is coming up, I may not be able again. I know that when the Count wills me, I must go. I know that if he tells me to come in secret, I must come by while, by any device to hoodwink, even Jonathan. God saw the look that she turned on me as she spoke. And if there be indeed a recording angel, that look is noted to an everlasting honour. I could only clasp her hand. I could not speak. My emotion was too great for even the relief of tears. She went on. You men are brave and strong. You are strong in your numbers. For you can defy that which would break down the human endurance of one who had to guard alone. Besides, I may be of service, since you can hypnotize me and so learn that which even I myself do not know. Dr. Van Helsing said very gravely, Madame Mina, you are, as always, most wise. You shall with us come and together we shall do that which we go forth to achieve. When he had spoken, Mina's long spell of silence made me look at her. She had fallen back on a pillow asleep. She did not even wake when I had pulled up the blind and let in the sunlight which flooded the room. Van Helsing motioned to me to come with him quietly. We went to his room, and within a minute, Lord Godalming, Dr. Seward, and Mr. Morris were with us also. He told them what Mina had said and went on. In the morning, we shall leave for Varna. We have now to deal with a new factor, Madame Mina. Oh, but her soul is true. It is to her agony to tell her so much as she has done. But it is most right, and we are warned in time. There must be no chance lost, and in Varna, we must be ready to act the instant that the ship arrives. What shall we do exactly? asked Mr. Morris laconically. The professor paused before replying. We shall at the first board that ship. Then, when we have identified the box... We shall place a branch of the wild rose on it. This we shall fasten, for when it is there, none can emerge. So at least says superstition. And so superstition must we trust at the first. It was man's faith in the early, and it have its root in faith still. Then, when we get the opportunity that we seek, when none are near to see, we shall open the box and... and all will be well. I shall not wait for any opportunity, said Morris. When I see the box, I shall open it and destroy the monster, though there were a thousand men looking on, and if I am to be wiped out for it next moment. I grasped his hand instinctively and found it as firm as a piece of steel. I think he understood my look. I hope he did. Good boy, said Dr. Van Helsing. Brave boy. Quincy is old man. God bless him for it. My child, believe me, none of us shall lag behind or pause from any fear. I do but say what we may do, what we must do, but indeed, indeed we cannot say what we shall do. There are so many things which may happen, and their ways and their ends are so various, that until the moment we may not say. We shall be armed in all ways, and when the time for the end has come, our effort shall not be lack. Now let us today put all our affairs in order. Let all things which touch on others dear to us, and who upon us depend be complete, for none of us can tell what 
or when or how the end may be. As for me, my own affairs are regulate, and I have nothing else to do. I shall go make arrangements for the travel. I shall have all tickets and so forth for our journey. There was nothing further to be said, and we parted. I shall now settle up all my affairs of earth and be ready for whatever may come. Later. It is all done. My will is made and all complete. Mina, if she survive, is my sole heir. If it should not be so, then the others who have been so good to us shall have remainder. It is now drawing towards the sunset. Mina's uneasiness calls my attention to it. I am sure that there is something on her mind which the time of exact sunset will reveal. These occasions are becoming harrowing times for us all, for each sunrise and sunset opens up some new danger, some new path, which, however, may in God's will be means to a good end. I write all these things in the diary, since my darling must not hear them now. But if it may be that she can see them again, they shall be ready. She is calling to me. End of chapter 24 Recording by Corinne LePage Chapter 25 of Dracula by Bram Stoker This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Corinne LePage Chapter 25 Dr. Seward's Diary 11 October evening Jonathan Arker has asked me to note this, as he says he's hardly equal to the task, and he wants an exact record kept. I think that none of us were surprised when we were asked to see Mrs. Harker a little before the time of sunset. We have come late to understand that sunrise and sunset are to her times of peculiar freedom, when our old self can be manifest without any controlling force subduing or restraining her, or inciting her to action. This mood or condition begins some half hour or more before actual sunrise or sunset, and lasts till either the sun is high or whilst the clouds are still aglow with the rays of streaming above the horizon. At first there is a sort of negative condition, as if some tie were loosened, and then the absolute freedom quickly follows. Then, however, the freedom ceases, the change back or relapse comes quickly, preceded by only a spell of warning silence. Tonight, when we met, she was somewhat constrained, and bore all the signs of an internal struggle. I put it down myself to her making a violent effort at the earliest instant she could do so. A very few minutes, however, gave her complete control of herself. Then, motioning to her husband to sit beside her on the sofa, where she was half reclining, she made the rest of us bring chairs up close taking her husband's hand in hers, began, We are all here together in freedom, for perhaps the last time. I know, dear, I know that you will always be with me till the end. This was to her husband, whose hand had, as we could see, tightened upon hers. In the morning we go out upon our task, and God alone knows what may be in store for any of us. You are going to be so good to me as to take me with you. I know that all that brave, earnest men can do for a poor, weak woman, whose soul perhaps is lost. No, no, not yet, but is at any rate at stake. You will do. But you must remember that I am not as you are. There is a poison in my blood, in my soul, which may destroy me, which must destroy me unless some relief comes to us. Oh, my friends, you know as well as I do that my soul is at stake and... Though I know that there is one way out for me, you must not, and I must not take it. She looked appealingly to us all in turn, beginning and ending with her husband. What is that way? asked Van Helsing in a hoarse voice. That is that way, which we must not, may not, take. That I may die now, either by my own hand, or that of another, before the greater evil is entirely wrought. I know and you know that were I once dead, you could and would set free my immortal spirit, even as you did my poor Lucy's. Were death, or the fear of death, the only thing that stood in the way, I would not shrink to die here, now, amidst the friends who love me. But death is not all. I cannot believe that to die in such a case, when there is hope before us and a bitter task to be done, is God's will. Therefore I, on my part, Give up here and the certainty of eternal rest, and go out into the dark where may be the blackest things that the world 
or the nether world holds. We were all silent, for we knew instinctively that this was only a prelude. The faces of the others were set, and Harker's grew ashen grey. Perhaps he guessed better than any of us what was coming. She continued. This is what I can give into the hot pot. I could not but note the quaint legal phrase which she used in such a place, and with all seriousness. What will each of you give? Your lives, I know. She went on quickly. That is easy for brave men. Your lives are God's, and you can give them back to him. But what will you give to me? She looked again questioningly, but this time avoided her husband's face. Quincy seemed to understand. He nodded, and her face lit up. Then I shall tell you plainly what I want, for there must be no doubtful manner in this connection between us now. You must promise me, one and all, even you, my beloved husband, that should the time come, you will kill me. What is that time? The voice was Quincy's, but it was low and strained. When you shall be convinced that I am so changed that it is better that I die than I may live. When I am thus dead in the flesh, then you will, without a moment's delay, drive a stake through me and cut off my head, or do whatever else may be wanting to give me rest. Quincy was the first to rise after the pause. He knelt down before her and, taking her hand in his, said solemnly, I'm only a rough fellow, who hasn't perhaps lived, as a man should, to win such a distinction, but I swear to you by all that I hold sacred and dear that, should the time ever come, I shall not flinch from the duty that you have set us, and I promise you, too, that I shall make all certain, for if I am only doubtful, I shall take it that the time has come. My true friend, was all she could say amidst her fast-falling tears, as, bending over, she kissed his hand. I swear the same, my dear Madame Mina, said Van Helsing. And I, said Lord Godalming, each of them in turn kneeling to her to take the oath, I followed myself. Then her husband turned to her, worn-eyed, and with a greenish pallor which subdued the snowy whiteness of his hair, and asked, And must I, too, make such a promise, O oh, my wife? You too, my dearest, she said, with infinite yearning of pity in her voice and eyes. You must not shrink. You are nearest and dearest all the world to me. Our souls are knit into one, for all life and all time. Think, dear, that there have been times when brave men have killed their wives and their womankind to keep them from falling into the hands of the enemy. Their hands did not falter any the more because those they loved implored them to slay them. It is men's duty towards those whom they love, in such times of sore trial, and oh, my dear, if it is to be that I must meet death at any hand, let it be at the hand of him that loves me best. Dr. Van Helsing, I have not forgotten your mercy in poor Lucy's case to him who loved. She stopped with a flying blush and changed her phrase. To him who had best right to give her peace. If that time shall come again, I look to you to make it a happy memory of my husband's life, that it was his loving hand which set me free from the awful thrall upon me. Again, I swear, came the professor's resonant voice. Mrs. Harker smiled, positively smiled. As with a sigh of relief, she leaned back and said, And now, one word of warning. A warning which you must never forget, this time, if it ever come, may come quickly and unexpectedly, and in such case you must lose no time in using your opportunity. At such a time I myself may be, nay, if the time ever comes, shall be, leagued with your enemy against you. One more request. She became very solemn as she said this. It is not vital and necessary like the other, but I want you to do one thing for me, if you will. We all acquiesced, but no one spoke. There was no need to speak. I want you to read the burial service. She was interrupted by a deep groan from her husband. Taking his hand in hers, she held it over her heart and continued. You must read it over me some day. Whatever may be the issue of all this fearful state of things, it will be a sweet thought to all or some of us. You, my dearest, will I hope read it, for then it will be in your voice in my memory for ever, come what may. But, oh, my dear one, he pleaded, death is afar off from you. Nay, she said, holding up a warning hand. I am deeper in death at this moment than if the weight of an earthly grave lay heavy upon me. 
Oh, my wife, must I read it? He said before he began. It would comfort me, my husband, was all she said, and he began to read when she had got the book ready. How can I, how could anyone, tell of that strange scene, its solemnity, its gloom, its sadness, its horror, and withal, its sweetness? Even a sceptic, who can see nothing but a travesty of bitter truth in anything holy or emotional, would have been melted to the heart had he seen that little group of loving and devoted friends kneeling round that stricken and sorrowing lady, or heard the tender passion of her husband's voice, as in tones so broken with emotion that often he had to pause. He read that simple and beautiful service from the burial of the dead. I, I cannot go on words and voice. Fail me. She was right in her instinct. Strange as it all was, bizarre as it may hereafter seem to us who have felt its potent influence at the time, it comforted us much. And the silence, which showed Mrs. Harker's coming relapse from her freedom of soul, did not seem so full of despair to any of us as we had dreaded. Jonathan Harker's Journal 15 October, Varna we left Charing Cross on the morning of the 12th, got to Paris at the same night, and took the places secured for us in the Orient Express. We travelled night and day, arriving here about five o'clock. Lord Godalming went to the consulate to see if any telegram had arrived for him, whilst the rest of us came on to this hotel. The Odysseus. The journey may have had incidents. I was, however, too eager to get on to care for them. Until the Tsarina Catherine comes into port, there will be no interest for me in anything in the wide world. Thank God, Mina is well, and looks to be getting stronger. Her colour is coming back. She sleeps a great deal. Throughout the journey, she slept nearly all the time. Before sunrise and sunset, however, she is very wakeful and alert. It has become a habit for Van Helsing to hypnotise her at such times. At first, some effort was needed, and he had to make many passes, but now she seems to yield at once, as if by habit, and scarcely any action is needed. He seems to have power at these particular moments, to simply will and her thoughts obey him. He always asks her what she can see and hear. She answers to the first, nothing, all is dark, and to the second, I can hear the waves lapping against the ship and the water rushing by. Canvas and cordage strain and masts and yards creak. The wind is high, and I can hear it in the shrouds and the bow throws back the foam. It is evident that Tsarina is still at sea hastening on her way to Varna. Lord Godalming has just returned. He had four telegrams, one each day since we arrived, and all to the same effect, that the Tsarina Catherine had not yet been reported to Lloyd's from anywhere. He had arranged before leaving London that his agents should send him every day a telegram saying if the ship had been reported. He was to have a message even if she were not reported, so that he might be sure that there was a watch being kept at the other end of the wire. We had dinner and went to bed early, Tomorrow we are to see the vice-consul, and to arrange, if we can, about getting on board the ship as soon as she arrives. Van Helsing says that our chance will be to get on the boat between sunrise and sunset. The Count, even if he takes the form of a bat, cannot cross the running water of his own volition, and so cannot leave the ship. As he dare not change to man's form without suspicion, which he evidently wishes to avoid, he must remain in the box. If, then, we can come on board after sunrise, he is at our mercy." or if we can open the box and make sure of him, as we did of poor Lucy, before he wakes. What mercy he shall get from us will not count for much. We think that we shall not have much trouble with the officials or the seamen. Thank God, this is the country where bribery can do anything, and we are well supplied with money. We have only to make sure that the ship cannot come into port between sunset and sunrise without our being warned, and we shall be safe. Judge Moneybag will settle this case, I think. 16 October. Mina's report, still the same. Lapping waves and rushing water, darkness and favouring winds. We are evidently in good time, and when we hear of the Tsarina Catherine, we shall be ready. As she must pass the Dardanelles, we are sure to have some report. 17 October. Everything is pretty well fixed now, I think, to welcome the Count on his return from his tour. Godalming told the shippers that he fancied that the box sent abroad might contain something stolen from a friend of his and got a half-consent that he might open it at his own risk. The owner gave them a paper telling the captain to give him every facility in doing whatever he chose to board on the ship and also a similar authorization to his agent at Varna. 
We have seen the agent, who was much impressed with Godalming's kindly manner to him, and we are all satisfied that whatever he can do to aid our wishes will be done. We have already arranged what to do in case we get the box open. If the Count is there, Van Helsing and Seward will cut off his head at once and drive a stake through his heart. Morris and Godalming and I shall prevent interference, even if we have to use the arms which we shall have ready. The professor says that if we can so treat the Count's body, it will soon fall into dust. In such case, there would be no evidence against us, in case any suspicion of murder were aroused. But even if it were not, it should stand or fall by our act, and perhaps some day this very script may be evidence to come between some of us and a rope. For myself, I should take the chance only too thankfully if it were to come. We mean to leave no stone unturned to carry out our intent. We have arranged with certain officials that the instant the Tsarina Catherine is seen, we are to be informed by a special messenger. 24 October. A whole week of waiting. Daily telegrams to Godalming, but only the same story. Not yet reported. Mina's morning and evening hypnotic answer is unvaried. Lapping waves, rushing water, and creaking masts. Telegram, October 24th. Rufus Smith, Lloyds, London, to Lord Godalming, care of HBM, Vice Consul, Varna. Zarina Catherine reported this morning from Dardanelles. Dr. Seward's Diary. 25 October. How I miss my phonograph. To write a diary with a pen is irksome to me. But Van Helsing says I must. We were all wild with excitement yesterday when Godalming got his telegram from Lloyd's. I know now what men feel in battle when the call to action is heard. Mrs. Harker, alone of our party, did not show any signs of emotion. After all, it is not strange that she did not, for we took special care not to let her know anything about it, and we tried not to show any excitement when we were in her presence. In the old days she would, I am sure, have noticed no matter how we might have tried to conceal it, but in this way she has greatly changed during the past three weeks. The lethargy grows upon her, and though she seems strong and well, and is getting back some of her colour, Van Helsing and I are not satisfied. We talk of her often. We have not, however, said a word to the others. It would break poor Harker's heart, certainly his nerve, if he knew that we had even a suspicion on the subject. Van Helsing examines, he tells me, her teeth very carefully, whilst she is in the hypnotic condition, for he says that so long as they do not begin to sharpen, there is no active danger of a change in her. If this change should come, it would be necessary to take steps. We both know what those steps would have to be, though we do not mention our thoughts to each other. We should neither of us shrink from the task, awful though it may be to contemplate. Euthanasia is an excellent and comforting word. I am grateful to whoever invented it. It is only about twenty-four hours' sail from the Dardanelles to here, at the rate the Tsarina Catherine has come from London. She should therefore arrive some time in the morning, but as she cannot possibly get in before then, we are all about to retire early. We shall get up at one o'clock so as to be ready. 25 October noon. No news yet of the ship's arrival. Mrs. Harker's hypnotic report this morning was the same as usual, so it is possible that we may get news at any moment. We men are all in a fever of excitement, except Harker, who is calm. His hands are cold as ice, and an hour ago I found him wetting the edge of the great Gorka knife, which he now always carries with him. It will be a bad lookout for the Count if the edge of that kukri ever touches his throat, driven by that stern, ice-cold hand. Van Helsing and I were a little alarmed about Mrs. Harker today. About noon, she got into a sort of lethargy which we did not like, although we kept silence to the others. We were neither of us happy about it. She had been restless all morning, so that we are at first glad to know that she was sleeping. When, however, her husband mentioned casually that she was sleeping so soundly that he could not wake her, we went to her room to see for ourselves. She was breathing naturally and looked so well and peaceful that we agreed that the sleep was better for her than anything else. Poor girl, she has so much to forget that it is no wonder that sleep, if it brings oblivion to her, does her good. Later, our opinion was justified, for when after a refreshing sleep of some hours she woke up, she seemed brighter and better than she had been for days. At sunset she made the usual hypnotic report, wherever he may be in the Black Sea, the Count is hurrying to his destination. To his doom, I trust. 26 October. Another day, and no tidings of the Tsarina Catherine. She ought to be here by now. That she is still journeying somewhere is apparent, for Mrs. Harker's hypnotic report at sunrise was still the same. 
It is possible that the vessel may be lying by, at times, for fog. Some of the steamers which came in last evening reported patches of fog both to the north and south of the port. We must continue our watching, as the ship may now be signalled at any moment. 27 October, noon. Most strange. No news yet of the ship we wait for. Mrs. Harker reported last night and this morning as usual, lapping waves and rushing water, though she added that the waves were very faint. The telegrams from London have been the same. No further report. Van Helsing is terribly anxious and told me just now that he fears the Count is escaping us. He added significantly, I did not like that lethargy of Madame Nina's. Souls and memories can do strange things during trance. I was about to ask him more, but Harker just then came in, and he held up a warning hand. We must try tonight at sunset to make her speak more fully when in her hypnotic state. 28 October. Telegram. Rufus Smith, London, to Lord Godalming, Care HBM, Vice Consul, Varna. Lorena Catherine reported entering Galatz at one o'clock today. Dr. Seward's Diary. 28 October. When the telegram came announcing the arrival in Galatz, I do not think it was such a shock to any of us as might have been expected. True, we did not know whence or how or when the bolt would come, but I think we all expected that something strange would happen. The delay of arrival at Varna made us individually satisfied that things would not be just as we had expected. We only waited to learn where the change would occur. Nonetheless, however, was it a surprise. I suppose that nature works on such hopeful basis that we believe against ourselves that things will be as they ought to be, not as we should know they will be. Transcendentalism is a beacon to the angels, even if it be will of the wisp to man. It was an odd experience, and we all took it differently. Van Helsing raised his hand over his head for a moment, as though in remonstrance with the Almighty. But he said not a word, and in a few seconds stood up with his face sternly set. Lord Godalming grew very pale and sat breathing heavily. I was myself, half stunned, and looked in wonder at one after another. Quincy Morris tightened his belt with that quick movement which I knew so well. In our old wandering days, it meant action. Mrs. Harker grew ghastly white so that the scar on her forehead seemed to burn, but she folded her hands meekly and looked up in prayer. Harker smiled, actually smiled, the dark, bitter smile of one who was without hope. But at the same time his action belied his words, for his hands instinctively sought the hilt of the great kukri knife and rested there. When does the next train start for Galatz? said Van Helsing to us generally. At 6.30 tomorrow morning. We all started, for the answer came from Mrs. Harker. How on earth do you know? said Art. You forget, or perhaps you do not know, though Jonathan does and so does Dr. Van Helsing, that I am the train fiend. At home in Exeter, I always used to make up the timetables so as to be helpful to my husband. I found it so useful sometimes that I always make a study of the timetables now. I knew that if anything were to take us to Castle Dracula, we should go by Galatz, or at any rate through Bucharest, so I learned the times very carefully. Unhappily, there are not many to learn, as the only train tomorrow leaves as I say. Wonderful woman, murmured the professor. Can't we get a special? asked Lord Godalming. Van Helsing shook his head. I fear not. This land is very different from yours or mine. Even if we did have a special, it would probably not arrive as soon as our regular train. Moreover, we have something to prepare. We must think. Now let us organize. You, friend Arthur, go to the train and get the tickets and arrange that all be ready for us to go in the morning. Do you, friend Jonathan, go to the agent of the ship and get from him letters to the agent in Galatz with authority to make search the ship just as it was here. Morris Quincy, you see the vice-consul and get his aid with his fellow in Galatz and all he can do to make our way smooth so that no times be lost when over the Danube. John will stay with Madame Mina and me and we shall consult. For so, if time be long, you may be delayed and it will not matter when the sun set since I am here with Madame to make report. And I, said Mrs. Harker brightly, and more like herself than she had been for many a long day, shall try to be of use in all ways, and shall think and write for you as I used to do. Something is shifting from me in some strange way, and I feel freer than I have been of late. The three younger men looked happier at the moment as they seemed to realize the significance of her words, but Van Helsing and I, turning to each other, met a grave and troubled glance. 
We said nothing at the time, however. When the three men had gone out to their tasks, Van Helsing asked Mrs. Harker to look up the copy of the diaries and find him the part of Harker's journal at the castle. She went away to get it. When the door was shut upon her, he said to me, We mean the same. Speak out. There is some change. It is a hope that makes me sick, for it may deceive us. Quite so. Do you know why I asked her to get the manuscript? No, said I, unless it was to get an opportunity of seeing me alone. You are in part right, friend John, but only in part. I want to tell you something, and oh, my friend, I am taking a great, a terrible risk, but I believe it is right. In the moment when Madame Mina said those words that arrest both our understanding, an inspiration came to me. In the trance of three days ago, the Count sent her his spirit to read her mind, or more like he took her to see him in his earth box, in the ship with water rushing, just as it go free at rise and set of sun. He learned that then we are here, for she have more to tell in her open life, with eyes to see and ears to hear, than he, shut, as he is, in his coffin box. Now he make his most effort to escape us. At present, he want her not. He is sure, with his so great knowledge, that she will come at his call. But he cut her off. Take her, as he can do, out of his own power, that so she come not to him. Ah, there I have hope that our man-brains, that have been a man so long, and that have not lost the grace of God, will come higher than his child-brain, that lie in his tomb for centuries, that go not yet to our stature, and that do only work selfish, and therefore small. Here comes Madame Mina, not a word to her of her trance. She know it not, and it would overwhelm her and make despair, just when we want all her hope, all her courage. When most we want her great brain, which is trained like man's brain, but is a sweet woman, and have a special power which the Count give her, and which he may not take away altogether, though he think not so. Hush, let me speak, and you shall learn, O oh John, my friend, we are in awful straits. I fear as I never feared before. We can only trust the good God. Silence, here she comes. I thought that the professor was going to break down and have hysterics, just as he had when Lucy died, but with great effort he controlled himself and was at perfect nervous poise when Mrs. Harker tripped into the room, bright and happy-looking and, in the doing of work, seeming forgetful of her misery. As she came in, she handed a number of the sheets of typewriting to Van Helsing. He looked over them gravely, his face brightening up as he read. Then holding the pages between his finger and thumb, he said, Friend John, to you with so much of experience already, and you too, dear Madame Mina, that are young, here is a lesson. Do not fear, ever, to think. A half-thought has been buzzing often in my brain, but I fear to let him loose his wings. Here now, with more knowledge, I go back to where that half-thought come from, and I find that he be no half-thought at all, that be a whole thought, though so young that he is not yet strong to use his little wings, nay, like the ugly duck of my friend Hans Andersen, he be no duck-thought at all, but a big swan-thought, that sail nobly on big wings, when the time come for him to try them. See I read here what Jonathan have written, that other of his race who, in a later age, again and again, brought his forces over the great river into Turkeyland, who, when he was beaten back, came again and again, though he had to come alone from the bloody field where his troops were being slaughtered, since he knew that he alone could ultimately triumph. What does this tell us? Not much? No, the Count's child thought see nothing, therefore he speaks so free. Your man thought see nothing, my man thought see nothing, till just now. No, but there comes another word from someone who speak without thought because she too know not what it mean, what it might mean, just as there are elements which rest, yet when in nature's course they move on their way and they touch, then poof, and there comes a flash of light, heaven wide, that blind and kill and destroy some, but that show up all earth below for leagues and leagues. Is it not so? Well, I, I shall explain. To begin... Have you ever studied the philosophy of crime? Yes and no. You, John, yes, for it is a study of insanity. You, no, Madame Mina, for crime touch you not. Not but once. 
still your mind works true and argues not a particulari ad universal. There is this peculiarity in criminals. It is so constant in all countries and at all times that even police, who know not much from philosophy, come to know it empirically, that it is. That is to be empiric. The criminal always work at one crime, that is the true criminal who seems to predestinate to crime and who will of none other. This criminal is not full man-brain. He is clever and cunning and resourceful, but he be not of man's stature as to brain. He be of child-brain in much. Now this criminal of ours is predestinate to crime also. He too have child-brain, and it is of the child to do what he have done. The little bird, the little fish, the little animal learn not by principle, but empirically, and when he learn to do, then there is to him the ground to start from to do more. Dos post do, said Archimedes, give me a fulcrum, and I shall move the world. To do once is the fulcrum whereby child brain become man brain, and until he have the purpose to do more, he continued to do the same again every time, just as he have done before. Oh, my dear, I see that your eyes are opened, and that to you the lightning flash show all the leaks. For Mrs. Harker began to clap her hands and her eyes sparkled. He went on. Now you shall speak. Tell us, two dry men of science, what you see with those bright eyes. He took her hand and held it whilst she spoke. His finger and thumb closed on her pulse as I thought instinctively and unconsciously as she spoke. The Count is a criminal, and of criminal type. Nor Doe and Lombroso would so classify him, and qua criminal, he is of imperfectly formed mind. Thus, in a difficulty, he has to seek resource in habit. His past is a clue, and the one page of it that we know, and that, from his own lips, tells that once before, when in what Mr. Morris would call a tight place, he went back to his own country from the land he had tried to invade, and thence, without losing purpose, prepared himself for a new effort. He came again better equipped for his work, and won. So he came to London to invade a new land. He was beaten, and when all hope of success was lost, and his existence in danger, he fled back over the sea to his home, just as formerly he had fled back over the Danube from Turkeyland. Good, good, oh you so clever lady, said Van Helsing, enthusiastically as he stooped and kissed her hand. A moment later he said to me, as calmly as though we had been having a sick-room consultation, Seventy-two only, and in all this excitement, I have hope. Turning to her again, he said with keen expectation, But go on, go on, there is more to tell if you will. Be not afraid, John and I know, I do in any case, and shall tell you if you are right. Speak without fear. I will try to, but you will forgive me if I seem egotistical. Nay, fear not, you must be egoist, for it is of you that we think. Then, as he is criminal, he is selfish, and as his intellect is small and his action based on selfishness, he confines himself to one purpose. That purpose is remorseless. As he fled back over the Danube, leaving his forces to be cut to pieces, so now he is intent on being safe, careless of all. So his own selfishness frees my soul somewhat of the terrible power which he acquired over me on that dreadful night. I felt it. Oh, I felt it. Thank God for his great mercy. My soul is freer than it has been since that awful hour, and all that haunts me is a fear lest in some trance or dream he may have used my knowledge for his ends. The professor stood up. He has so used your mind, and by it he has left us here in Varna, whilst the ship that carried him rushed through enveloping fog up to Galatz, where, doubtless, he had made preparation for escaping from us. But his child mind only saw so far, and it may be that, as ever is in God's providence, the very thing that the evil doer most reckoned on for his selfish good turns out to be his chiefest harm. The hunter is taken in his own snare, as the great psalmist says. For now that he think he is free from every trance of us all, and that he has escaped us with so many hours to him, then his selfish child brain will whisper him to sleep. He think, too, that as he cut himself off from knowing your mind, there can be no knowledge of him to you. There is where he fail, that terrible baptism of blood which he give you makes you free to go to him in spirit as you have yet done in your times of freedom. 
when the sun rise and set. At such times you go by my volition and not by his, and his power to good of you and others as you have won from your suffering at his hands. This is now all the more precious that he know it not, and to God himself have even cut himself off from his knowledge of our where. We, however, are not selfish, and we believe that God is with us through all this blackness and these many dark hours. We shall follow him, and we shall not flinch, even if we peril ourselves that we become like him. Friend John, this has been a great honour, and it have done much to advance us on our way. You must be scribe and write him all down, so that, when the others return from their work, you can give it to them, then they shall know as we do. And so I have written it whilst we await the return, and Mrs. Harker has written with her typewriter all since she brought the manuscript to us. End of chapter 25 Recording by Corinne LePage Chapter 26 of Dracula by Bram Stoker. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Corinne LePage. Chapter 26 Dr. Seward's Diary. 29 October. This is written in the train from Varna to Galatz. Last night we all assembled a little before the time of sunset. Each of us had done his work as well as he could. So far as thought and endeavor and opportunity go, we are prepared for the whole of our journey and for our work when we get to Galatz. When the usual time came round, Mrs. Harker prepared herself for her hypnotic effort, and after a longer and more serious effort on the part of Van Helsing than has been usually necessary, she sank into the trance. Usually she speaks on a hint, but this time the professor had to ask her questions, and to ask them pretty resolutely before we could learn anything. At last her answer came. I can see nothing. We are still... There are no waves lapping, but only a steady swirl of water, softly running against the hossa. I can hear men's voices calling, near and far, and the roll and creak of oars in the rollouts. A gun is fired somewhere. An echo of it seems far away. There is trampling of feet overhead, and ropes and chains are dragged along. What is this? There is a gleam of light. I can feel the air blowing upon me. Here she stopped. She had risen, as if impulsively, from where she lay on the sofa, and raised both her hands, palms upwards, as if lifting a weight. Van Helsing and I looked at each other with understanding. Quincy raised his eyebrows slightly and looked at her intently, whilst Harker's hand instinctively closed around the hilt of his kukri. There was a long pause. We all knew that the time when she could speak was passing, but we felt that it was useless to say anything. Suddenly she sat up, and, as she opened her eyes, said sweetly, would none of you like a cup of tea? You must all be so tired. We could only make her happy and so acquiesced. She bustled off to get tea. When she had gone, Van Helsing said, You see, my friends, he is close to land. He has left his earth chest, but he has yet to get on shore. In the night he may lie hidden somewhere, but if he be not carried on shore, or if the ship do not touch it, he cannot achieve the land. In such case he can, if it be in the night, change his form, and can jump or fly on shore, as he did in Whitby. But if the day come before he get on shore, then, unless he be carried, he cannot escape. And if he be carried, then the customs man may discover what the box contain. Thus, in fine, if he escape not on shore tonight or before dawn, there will be the whole day lost to him. We may then arrive in time, for if he escape not at night, we shall come on him in daytime, boxed up and at our mercy, for he dare not be his true self, awake and visible, lest he be discovered. There was no more to be said, so we waited in patience until the dawn, at which time we might learn more from Mrs. Harker. Early this morning we listened, with breathless anxiety, for her response in her trance. The hypnotic stage was even longer in coming than before, and when it came the time remaining until full sunrise was so short that we began to despair. Van Helsing seemed to throw his whole soul into the effort, at last, in obedience to his will, she made reply. All is dark. I hear lapping water, level with me, and some creaking as of wood on wood. She paused, and the red sun shot up. We must wait till tonight.
And so it is that we are travelling towards Galat in an agony of expectation. We are due to arrive between two and three in the morning, but already, at Bucharest, we are three hours late, so we cannot possibly get in till well after sun-up. Thus, we shall have two more hypnotic messages from Mrs. Hawker. Either or both may possibly throw more light on what is happening. Later. Sunset has come and gone. Fortunately, it came at a time when there was no distraction, for it had occurred whilst we were at a station. We might not have secured the necessary calm and isolation. Mrs. Harker yielded to the hypnotic influence even less readily than this morning. I am in fear that her power of reading the Count's sensations may die away, just when we want it most. It seems to me that her imagination is beginning to work. Whilst she has been in the trance hitherto, she has confined herself to the simplest of facts. If this goes on, it may ultimately mislead us. If I thought that the Count's power over her would die away equally with her power of knowledge, it would be a happy thought, but I am afraid that it may not be so. When she did speak, her words were enigmatical. Something is going out. I can feel it pass me like a cold wind. I can hear, far off, confused words, as of men talking in strange tongues, fierce falling water, and the howling of wolves. She stopped, and a shudder ran through her, increasing in intensity for a few seconds till, at the end, she shook as though in a palsy. She said no more, even in answer to the professor's imperative questioning. When she woke from the trance, she was cold and exhausted and languid, but her mind was all alert. She could not remember anything, but asked what she had said. When she was told, she pondered over it deeply for a long time in silence. 30 October, 7 a.m. We are near Galatz now, and I may not have time to write later. Sunrise this morning was anxiously looked for by us all. Knowing of the increasing difficulty of procuring the hypnotic trance, Van Helsing began his passes earlier than usual. They produced no effect, however, until the regular time, when she yielded with a still greater difficulty, only a minute before the sun rose. The professor lost no time in his questioning. Her answer came with equal quickness. All is dark, I hear water swirling by, level with my ears and the creaking of wood on wood. Cattle, low far off, there is another sound, a queer one like. She stopped and grew white, and whiter still. Go on, go on, speak, I command you, said Van Helsing in an agonized voice. At the same time there was a despair in his eyes, for the risen sun was reddening, even Mrs. Harker's pale face. She opened her eyes, and we all started as she said, sweetly, and seemingly with the utmost concern. Oh, Professor, why ask me to do what you know I can't? I don't remember anything. Then, seeing the look of amazement on her faces, she said, turning from one to the other with a troubled look. What have I said? What have I done? I know nothing, only that I was lying here, half asleep, and heard you say, Go on, speak, I command you. It seems so funny to hear you order me about as if I were a bad child. Oh, Madame Mina, he said sadly, it is proof, if proof be needed, of how I love and honour you when a word for your good, spoken more earnest than ever, can seem so strange because it is an order to her whom I am proud to obey. The whistles are sounding. We are nearing Galat. We are on fire with anxiety and eagerness. Mina Harker's Journal 30 October. Mr. Morris took me to the hotel where our rooms had been ordered by telegraph, he being the one who could best be spared, since he does not speak any foreign language. The forces were distributed, much as they had been at Varna, except that Lord Godalming went to the vice-consul, as his rank might serve as an immediate guarantee of some sort to the official, we being in extreme hurry. Jonathan and the two doctors went to the shipping agent to learn particulars of the arrival of the Tsarina Catherine. Later, Lord Godalming has returned. The consul is away, and the vice-consul sick, so the routine work has been attended to by a clerk. He was very obliging and offered to do anything in his power. Jonathan Harker's Journal 30 October At nine o'clock, Dr. Van Helsing, Dr. Seward, and I called on Messrs. Mackenzie and Steinkoff, the agents of the London firm of Hopgood. They had received a wire from London in answer to Lord Godalming's telegraphed request, asking us to show them any civility in their power. They were more than kind and courteous, and took us at once on board the Tsarina Catherine, which lay at anchor in the river harbour. There we saw the captain, Donaldson by name, who told us of his voyage. 
he said that in all his life he had never had so favourable a run. Man, he said, but it made us a fair, for we expected that we should have to pay for it with some rare piece of luck, so as to keep up the average. It's no canny to run frae London to the Black Sea where we end a hint ye, as though the Dale himself were blowing on your sail for his own purpose. Another time we could not spare a thing. Gin we were a nigh a ship, or a port, or a headland. A fog fell on us and trow we us, till when after it had lifted, we looked out, the devil a thing we could see. We ran by Gibraltar without being able to signal, and till we came to the Dardanelles we had to wait to get our permit to pass. We never were within a hillot. At first I inclined to slack off sail and beat about till the fog was lifted, but whilst I thought that if the devil was minded to get us into the Black Sea quick, he was like to do it whether we would or no. If we had a quick voyage, it would be no to our miscredit with the honours, or no hurt or traffic, and the old man who had served his own purpose would be decently grateful to us for not hindering him. This mixture of simplicity and cunning, of superstition and commercial reasoning, aroused Van Helsing, who said, Mine friend, that devil is more clever than he is thought by some, and he know when he meet his match. The skipper was not displeased with the compliment, and went on. When we got past the Bosphorus, the men began to grumble. Some of them, the Romanians, came and asked me to heave overboard a big box which had been put on board by a queer-looking old man just before we had started for London. I had seen them spear at the fellow and put out their twa fingers when they saw him to guard against the evil eye. Man, but the superstition of foreigners is perfectly ridiculous. I sent them about their business pretty quick, but just after a fog closed in on us, I felt a wee bit that we did and then something though I wouldn't say it was again the big box. Well, on we went, and as the fog didn't let off for five days, I just let the wind carry us, for if the devil wanted to get somewhere as well, he would fetch it up or eat. And if he didn't, well, we'd keep a sharp lookout anyhow. Sure enough, we had a fair way on deep water all the time, and two days ago, when the morning sun came through the fog, we found ourselves just on the river opposite Galatz. The Romanians were wild and wanted me right or wrong to take out the box and fling it in the river. I had to argue with them about it with a hand spike, and when the last of them rose off the deck with his head in his hand, I had convinced them that, evil eye or no evil eye, the property and the trust of my owners were better in my hands than in the river Danube. They had man ye taken the box on deck ready to fling in, and as it was marked Galatz via Varna, I thought that I let it lie till we discharged them in the port and read it all together. We did not do much clearing that day and had to remain the nest at anchor. But in the morning, bright and early, an hour before sunup, a man came aboard with an order, written to him from England, to receive a box marked for one Count Dracula. Sure enough, the matter was one ready to his hand. He had his papers at it, and glad I was to be rid of the damn thing, for I was beginning myself to feel uneasy at it. If the Dale had any luck to board that ship, I'm thinking it was nine other than that same. What was the name of the man who took it? asked Dr. Van Helsing with restrained eagerness. I'll be telling you quick, he answered, and, stepping down to his cabin, produced a receipt signed Emanuel Hildesheim. Bergenstras, 16 was the address. We found out that this was all the captain knew, so with thanks, we came away. We found Hildesheim in his office, a Hebrew of rather the Adelphi theatre type, with a nose like a sheep and a fez. His arguments were pointed with a specie, we doing the punctuation, and with a little bargaining he told us what he knew. This turned out to be simple but important. He had received a letter from Mr. Deville of London, telling him to receive, if possible, before sunrise, as to avoid customs, a box which would arrive at Galatz in the Serena Catherine. This he was to give in charge to a certain Petrov Skinsky, who dealt with the Slovaks who traded down the river to the port. He had been paid for his work by an English banknote, which had been duly cashed for gold at the Danube International Bank. When Skinsky had come to him, he had taken him to the ship and handed over the box so as to save porterage. That was all he knew. We then sought for Skinsky, but were unable to find him. One of his neighbours, who did not seem to bear him any affection, said that he had gone away two days before, no one knew whither. This was corroborated by his landlord, who had received by messenger the key of the house together with the rent due in English money. This had been between ten and eleven o'clock last night. We were at a standstill again. 
Whilst we were talking, one came running and breathlessly gasped out that the body of Skinsky had been found inside the wall of the churchyard of St. Peter, and that the throat had been torn open as if by some wild animal. Those we had been speaking with ran off to see the horror, the woman crying out, This is the work of a Slovak. We hurried away, lest we should have been in some way drawn into the affair, and so detained. As we came home, we could arrive at no definite conclusion. We were all convinced the box was on its way, by water, to somewhere, but where that might be we would have to discover. With heavy hearts, we came home to the hotel, to Mina. When we met together, the first thing was to consult as to taking Mina again into our confidence. Things are getting desperate, and it is at least a chance, though a hazardous one, as a preliminary step. I was released from my promise to her. Mina Harker's Journal 30 October, evening. They were so tired and worn out and dispirited that there was nothing to be done till they had some rest. So I asked them all to lie down for half an hour whilst I should enter everything up to the moment. I feel so grateful to the man who invented the traveller's typewriter and to Mr. Morris for getting this one for me. I should have felt quite astray doing the work if I had to write with a pen. It is all done. Poor dear, dear Jonathan. What he must have suffered. What he must be suffering now. He lies on the sofa hardly seeming to breathe. His whole body appears in collapse. His brows are knit. His face is drawn with pain. Poor fellow. Maybe he is thinking, and I can see his face all wrinkled up with the concentration of his thoughts. Oh, if I could only help at all. I shall do what I can. I have asked Dr. Van Helsing, and he has got me all the papers that I have not yet seen. Whilst they are resting, I shall go over all carefully, and perhaps I may arrive at some conclusion. I shall try to follow the professor's example, and think without prejudice on the facts before me. I do believe that under God's providence, I have made a discovery. I shall get the maps and look over them. I am more than ever sure that I am right. My new conclusion is ready, so I shall get a party together and read it. They can judge it. It is well to be accurate, and every minute is precious. Mina Harker's Memorandum Entered in her journal Grand of inquiry. Count Dracula's problem is to get back to his own place. A. He must be brought back by someone. This is evident, for had he the power to move himself as he wished, he could go either as man or wolf or bat, or in some other way. He evidently fears discovery or interference, in the state of helplessness which he must be, confined as he is between dawn and sunset in his wooden box. B. How is he to be taken? Here a process of exclusions may help us, by road, by rail, by water. 1. By road. There are endless difficulties, especially in leaving the city. X. There are people, and people are curious and investigate. A hint, a surmise, a doubt as to what might be in the box would destroy him. Y. There are, or there may be, customs and octroi officers to pass. Z. His pursuers might follow. This is his highest fear and in order to prevent his being betrayed he has repelled, so far as he can, even his victim, me. 2. By rail. There is no one in charge of the box. It would have to take its chance of being delayed, and delay would be fatal, with enemies on the truck. True, he might escape at night, but what would he be if left in a strange place, with no refuge that he could fly to? This is not what he intends, and he does not mean to risk it. 3. By water. Here is the safest way, in one respect, but with most danger in another. On the water, he is powerless except at night. Even then, he can only summon fog and storm and snow and his wolves. But, were he wrecked, the living water would engulf him, helpless, and he would indeed be lost. He could have the vessel to drive to land, but if it were unfriendly land, where he was not free to move, his position would still be desperate. We know from the record that he was on the water, so what we have to do is to ascertain what water. The first thing is to realise exactly what he has done as yet. We may then get a light on what his later task is to be. Firstly, we must differentiate between what he did in London as part of his general plan of action, when he was pressed for moments and had to arrange as best he could. Secondly, we must see as well as we can surmise it from the facts we know of what he has done here. As to the first, he evidently intended to arrive at Galatz, and sent an invoice to Varna to deceive us lest we should ascertain his means of exit from England. 
His immediate and sole purpose, then, was to escape. The proof of this is the letter of instruction sent to Emanuel Hildesheim to clear and take away the box before sunrise. There is also the instruction to patrol Skinsky. These we must only guess at, but there must have been some letter or message since Skinsky came to Hildesheim. That, so far, his plans were successful, we know. The Tsarina Catherine made a phenomenally quick journey, so much so that Captain Donaldson's suspicions were aroused, but his superstition united with his canniness, played the Count's game for him, and he ran with his favouring wind, through fogs and all till he brought up blindfold and galats. That the Count's arrangements were well made has been proved. Hildesheim cleared the box, took it off, and gave it to Skinsky. Skinsky took it, and here we lose the trail. We only know that the box is somewhere on the water, moving along. The customs and the octorai, if there be any, have been avoided. Now we come to what the Count must have done after his arrival, on land, at Glatz. The box was given to Skinsky before sunrise. At sunrise, the Count could appear in his own form. Here, we ask why Skinsky was chosen at all to aid in the work. In my husband's diary, Skinsky is mentioned as dealing with the Slovaks who trade down the river to the port. And the man's remark that the murder was the work of a Slovak showed the general feeling against his class. The Count wanted isolation. My surmise is this, that in London the Count decided to get back to his castle by water as the most safe and secret way. He was brought from the castle by Skarni, and probably they delivered their cargo to Slovaks who took the boxes to Varna, for there they were shipped for London, Thus, the Count had knowledge of the persons who could arrange this service. When the box was on land, before the sunrise, or after the sunset, he came out from his box, met Skinsky, and instructed him what to do as to arranging the carriage of the box up some river. Then this was done, and he knew that all was in train. He blotted out his traces, as he thought, by murdering his agent. I have examined the map, and find that the river most suitable for the Slovaks to have ascended is either the Pruth or the Sereth. I read in the typescript that in my trance I heard cows low and water swelling level with my ears, and the creaking of wood. The Count in his box, then, was on a river in an open boat, propelled probably either by oars or poles, for the banks are near and it is working against the stream. There would be no such sound if floating down the stream. Of course, it may not be either the Sereth or the Pruth, but we may possibly investigate further. Now, of these two, the Pruth is more easily navigated but the Sureth is, at Fundu, joined by the Bistritza, which runs round the Borgo Pass. The loop it makes is manifestly as close to Dracula's castle as can be got by water. Mina Harker's journal continued. When I had done reading, Jonathan took me in his arms and kissed me. The others kept shaking me by both hands, and Dr. Van Helsing said, Our dear Madame Mina is once more our teacher. Her eyes have been where we were blinded. Now we are on the track once again, and this time we may succeed. Our enemy is at his most helpless, and if we can come on him by day, on the water, our task will be over. He has a start, but he is powerless to hasten, as he may not leave his box, lest those who carry him may suspect, for them to suspect would be to prompt them to throw him into the stream, where he perish. This he knows and will not. Now, men, to our council of war, for here and now, we must plan what each and all shall do. I shall get a steam lunch and follow him, said Lord Godalming, and I, horses to follow on the bank lest by chance he land, said the professor. Both good, but neither must go alone. There must be force to overcome force if need be. The Slovak is strong and rough, and he carries rude arms. All the men smiled, for amongst them they carried a small arsenal, said Mr. Morris. I have brought some Winchesters, they are pretty handy in a crowd, and there may be wolves. The Count, if you remember, took some other precautions. He made some requisitions on others that Mrs. Harker could not quite hear or understand. We must be ready at all points. Dr. Seward said, I think we had better go with Quincy. We have been accustomed to hunt together, and we too, well armed, will be a match for whatever may come along. You must not be alone, Aunt. It may be necessary to fight the Slovaks and a chance thrust for I don't suppose these fellows carry guns, would undo all our plans. There must be no chances. This time we shall not rest until the Count's head and body have been separated, and we are sure that he cannot reincarnate. He looked at Jonathan as he spoke, and Jonathan looked at me. I could see that the poor dear was torn about in his mind, 
Of course he wanted to be with me, but then the boat service would most likely be the one which would destroy the... the... the vampire. Why did I hesitate to write the word? He was silent a while, and, during his silence, Dr. Van Helsing spoke. Friend Jonathan, this is to you for twice reasons. First, because you are young and brave and can fight, and all energies may be needed at the last, and again, that it is your right to destroy him, that, which has wrought such woe to you and yours. Be not afraid for Madame Mina. She will be my care, if I may. I am old. My legs are not so quick to run as once, and I am not used to ride so long or to pursue as need be, or to fight with lethal weapons. But I can be of other service. I can fight in other way, and I can die, if need be, as well as younger men. Now let me say what I would is this. While you, my Lord Godalming, and friend Jonathan, go in your so swift little steamboat up the river, and whilst John and Quincy guard the bank where perchance he might be landed, I will take Madame Mina right into the heart of the enemy's country, whilst the old fox is tied in his box, floating on the running stream, whence he cannot escape to land, where he dares not raise the lid of his coffin box, lest his Slovak carriers should in fear leave him to perish. We shall go in the track where Jonathan went, from Bistritz over the Borgo, and find our way to the castle of Dracula. Here Madame Mina's hypnotic power will surely help, and we shall find our way, all dark and unknown otherwise, after the first sunrise, when we are near the fateful place. There is much to be done, and other places to be made sanctify, so that the nest of vipers be obliterated. Here Jonathan interrupted him quite hotly. Do you mean to say, Professor Van Helsing, that you would bring Mina, in her sad case, and tainted as she is with that devil's illness, right into the jaws of his death trap? Not for the world, not for heaven or hell. He became almost speechless for a minute, and then went on. Do you know what the place is? Have you seen that awful den of hellish infamy, with the very moonlight alive with grisly shapes and every speck of dust that whirls in the wind, a devouring monster in embryo? Have you felt the vampire's lips upon your throat? Here he turned to me. As his eyes lit upon my forehead, he threw up his arms with a cry. Oh, my God, what have we done to have this terror upon us? And he sank down on the sofa in a collapse of misery. The professor's voice, as he spoke in clear, sweet tones, which seemed to vibrate in the air, calmed us all. Oh, my friend, it is because I would save Madame Mina from that awful place that I would go. God forbid that I should take her into that place. There is work, wild work, to be done there, that her eyes may not see. We men, all save Jonathan, have seen with their own eyes what is to be done before that place can be purified. Remember that we are in terrible straits. If the Count escape us this time, and he is strong and subtle and cunning, he may choose to sleep him for a century, and then in time, our dear one. He took my hand would come to him, to keep him company, and would be as those others that you, Jonathan, saw. You have told us of their gloating lips. You heard their ribald laugh as they clutched the moving bag that the Count threw to them. You shudder, and well it may be. Forgive me that I make you so much pain, but it is necessary. My friend, is it not a dire need for the which I am giving, possibly, my life? If it were that any one went into that place to stay, it is I who would have to go to keep them company. Do as you will, said Jonathan, with a sob that shook him all over. We are in the hands of God. Later. Oh, it did me good to see the way that these brave men worked. How can women help loving men when they are so earnest, and so true and so brave? And, too, it made me think of the wonderful power of money. What can it not do when it is properly applied? and what might it do when basely used. I felt so thankful that Lord Godalming is rich, and that both he and Mr. Morris, who also has plenty of money, are willing to spend it so freely, for if they did not, our little expedition could not start either so promptly or so well equipped, as it will within another hour. It is not three hours since it was arranged what part each of us was to do, and now Lord Godalming and Jonathan have a lovely steam launch, with steam up ready to start at a moment's notice. Dr. Seward and Mr. Morris have half a dozen good horses, well appointed, 
as have all the maps and appliances of various kinds that can be had. Professor Van Helsing and I are to leave by the 11.40 train tonight to Veresti, where we are to get a carriage and a drive to the Borgo Pass. We are bringing a good deal of ready money, as we are to buy a carriage and horses. We shall drive ourselves, for we have no one whom we can trust in the matter. The professor knows something of a great many languages, so we shall get on all right. We have got all arms, even for me a large ball revolver. Jonathan would not be happy unless I was armed like the rest. Alas, I cannot carry one arm that the rest do. The scar on my forehead forbids that. Dear Dr. Van Helsing comforts me by telling me that I am fully armed as there may be wolves. The weather is getting colder every hour, and there are snow flurries, which come and go as warnings. Later. It took all my courage to say goodbye to my darling. We may never meet again. Courage, Mina. The professor is looking at you keenly. His look is a warning. There must be no tears now, unless it may be that God will let them fall in gladness. Jonathan Harker's Journal October 30. Night. I am writing this in the light from the furnace door of the steam launch. Lord Godalming is firing up. He is an experienced hand at the work, as he has had for years a launch of his own on the Thames and another on the Norfolk Broads. Regarding our plans, we finally decided that Mina's guess was correct, and that if any waterway was chosen for the Count's escape back to his castle, the Sereth and then the Bistritza at its junction would be the one. We took it that somewhere about the 47th degree north latitude would be the place chosen for the crossing the country between the river and the Carpathians. We have no fear in running at good speed up the river at night. There is plenty of water, and the banks are wide enough apart to make steaming, even in the dark, easy enough. Lord Godalming tells me to sleep for a while, as it is enough for the present for one to be on watch. But I cannot sleep. How can I, with the terrible danger hanging over my darling, and her going out into that awful place? My only comfort is that we are in the hands of God. Only for that faith it would be easier to die than to live, and so be quit of all the trouble. Mr. Morris and Dr. Seward were off on their long ride before we started. They are to keep up the right bank, far enough off to get on higher lands where they can see a good stretch of river and avoid the following of its curves. They have, for the first stages, two men to ride and lead their spare horses, four in all, so as not to excite curiosity. When they dismiss the men, which shall be shortly, they shall themselves look after the horses. It may be necessary for us to join forces. If so, they can mount our whole party. One of the saddles has a movable horn and can be easily adapted for Mina if required. It is a wild adventure we are on. Here, as we are rushing along through the darkness, with the cold from the river seeming to rise up and strike us, with all the mysterious voices of the night around us, it all comes home. We seem to be drifting into unknown places and unknown ways, into a whole world of dark and dreadful things. Godalming is shutting the furnace door. 31 October. Still hurrying along, the day has come and Godalming is sleeping. I am on watch. The morning is bitterly cold. The furnace heat is grateful, though we have heavy fur coats. And yet, we have passed only a few open boats, but none of them had on board any box or package of anything like the size of one we seek. The men were scared every time we turned our electric lamp on them, and fell on their knees and prayed. 1 November, evening. No news all day. We have found nothing of the kind we seek. We have now passed into the Bistritza, and if we are wrong in our surmise, our chance is gone. We have overhauled every boat, big and little. Early this morning, one crew took us for a government boat, and treated us accordingly. We saw in this a way of smoothing matters. So at Fundu, where the Bistritza runs onto the Sarath, we got a Romanian flag, which we now fly conspicuously. With every boat which we have overhauled since then, this trick has succeeded. We have had every defence shown to us, and not once any objection to whatever we chose to ask or do. Some of the Slovaks tell us that a big boat passed them, going at more than usual speed, as she had a double crew on board. This was before they came to Fundu, so they could not tell us whether the boat turned into the Bistritza or continued up on the Sareth. At Thundu, we could not hear of any such boat, so she must have passed there in the night. I'm feeling very sleepy. The cold is perhaps beginning to tell on me, and nature must have rest some time. Godalming insists that he shall keep the first watch. 
God bless him for all his goodness to poor dear Mina and me. 2 November, morning. It is broad daylight. That good fellow would not wake me. He says it would have been a sin to, for I slept peacefully and was forgetting my trouble. It seemed brutally selfish to me to have slept so long and let him watch all night. But he was quite right. I am a new man this morning and, as I sit here and watch him sleeping, I can do all that is necessary both as to minding the engine, steering and keeping watch. I can feel that my strength and energy are coming back to me. I wonder where Mina is now, and Van Helsing. They should have got to Veresti about noon on Wednesday. It would take them some time to get the carriages and horses, so if they had started and travelled hard, they would be about now at the Borgo Pass. God guide and help them. I am afraid to think what may happen. If we could only go faster. But we cannot. The engines are throbbing and doing their utmost. I wonder how Dr. Seward and Mr. Morris are getting on. There seem to be endless streams running down the mountains into this river, but as none of them are very large at present at all events, though they are terrible doubtless in the winter and when the snow melts, the horsemen may not have met such obstruction. I hope that before we get to Strasbourg we may see them, for if by that time we have not overtaken the Count, it may be necessary to take counsel together what to do next. Dr. Seward's Diary 2 November Three days on the road, no news, and no time to write it if there had been, for every moment is precious. We have had only the rest needful for the horses, but we are both bearing it wonderfully. Those adventurous days of ours are turning up useful. We must push on. We shall never feel happy till we get the launch in sight again. 3 November We heard at Fundu that the launch had gone up the Bristritza. I wish it wasn't so cold. There are signs of snow coming, and if it falls heavy it will stop us. In such case we must get a sledge and go on, Russian fashion. 4 November Today we heard of the launch having been detained by an accident when trying to force a way up the rapids. The Slovak boats get up all right, by aid of a rope and steering with knowledge. Some went up only a few hours before. Godolming is an amateur fitter himself, and evidently it was he who put the launch in trim again. Finally they got up the rapids all right with local help and are off in the chase afresh. I fear that the boat is not any better for the accident. The peasantry tell us that after she got upon smooth water again, she kept stopping every now and again so long as she was in sight. We must push on harder than ever. Our help may be wanted soon. Mina Harker's Journal 31st October Arrived at Veresti at noon. The professor tells me that this morning at dawn he could hardly hypnotise me at all, and that all I could say was, dark and quiet. He is off now buying a carriage and horses. He says that he will later on try to buy additional horses so that we may be able to change them on the way. We have something more than seventy miles before us. The country is lovely and most interesting. If only we were under different conditions, how delightful it would be to see it all. If Jonathan and I were driving through it alone, what a pleasure it would be to stop and see people and learn something of their life and to fill our minds and memories with all the colour and picturesqueness of the whole wild, beautiful country and the quiet people. But alas! Later. Dr. Van Helsing has returned. He has got the carriage and horses. We are to have some dinner and to start in an hour. The landlady is putting us up a huge basket of provisions. It seems enough for a company of soldiers. The professor encourages her and whispers to me that it may be a week before we can get any food again. He has been shopping too and has sent home such a wonderful lot of fur coats and wraps and all sorts of warm things. There will not be any chance of our being cold. We shall soon be off. I am afraid to think of what may happen to us. We are truly in the hands of God. He alone know what may be, and I pray him, with all the strength of my sad and humble soul, that he will watch over my beloved husband, that whatever may happen, Jonathan may know that I loved him and honoured him more than I can say, and that my latest and truest thought will be always for him. End of chapter 26 Recording by Corinne LePage Chapter 27 of Dracula by Bram Stoker This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Recording by Corinne LePage. Chapter 27. Mina Harker's Journal. 1. November. All day long we have travelled, and at good speed. The horses seem to know that they are being kindly treated, for they go willingly their full stage at best speed. We have now had so many changes and find the same thing so constantly that we are encouraged to think that the journey will be an easy one. Dr. Van Helsing is laconic. He tells the farmers that he is hurrying to Bistritz and pays them well to make the exchange of horses. We get hot soup or coffee or tea and off we go. It is a lovely country, full of beauties of all imaginable kinds, and the people are brave and strong and simple and seem full of nice qualities. They are very, very superstitious. In the first house where we stopped, when the woman who served us saw the scar on my forehead, she crossed herself and put two fingers towards me to keep off the evil eye. I believe they went to the trouble of putting an extra amount of garlic into our food, and I can't abide garlic. Ever since then I have taken care not to take off my hat or veil, and so have escaped their suspicions. We are travelling fast, and we have no driver with us to carry tales. We go ahead of scandal, but I dare say that fear of the evil eye will follow hard behind us all the way. The professor seems tireless. All day he would not make any rest, though he made me sleep for a long spell. At sunset time he hypnotised me, and he says that I answered as usual. Darkness, lapping water and creaking wood, so our enemy is still on the river. I am afraid to think of Jonathan, but somehow I have now no fear for him or for myself. I write this whilst we wait in a farmhouse for the horses to be got ready. Dr. Van Helsing is sleeping. Poor dear, he looks very tired and old and grey, but his mouth is set as firmly as a conqueror's. Even in his sleep, he is instinct with resolution. When we have well started, I must make him rest whilst I drive. I shall tell him that we have days before us, and we must not break down when most of all his strength will be needed. All is ready. We are off shortly. 2 November, morning. I was successful, and we took turns driving all night. Now the day is on us, bright though cold. There is a strange heaviness in the air. I say heaviness for want of a better word. I mean that it oppresses us both. It is very cold, and only our warm furs keep us comfortable. At dawn, Van Helsing hypnotized me. He says I answered, Darkness, creaking wood, and roaring water. So the river is changing as they ascend. I do hope that my darling will not run any chance of danger, more than need be, but we are in God's hands. 2 November, night. All day long driving. The country gets wilder as we go, and the great spurs of the Carpathians, which at Veresti seemed so far from us and so low on the horizon, now seems to gather around us and tower in front. We both seem in good spirits. I think we make an effort each to cheer the other. In the doing so, we cheer ourselves. Dr. Van Helsing says that by morning we shall reach the Borgo Pass. The houses are very few here now, and the professor says that the last horse we got will have to go on with us, as we may not be able to change. He got two in addition to the two we changed, so that now we have a rude four in hand. The dear horses are patient and good, and they give us no trouble. We are not worried with other travellers, and so even I can drive. We shall get to the pass in daylight. We do not want to arrive before, so we take it easy, and each have a long rest in turn. Oh, what will tomorrow bring to us? We go to seek the place where my poor darling suffered so much. God grant that we may be guided aright, and that he will design to watch over my husband and those dear to us both, and who are in such deadly peril. As for me, I am not worthy in his sight. Alas, I am unclean to his eyes, and shall be until he may deign to let me stand forth in his sight as one of those who have not incurred his wrath. Memorandum by Abraham Van Helsing 4 November This to my old and true friend, John Seward, M.E.T., of Perfleet, London. In case I may not see him, it may explain. It is morning, and I write by a fire which, all the night I have kept alive, Madame Mina aiding me. It is cold, so cold that the grey heavy sky is full of snow, which, when it falls, will settle for all winter as the ground is hardening to receive it. It seems to have affected Madame Mina. She has been so heavy of head all day that she was not like herself. She sleeps and sleeps and sleeps. She her is unusual so alert, 
have done literally nothing all the day. She even have lost her appetite. She make no entry into her little diary. She who write so faithful at every pause. Something whisper to me that all is not well. However, tonight she is more vif. Her long sleep all day have refresh and restore her. For now she is all sweet and bright as ever. At sunset, I try to hypnotize her, but alas, with no effect. The power has grown less and less with each day, and tonight it fell me altogether. Well, God's will be done, whatever it may be, and whithersoever it may lead. Now tis a historical, for as Madame Mina writes, not in her stenography, I must in my cumbrous old fashion, that so each day of us may not go unrecorded. We got to the Borgo Pass just after sunrise yesterday morning. When I saw the signs of the dawn, I got ready for the hypnotism. We stopped our carriage and got down so that there might be no disturbance. I made a couch with furs, and Madame Mina, lying down, yielded herself, as usual, but more slow and more short time than ever, to the hypnotic sleep. As before, came the answer darkness and the swirling of water. Then she woke, bright and radiant, and we go on our way and soon reach the pace. At this time and place, she become all on fire with zeal, some new guiding power being her manifested, for she point to a road and say, this is the way. How do you know it? I ask. Of course I know it, she answer, and with a pause add, have not my Jonathan travelled it and wrote of his travel? At first I think somewhat strange, but soon I see that there be only one such by road. It is used but little and very different from the coach road from the Bukovina to Bistritz, which is more wide and hard and more of use. So we came down this road. When we meet other ways, not always where we share, that there were roads at all, for they be neglect and light snow have fallen, the horses know, and they only. I give rein to them, and they go on so patient. By and by, we find all the things which Jonathan have not in that wonderful diary of him. Then we go on for long, long hours and hours. As the first, I tell Madame Mina to sleep. She try, and she succeed. She sleep all the time, till at the last I fear myself to suspicious grow and attempt to wake her. But she sleep on, and I may not wake her though I try. I do not wish to try too hard, lest I harm her, for I know that she have suffered much, and sleep at times be all in all to her. I think I drowse myself, for all of a sudden I feel guilt as though I have done something. I find myself bolt up with the reins in my hand and the good horses go along jog jog just as ever. I look down and find Madame Mina still asleep. It is now not far off sunset time and over the snow the light of the sun flow in big yellow flood so that we throw great long shadow on where the mountain rise so steep for we are going up and up and all is Oh, so wild and rocky, as though it were the end of the world. Then I arouse Madame Nina. This time she wake with not so much trouble, and then I try to put her to hypnotic sleep. But she sleep not, being as so I were not. Still I try and try, till all at once I find her and myself in dark. So I look round and find that the sun have gone down. Madame Nina laughs, and I turn and look at her, she is now quite awake, and looks so well as I never saw her since that night at Carfax when we first entered the Count's house. I am amazed, and not at ease then, but she is so bright and tender and thoughtful for me that I forget all fear. I light a fire, for we have brought a supply of wood with us, and she prepare food while I undo the horses and set them, tethered and shelter, to feed. Then when I return to the fire, she have my supper ready. I go to help her, but she smile, and she tell me that she have eat already. 
that she was so hungry that she would not wait. I like it not, and I have grave doubts, but I fear to affright her, and so I am silent of it. She helped me, and I eat alone. And then we wrap in fur and lie beside the fire, and I tell her to sleep while I watch. But presently, I forget all of watching, and when I sudden remember that I watch, I find her lying quiet, but awake, and looking at me with so bright eyes. Once, twice more, the same occur, and I get much sleep till before morning. When I wake, I try to hypnotize her, but, alas, though she shut her eyes obedient, she may not sleep. The sun rise up and up and up, and then sleep come to her too late, but so heavy that she will not wake. I have to lift her up and place her sleeping in the carriage when I have harnessed the horses and made all ready. Madame still sleep, and she look in her sleep more healthy and more redder than before, and I like it not, and I am afraid, afraid, afraid. I am afraid of all things, even to think, but I must go on my way. The stake we pay for is life and death, or more than these, and we must not flinch. 5. November, morning. Let me be accurate in everything, for though you and I have seen some strange things together, you may at the first think that I, Van Helsing, am mad, that the many horrors and the so long strain on nerves has at the last thrown my brain. All yesterday we travel, ever getting closer to the mountains, and moving into a more and more wild and desert land. There are great frowning precipices and much falling water and nature seems to have held some time her carnival. Madame Minas to sleep and sleep, and as though I did have hunger and appeased it, I could not waken her, even for food. I begin to fear that the fatal spell of the place was upon her, tainted as she is with that vampire baptism. Well, said I to myself, if it be that she sleep all the day, it shall also be that I do not sleep at night. As we travel on the rough road, for a road of ancient and imperfect kinds there was, I held down my head and slipped. Again, I waked with a sense of guilt and of time past, and found Madame Mina still sleeping, and the sun low down. But all was indeed changed. The frowning mountains seemed further away, and we were near the top of a steep rising hill, on summit of which was such a castle as John tell of in his diary. At once I exulted and feared, for now, for good or ill, the end was near. I woke Madame Mina, and again tried to hypnotize her, but alas, unavailing till too late. Then, ere the great dark came upon us, for even after sundown, the heavens reflected the gone sun on the snow, and always for a time, in a great twilight. I took out the horses and fed them in what shelter I could. Then I make a fire, and near it I make Madame Mina, now awake and more charming than ever, sit comfortable amid her rugs. I got ready food, but she would not eat, simply saying that she had not hunger. I did not press her, knowing her unavailingness. But I myself eat, for I must needs now be strong for all. Then, with the fear on me of what might be, I drew a ring, so big for her comfort, round where Madame Mina sat, and over the ring I passed some as a wafer, and I broke it fine, so that all was well guarded. She sat still all the time, so still as one dead, and she grew whiter and ever whiter till the snow was not more pale, and no word she said. But when I drew near, she clung to me, and I know that the poor soul shook from her head to feet with a tremor that was pain to feel. I said to her presently, when she had grown more quiet, Will you not come over to the fire? For I wished to make a test of what she could. She rose obedient, but when she had made a step, she stopped and stood as one stricken. Why not go on? I asked. She shook her head and, coming back, sat down in her place. Then, looking at me with open eyes, as of one waked from sleep, she said simply, I cannot and remained silent. 
I rejoiced, for I knew that what she could not, none of those we dreaded could. Though there might be danger to her body, yet her soul was safe. Presently, the horses began to scream and tore at their tethers till I came to them and quieted them. When they did feel my hands upon them, they whinnied low as in joy and licked at my hands and were quiet for a time. Many times through the night did I come to them, till it arrived to the cold hour when all nature is at lowest, and every time my coming was with quiet of them. In the cold hour, the fire began to die, and I was about stepping forth to replenish it, for now the snow came in flying sweeps, and with it a chill mist. Even in the dark, there was the light of some kind, as there ever is over snow, and it seemed as so the snow flurries and the reefs of mist took shape as of women with trailing garments, all was in dead, grim silence, only that the horses whinnied and cowered, as if in terror of the worst. I began to fear, horrible fears, but then came to me the sense of safety in that ring wherein I stood. I began to, to think that my imaginings were of the night and the gloom and the unrest that I have gone through and all the terrible anxiety. It was as though my memories of old Jonathan's horrid experience were befooling me, for the snowflakes and the mist began to wheel and circle round, till I could get as so a shadowy glimpse of those women that would have kissed him. And then the horses cowered lower and lower, and moaned in terror as men do in pain. Even the madness of fright was not to them, so that they could break away. I feared for my dear Madame Mina, when these weird figures drew near and circled round. I looked at her, but she sat calm and smiled at me. When I would have stepped to the fire to replenish it, she caught me and held me back and whispered, like a voice that one hears in a dream, so low it was. No, no, do not go without. Here you are safe. I turned to her and, looking in her eyes, said, But you, it is for you that I fear. Whereat she laughed, a laugh low and unreal, and said, Fear for me. Why fear for me? None safer in all the world from them than I am. And as I wondered at the meaning of her words, a puff of wind made the flame leap up, and I see the red scar on her forehead. Then, alas, I knew. Did I not, I would soon have learned, for the wheeling figures of mist and snow came closer, but keeping ever without the holy circle, since it began to materialize till, if God have not taken away my reason, for I saw it through my eyes, there were before me in actual flesh, the same three women that Jonathan saw in the room when they would have kissed his throat. I knew the swaying round forms, the bright hard eyes, the white teeth, the ruddy color, the voluptuous lips. They smiled ever at poor dear Madame Mina, and as their laugh came through the silence of the night, they twined their arms and pointed to her, and said in so sweet tingling tones, that Jonathan said for of the intolerable sweetness of the water glasses. Come, sister, come to us, come. In fear I turned to my poor Madame Mina, and my heart with gladness leapt like flame, for, oh, the terror in her sweet eyes, the repulsion, the horror, told a story to my heart that was all of hope. God be thanked she was not yet of them, I seized some of the firewood which was by me, and holding out some of the wafer, advanced on them towards the fire. They drew back before me, and laughed their low, horrid laugh. I fed the fire, and feared them not, for I knew that we were safe within our protections. They could not approach me, whilst so armed, nor Madame Mina, whilst she remained within the ring, which she could not leave no more than they could enter. The horses had ceased to moan and lay still on the ground. The snow fell on them softly, and they grew whiter. I knew that there was for the poor beasts no more of terror. And so we remained till the red of dawn to fall through the snow gloom. I was desolate and afraid and full of woe and terror. But when that beautiful sun 
begun to climb the horizon, life was to me again. At the first coming of the dawn, the horrid figures melted in the whirling mist and snow. The wreaths of transparent gloom moved away towards the castle and were lost. Instinctively, with the dawn coming, I turned to Madame Mina, intending to hypnotize her. But she lay in a deep and sudden sleep, from which I could not wake her. I tried to hypnotize through her sleep, but she made no response, none at all, and the day broke. I fear yet to stir. I have made my fire and have seen the horses. They are all dead. Today I have much to do here, and I keep waiting till the sun is up high, for there may be places where I must go, where that sunlight, so snow and mist obscure it, will be to me a safety. I will strengthen me with breakfast, and then I will to my terrible work. Madame Mina still sleeps, and, God be thanked, she is calm in her sleep. Jonathan Harker's Journal 4 November, evening The accident to the launch has been a terrible thing for us. Only for it we should have overtaken the boat long ago, and by now my dear Madame Mina would have been free. I fear to think of her. Off on the walls near that horrid place. We have got horses and we follow on the track. I note this whilst Godalming is getting ready. We have our arms. Those Ghani must look out if they mean fight. Oh, if only more than Seward were with us. We must only hope. If I write no more, goodbye, Mina. God bless and keep you. Dr. Seward's Diary 5th November With the dawn, we saw the body of Sgani before us dashing away from the river with their litter wagon. They surrounded it in a cluster and hurried along as though beset. The snow is falling lightly, and there is a strange excitement in the air. It may be our own feelings, but the depression is strange. Far off, I hear the howling of wolves. The snow brings them down from the mountains, and there are dangers to all of us, and from all sides. The horses are nearly ready, and we are soon off. We ride to death of someone. God alone knows who, or where, or what, or when, or how it may be. Dr. Van Helsing's Memorandum 5 November afternoon I am at least sane. Thank God for that mercy at all events though the proving of it has been dreadful. When I left Madame Mina sleeping within the holy circle, I took my way to the castle. The blacksmith's hammer, which I took in the carriage from Veresti, was useful, so the doors were all open I broke them off the rusty hinges, lest some ill intent or ill chance should close them. <laughs> so that, being entered, I might not get out. Jonathan's bitter experience served me here. By memory of his diary, I found my way to the old chapel, for I knew that here my work lay. The air was oppressive. It seemed as if there was some sulfurous fume, which at times made me dizzy. Either there was a roaring in my ears, or I heard afar off the howl of wolves. Then I besought me of my dear Madame Mina, and I was in terrible plight. The dilemma had me between his horns. Her, I had not dared to take into this place, but left safe from the vampire in that holy circle. And yet, even there would be the wolf. I resolved me that my work lay here, and that as to the wolves, we must submit, if it were God's will. At any rate, it was only death and freedom beyond. So did I choose for her. Had it been but for myself, the choice had been easy. The maw of the wolf were better to rest in than the grave of the vampire. So I make my choice, to go on with my work. I knew that there were at least three graves to find, the graves that are in habit. So I search and search, and I find one of them. She lay in her vampire sleep, so full of life and voluptuous beauty, that I shudder as though I have come to do murder. Ah, I doubt not that in old time, when such things were, many a man who sets forth to do such a task as mine found at last his heart fail him, and then his nerve, so he delay and delay and delay, till the mere beauty and fascination of the wanton undead have hypnotized him, and he remain on and on till sunset come, 
and the vampire sleep be over, so the beautiful eyes of the fair woman open and look love and the voluptuous mouth present to a kiss, and man is weak, and there remain one more victim in the vampire fold, one more to swell the grim and grisly ranks of the undead. There is some fascination, surely, when I am moved by the mere presence of such an one, even lying as she lay in a tomb fretted with age and heavy with the dust of centuries, though there be that horrid odor, such as the lairs of the Count have had. Yes, I was moved, I, Van Helsing, with all my purpose and with my motive or hate, was moved to a yearning for delay, which seemed to paralyze my faculties and to clog my very soul. It may have been that the need of natural sleep and the strange oppression of the air were beginning to overcome me. Certain it was that I was lapsing into sleep, the open-eyed sleep of one who yields to a sweet fascination, when there came through the snow-filled air a long, low veil, so full of woe and pity that it woke me like the sound of a clarion. For it was the voice of my dear Madame Mina that I heard. Then I braced myself again to my horrid task, and found by wrenching away tomb tops, one other of the sisters, the other dark one, I dared not pause to look on her as I had on her sister, lest once more I should become to be in thrall. But I go on searching until presently I find in a high great tomb, as if made to one much beloved that other fair sister which, like Jonathan, I had seen to gather herself out of the atoms of the mist. She was so fair to look on, so radiantly beautiful, so exquisitely voluptuous, that the very instinct of man in me which calls some of my sex to love and to protect one of hers made my head whirl with new emotion. But God be thanked that so well of my dear Madame Mina had not died out of my ears, and before the spell could be wrought further upon me, I had nerved myself to my vile work. By this time I had searched all the tombs in the chapel, so far as I could tell, and as there had been only three of these undead phantoms around us in the night, I took it that there were no more of active undead existent. There was one great tomb, more lordly than all the rest, such it was, and nobly proportioned, on it was but one word, Dracula. This then was the undead home of the king vampire, to whom so many more were due. Its emptiness spoke eloquent, to make certain what I knew. Before I began to restore these women to their dead selves through my awful work, I laid in Dracula's tomb some of the vapour, and so banished him from it, undead, for ever. Then began my terrible task, and I dreaded it. Had it been but one, it had been easy, comparative. But three, to begin twice more after I had been through a deed of horror. For if it was terrible with the sweet Miss Lucy, what it would not be with these strange ones who had survived through centuries and who had been strengthened by the passing of years, who would, if they could, have fought for their foul lives. Oh, my friends, John, but it was butcher work, had I not been nerved by thoughts of other dead, and of the living over whom hung such a pall of fear, I could not have gone on. I tremble and tremble even yet, though, till it was all over, got to be sanked, my nerve did stand. Had I not seen the repose in the first place, and the gladness that stole over it just ere the final dissolution came, as realization that the soul had been one. I could not have gone further with my butchery. I could not have endured the horrid screeching as a stake drove home, with a plunging of rising form and lips of bloody foam. I should have fled in terror and left my work undone. But it is over, and the poor souls, I can pity them now and weep, as I think of them, placid each in her full sleep of death, for a short moment ere fading. For... Friend John, hardly had my knife severed the head of each before the whole body began to melt away and crumble into its native dust, as those deaths that should have come centuries agone had at last assert himself and say at once and loud, I am here. Before I left the castle, I so fixed its entrances that never more can the Count enter there, undead. 
when I stepped into the circle where Madame Mina slept, she woke from her sleep and seeing me, cried out in pain that I had endured too much. Come, she said, come away from this awful place. Let us go meet my husband who is, I know, coming towards us. She was looking thin and pale and weak, but her eyes were pure and glowed with fervor. I was glad to see her paleness and her illness, for my mind was full of the fresh horror of that ruddy vampire sleep. And so, with trust and hope, and yet full of fear, we go eastward to meet our friends and him, who Madame Mina tell me that she know are coming to meet us. Mina Harker's Journal 6 November It was late in the afternoon when the professor and I took our way towards the east, whence I knew Jonathan was coming. We did not go fast, though the way was steeply downhill, for we had to take heavy rugs and wraps with us. We dared not face the possibility of being left without warmth in the cold and snow. We had to take some of our provisions too, for we were in a perfect desolation, and, so far as we could see through the snowfall, there was not even the sign of habitation. When we had gone about a mile, I was tired with the heavy walking and sat down to rest. Then we looked back and saw where the clear line of Dracula's castle cut the sky, for we were so deep under the hill whereon it was set that the angle of perspective from the Carpathian Mountains was far below it. We saw it in all its grandeur, perched a thousand feet on the summit of a sheer precipice, and with a seemingly great gap between it and the steep of the adjacent mountain on any side. There was something wild and uncanny about the place. We could hear the distant howling of wolves. They were far off, but the sound, even though coming muffled through the deadening snowfall, was full of terror. I knew from the way Dr. Van Helsing was searching about that he was trying to seek some strategic point where we would be less exposed in case of attack. The rough roadway still led downwards. We could trace it through the drifted snow. In a little while the professor signalled to me, so I got up and joined him. He had found a wonderful spot, a sort of natural hollow in a rock, with an entrance like a doorway between two boulders. He took me by the hand and drew me in. See, he said, here you will be in shelter, and if the wolves do come, I can meet them one by one. He brought in our furs and made a snug nest for me, and got out some provisions and forced them upon me. But I could not eat. To even try to do so was repulsive to me, and much as I would have liked to please him, I could not bring myself to the attempt. He looked very sad, but did not reproach me. Taking his field glasses from the case, he stood on the top of the rock and began to search the horizon. Suddenly he called out, Look, Madame Mina, look, look! I sprang up and stood beside him on the rock. He handed me his glasses and pointed. The snow was now falling more heavily and swelled about fiercely, for a high wind was beginning to blow. However, there were times when there were pauses between the snow flurries and I could see a long way round. From the height where we were, it was possible to see a great distance, and far off, beyond the white waste of snow, I could see the river lying like a black ribbon in kinks and curls as it wound its way. Straight in front of us, and not far off, in fact so near that I wondered we had not noticed before, came a group of mounted men hurrying along. In the midst of them was a cart, a long meter wagon, which swept from side to side like a dog's tail, wagging with each stern inequality of the road. Outlined against the snow as they were, I could see from the men's clothes that they were peasants or gypsies of some kind. On the cart was a great square chest. My heart leapt as I saw it, for I felt that the end was coming. The evening was now drawing close, and well I knew that at sunset the thing which was till then imprisoned there would take new freedom and could in any of many forms elude all pursuit. In fear I turned to the professor. To my consternation, however, he was not there. An instant later, I saw him below me, round the rock he had drawn a circle, which we had found shelter in last night. When he had completed it, he stood beside me again, saying, At least you shall be safe here from him. He took the glasses from me, and at the next lull of snow swept the whole space below us. See, he said, they come quickly, they are flogging the horses and galloping as hard as they can. He paused and went on in a hollow voice. They are racing for the sunset. We may be too late. God's will be done. Down came another blinding rush of driving snow, and the whole landscape was blotted out. It soon passed, however, and once more his glasses were fixed on the plain. Then came a sudden cry. Look, look, look! See, two horsemen, follow fast, 
coming up from the south. It must be Quincy and John. Take the glass. Look before the snow blots it all out. I took it and looked. The two men might be Dr. Seward and Mr. Morris. I knew at all events that neither of them was Jonathan. At the same time, I knew that Jonathan was not far off. Looking around, I saw on the north side of the coming party the two other men, riding at breakneck speed. One of them I knew was Jonathan, and the other I took, of course, to be Lord Godalming. They, too, were pursuing the party with the cart. When I told the professor, he shouted in glee like a schoolboy, and, after looking intently till a snowfall made sight impossible, he laid his Winchester rifle, ready for use against the boulder at the opening of our shelter. They are all converging, he said. When the time comes, we shall have gypsies on all sides. I got out my revolver, ready to hand, for whilst we were speaking the howling of wolves came louder and closer. When the snowstorm abated a moment, we looked again. It was strange to see the snow falling in such heavy flakes close to us, and beyond the sun shining more and more brightly as it sank down towards the far mountain tops. Sweeping the glass all around us, I could see here and there dots moving singly and in twos and threes and larger numbers. The wolves were gathering for their prey. Every instant seemed an age while we waited. The snow came now in fierce bursts, and the snow was driven with fury as it swept upon us in circling eddies. At times we could not see an arm's length before us, but at others, as the hollow-sounding wind swept by us, it seemed to clear the airspace around us so that we could see afar off. We had, of late, been so accustomed to watch for sunrise and sunset that we knew with fair accuracy when it would be, and we knew that before long the sun would set. It was hard to believe that by our watches it was less than an hour that we waited in that rocky shelter before the various bodies began to converge close upon us. The wind came now with fiercer and more bitter sweeps, and more steadily from the north. It seemingly had driven the snow clouds from us, for, with only occasional bursts, the snow fell. We could distinguish clearly the individuals of each party, the pursued and the pursuers. Strangely enough, those pursued did not seem to realise, or at least to care, that they were pursued. They seemed, however, to hasten with redoubled speed as the sun dropped lower and lower in the mountain tops. Closer and closer they drew. The professor and I crouched down behind our rock and held our weapons ready. I could see that he was determined that they should not pass. One and all were quite unaware of our presence. All at once two voices shouted out to halt. One was my Jonathan's, raised in a high key of passion. The other, Mr. Morris's strong, resolute tone of quiet command. The gypsies may not have known the language, but there was no mistaking the tone, in whatever tongue the words were spoken. Instinctively, they reined in, and at the instant Lord Godalming and Jonathan dashed up at one side, and Dr. Seward and Mr. Morris on the other. The leader of the gypsies, a splendid-looking fellow who sat his horses like a centaur, waved at them back, and in a fierce voice, gave to his companions some word to proceed. They lashed the horses, which sprang forward, but the four men raised the Winchester rifles, and, in an unmistakable way, commanded them to stop. At the same moment, Dr. Van Helsing and I rose behind the rock and pointed our weapons at them. Seeing that they were surrounded, the men tightened their reins and drew up. The leader turned to them, and gave a word at which every man of the gypsy party drew what weapon he carried, knife or pistol, and held himself in readiness to attack. Issue was joined in an instant. The leader, with a quick movement of his rein, threw his horse out in front, and pointing first to the sun, now close down on the hilltops, and then to the castle, said something which I did not understand. For answer, all four men of our party threw themselves from their horses and dashed towards the cart. I should have felt terrible fear at seeing Jonathan in such danger, but that the ardour of battle must have been upon me as well as the rest of them, I felt no fear, but only a wild, surging desire to do something. Seeing the quick movement of our parties, the leader of the gypsies gave a command. His men instantly formed round the cart a sort of undisciplined endeavour, each one shouldering and pushing the other in his eagerness to carry out the order. In the midst of this, I could see that Jonathan, on one side of the ring of men and Quincy on the other, were forcing away to the cart. It was evident that they were bent on finishing their task before the sun should set. Nothing seemed to stop or even to hinder them. Neither the levelled weapons, nor the flashing knives of the gypsies in front, nor the howling of wolves behind, appeared to even attract their attention. Jonathan's impetuosity and the manifest singleness of his purpose seemed to overawe those in front of him. Instinctively they cowered aside and let him pass. In an instant he had jumped upon the cart, and with a strength 
which seemed incredible, raised the great box and flung it over the wheel to the ground. In the meantime, Mr. Morris had had to use force to pass through his side of the ring of Scani. All the time I had been breathlessly watching Jonathan I had, with the tail of my eye, seen him pressing desperately forward, and had seen the knives of the gypsies flash as he won away through them, and they cut at him. He had parried with his great bowie knife, and at first I thought that he too had come through in safety, but as he sprang beside Jonathan, who had by now jumped from the cart, I could see that with his left hand he was clutching at his side, and that the blood was spurting through his fingers. He did not delay notwithstanding this, for as Jonathan, with desperate energy, attacked one end of the chest, attempting to prise off the lid with his great cookery knife, he attacked the other frantically with his bowie. Under the efforts of both men, the lid began to yield. The nails drew with a quick screeching sound, and the top of the box was thrown back. By this time, the gypsies, seeing themselves covered by the Winchesters and at the mercy of Lord Godalming and Dr. Seward, had given in and made no resistance. The sun was almost down on the mountain tops, and the shadows of the whole group fell long upon the snow. I saw the Count lying within the box upon the earth, which the rude falling from the cart had scattered over him. He was deathly pale, just like a waxen image, and the red eyes glared with the horrible vindictive look which I knew too well. As I looked, the eyes saw the sinking sun, and the look of hate in them turned to triumph. But on the instant came the sweep and flash of Jonathan's great knife. I shrieked as I saw it sheer through the throat, whilst at the same moment Mr. Morris's bowie knife plunged into the heart. It was like a miracle, but before our very eyes, and almost the drawing of a breath, the whole body crumbled into dust and passed from our sight. I shall be glad as long as I live that even in that moment of final dissolution there was in the face a look of peace, such as I could never have imagined might have rested there. The castle of Dracula now stood out against the red sky, and every stone of its broken battlements was articulated against the light of the setting sun. The gypsies, taking us as in some way the cause of the extraordinary disappearance of the dead man, turned, without a word, and rode away as if for their lives. Those who were unmounted jumped upon the litter wagon and shouted to the horsemen not to desert them. The wolves, which had withdrawn to a safe distance, followed in their wake, leaving us alone. Mr. Morris, who had sunk to the ground, leaned on his elbow, holding his hand pressed to his side, the blood still gushed through his fingers. I flew to him, for the holy circle did not now keep me back, so did the two doctors. Jonathan knelt behind him, and the wounded man laid back his head on his shoulder. With a sigh he took, with a feeble effort, my hand in that of his own which was unstained. He must have seen the anguish of my heart in my face, for he smiled at me and said, I am only too happy to have been of any service. Oh, God! He cried suddenly, struggling up to a sitting posture and pointing to me. It was worth for this to die. Look, look! The sun was now right down upon the mountain top, and the red gleams fell upon my face, so that it was bathed in rosy light. With one impulse, the men sank on their knees, and a deep earnest Amen broke from all as their eyes followed the pointing of his finger. The dying man spoke. Now God be thanked that all has not been in vain. See, the snow is not more stainless than her forehead. The curse has passed away. And, to our bitter grief, with a smile and in silence, he died. A gallant gentleman. Note. Seven years ago we all went through the flames, and the happiness of some of us since then is, we think, well worth the pain we endured. It is an added joy to Mina and me that our boy's birthday is the same as that on which Quincy Morris died. His mother holds, I know, the secret belief that some of our brave friend's spirit has passed into him. His bundle of names links all our little band of men together, but we call him Quincy. In the summer of this year we made a journey to Transylvania, and went over the old ground which was, and is, to us, so full of vivid and terrible memories. It was almost impossible to believe that the things we had seen with our own eyes and heard with our own ears were living truths. Every trace of all that had been was blotted out. The castle stood as before, reared high above a waste of desolation. When we got home we were talking of the old time, which we could all look back on without despair, for Godalming and Seward are both happily married, 
I took the papers from the safe where they had been ever since our return so long ago. We were struck with the fact that in all the mass of material of which the record is composed, there is hardly one authentic document, nothing but a mass of typewriting, except the later notebooks of Mina and Seward and myself, and Van Helsing's memorandum. We could hardly ask anyone, even did we wish to, to accept these as proofs of so wild a story. Van Helsing summed it all up, as he said, with our boy on his knee. We want no proofs, we ask none to believe us. This boy will some day know what a brave and gallant woman his mother is. Already he knows her sweetness and loving care. Later on, he will understand how some men so loved her that they did dare much for her sake. Jonathan Harker The End End of Dracula by Bram Stoker Recording by Corinne LePage